Hello! It's freaking Thursday! What's up, everybody? Happy Thursday! Happy Lorathon Day! How's it going? Hope you're having a good pre weekend. Thursday is quite possibly the second best day of the week because it's not quite like the Friday, but Thursday's always had good vibes. Good things happen on Thursdays, which is part of the reason I stream on Thursday. It's got good vibes. It does. I gotta say, the days that start with T, they just tend to be kind of more poggers than the days that don't. Maybe like, what about the S days? Those two. I don't know what happened here, by the way. I mean, look at, do you see how this one just remains? Can you? Hair is a puzzle that I have never quite been able to solve. Tuesday, is at, least, at least it's not as bad as Monday. I actually distinctly hate Wednesdays more than I hate Tuesdays. There is something about that day. All right. Uh, Elden Ring, Elden Ring, Elden Ring. Yes, Elden Ring. Perfect. I've been thinking so much about Dragon's Dogma lately. Where, how did the camera do this? I moved you. There we go. Um... I've been thinking so much about Dragon's Dogma that I almost opened Dragon's Dogma 1 again. We're going to finish that game, hopefully. I'm a little concerned. So I played that game on Tuesday um, after like maybe three weeks away from it. And it's still really fun. But I started the DLC and I genuinely don't know where to go in it. It's it's sort of maze-like. It's kind of labyrinthian, like the, like the, the Minotaur's labyrinth from... Greek myth? I think it's Greek myth. Would it be wrong to say that every Roman myth is basically just like Greek myth? Because sometimes I get them confused and I'm like, like, really, is there much to get confused? Like some of the names, I get the names confused. You know, like Minerva is, um, Athena? I think. The names, it's, it's the names, that's the big one. Roman's shirt. Yeah, they straight up just copy the homework. <laughs> yeah, what's up, everybody? Um, So yeah, like I said, we took uh, Tuesday away from this game, but we're still back to it. Let me just close the tabs I don't need. Oh, I forgot to keep one tab open. There we go. Beautiful. I'm very excited about today. DLC is confusing and hard. Yeah, I think it's like... Because it seems fairly linear, and that's, I think, the thing. There's no side quests, there's no go explore over here. There does seem to be a couple dead ends that I can find so far. So I shouldn't say it's like linear, linear. There's exploration for sure, but generally there's only one way to go. So if you don't go the correct way, you're going to have to find the correct way. And if you get stuck on something, you're stuck on it. You have to try to find a way to defeat it. Um... So it's not necessarily, it's, it's something I enjoy. It's just in this context with, with Dragon's Dogma being the way that it is, it's almost puzzly. And some of the fights feel like puzzles that you need to solve. And I feel like it's a very complicated game that I don't fully understand. And I still, even though I'm almost done, I still understand very little of it. And I think that's part of the problem is like, I'm supposed to be engaging with the DLC with the knowledge that I've amassed from the base game and I haven't amassed much. Yes, yeah, so we'll see. Let me just pop open Elden Ring so we have some nice background music. I was listening to my music as I was getting ready for stream. And now it's so quiet. So we last did this on Sunday. Oh, I forgot, I forgot, I forgot, stop. This is the worst game ever to open on PC. It's gen it's not done. It's not done. Prepare yourself. It's not over. There's still the Bamco. It's coming. Don't it lulls you into a fall. There it goes. See, it lulls you into a false sense of security with the black screen, and then finally FromSoft rescues you. Oh my god. At what cost? Okay. We were last... We're in the round table hold. That's a good background music location. Yeah, I'm doing well. I'm doing really well. Um, what did I do today? Well, um, I edited. And then I played Stardew Valley a little bit because Stardew Valley got a new update on... Tuesday, I think? It's really cool. It's a 1.6 update. I love Stardew Valley. Stardew Valley is... You know how, like... 
I'm not, I'm not in a gatekeepy way. Like, I'm, I'm joking. I'm not a gatekeeper. But there are some games that I feel like you have to play if you call yourself a gamer. Right? And I mean this facetiously because, you know, anyone can play whatever and be a gamer. But for me, if you haven't played Stardew Valley, you're not a gamer. Like, go play Stardew Valley. It is one of the, it's, it's one of the greats. It's amazing. But I don't like farming sims. I don't care. Play it. It's, one of, it's literally one of the greatest games of all time. It's like eight years old. Hundreds of hours of content. I play it on Switch. I play it on PC. There's so much going for that game. It's amazing. It's got something for everybody, I believe. But I don't like the art style. Yeah, neither did I. But it grows on you. I refuse. Fake gamer. Unbelievable. Did you play MMOs? I did. MMOs are a nightmare. I try to avoid them. I haven't played Black Desert. Um... I know a few people who went to Black Desert and they seem to be like, oh, it's pretty okay. <laughs> End up just making wine and spending all the rest of my time fishing? Exactly. Think I'm done with MMOs? Yeah. Yeah, MMOs, MMOs are dangerous. It's it's because of the whole, like, the, the cycle they get you into, the FOMO cycle. Like, you need to play every day to get this and this and this and then it's all oh, just play like an hour here or there no you need to do all these things it's it's an, it's an awful cycle i don't have any shade toward mmos it's just like for me i'm good i think i should avoid them i really only played i played a bit of guild wars but that was like just i played it with the with, with someone i knew so that was more like a co-op game i kind of forgot it was an mmo because it was like really dead it's 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 got a low pop you know it's quite an older one so like it's not I'm not trying to roast it. It just, it was low pop. So I was like, oh, it's a cute little RPG. And then suddenly I'd see a person. I'd be like, there's, 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 is it MMO? <laughs> uh, Guild Wars 2. Yeah, I haven't played that one, but I played a lot of Elder Scrolls Online and I played a fair bit of Final Fantasy 14. Um, I, I think there's some really good parts of Final Fantasy 14, but none of them involved the game. So that's my, that's my general feeling about that. Turn into a second job? Yeah! Yeah! WoW sub last month? Logged in, saw everything I needed to do, and noped out. I've heard WoW is in a pretty rough state right now. But I don't really know. I don't really... I've never played it, so... Also, yes, I got some coffee today. Got distracted with BG3 and then back into Elden Ring? Yeah, like... Honestly. Anyway, MMOs. I'm not, uh, no, I'm retired. I'm very retired. Occasionally I still get messages from people I used to play at ESO with and they're just like, hey, so you're coming back? And I'm like, no. And they're like, okay, but if you come back, I have a group for you, we can run raids again. And I'm like, cool, thanks, no, <laughs> never. <laughs> okay, but just in case you play, you know, and I'm just like, no, no, thanks, thanks, thanks though. Best thing to come out of WoW, it's Leroy Jenkins. It's a good meme. I'm not even trying to roast WoW, it's just, I feel like... WoW is, is Blizzard, right? Because if so, it's... Oh, of course, yeah, we talked... Wait, no, the, I was talking about the album. Yeah, no, that kind of explains it. That literally, just right there. Blizzard, oof, you know? I don't think anything they're doing is in a good state right now, realistically. I'm actually just kind of glad they annihilated the only Blizzard game I played, which was Overwatch 1, and now it's Dunzo. So now I have absolutely no reason to play a Blizzard game anymore, so I'm over it. Oh, also, like, this was, like, 10 streams ago, so I, I just remembered now. Someone asked me how I feel about Last Epoch. Um, because I, um, it, or if I'd heard of it, if I was playing it or whatever. Apparently it's, like, a Kickstarter indie game. I didn't know that. Um, but yeah, I played a little bit of Last Epoch. It is really, really good. It's really fun. It's very clean, all things considered. I didn't even know it was an indie. Um, although, is indie Kickstarter, is that the same thing? That, like, technically? Yeah, either way, it's a Kickstarter game. It's really fun. Tons of people out of work suddenly? Whatever, man. Heroes of the Storm Esports League. I remember Heroes of the Storm because they kept trying to push it during Overwatch by giving you skins that were from Heroes of the Storm. And I was like, nah, I'm good. Skyrim forever? Oh, dude, Skyrim's great. 
Genuinely, Skyrim's great. All of a sudden, I saw it released. Yeah, it's really fun. It's really, it's really good. It just reminded me because you were talking about Diablo the other day, and I was just like, <laughs> so you know, I just was like, Last Epoch, really good. There's like absolutely zero reason to play a Blizzard game right now. I feel um, to get the Oni Genji skin. Like that's understandable. I'm just saying they didn't get me with the uh, with the Heroes of the Storm thing, and there was a couple nice skins. Overwatch canceled all PVE, by the way. Yeah, no. Initially, they were gonna they were gonna add like a like a PVE story. Um, but they did have like the 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 seasonal events, which I genuinely enjoyed very much. Like the zombies, I love the uh, the Doctor Junkenstein's revenge. They were sort of repetitive and stuff, but I did I did really like those. Star missions they gave us are done too. Like I said, they literally destroyed Overwatch 1. If you look at my PlayStation stats, it says that I have about 600 hours in Overwatch 2. Now, you might be like, wow, that's really, you must really have enjoyed Overwatch 2. No, I never played it fucking once. But they deleted Overwatch 1, and it became Overwatch 2, so it looks like I played Overwatch. Like, really? I don't know why that bothers me so much. Ugh. Whatever, honestly. I got that game on release. I played a lot of it with my friends. Had a good time. It's retired. So be it. But the battle pass and skins are... I'm not even trying to rose people who want to play Overwatch 2. Like, if you enjoy it... And, and honestly, if you're not super susceptible to the whole skin thing... Like, the whole, like, oh, you need to buy, you need to buy, battle pass, battle pass, play the battle pass... Um, then play it. It's free. Right? So, um, <laughs> no, I, like, I, I know what you're saying. I just mean, like, personally, like, I have no problem with other people playing it. It's just for me, I'm like, I'm good. I'm good, man. <laughs> Rancidino, thank you so much. Well, really, Manda, thank you so much. But welcome back, Rancidino. Thanks for hitting the button. <laughs> Three-month gift subscription has entered month three. Thank you, Manda, for the gift is up to Rancidino. Ungodly the amount of Overwatch 1 in the early stages. Overwatch was this game that I would continually go back to. I would I would like take a year-long break and I'd go back to it. I'd play it here and there with my friends. We were playing uh, ESO and then we'd be like, hey, you want to play some Overwatch? And we'd swap from ESO to Overwatch and we'd all play some games and it was a good time. Raids over? Want to do some Overwatch? Yeah. You know, it was just like that game that was there. And now it's not. So, you know, whatever. Doesn't bother me. Overwatch origin story vids, those are so good. Just don't like playing it anymore? Yeah, I think that's something potentially inevitable that happens with a PvP PvP based game. How small is that cup or are you a giant? Yes. <laughs> nah, it's a little cup. It's a little cup. <laughs> I genuinely never get tired of that question. Every time I got little cup. Every time I got little cup. At least one person asks, and it's so funny every time. And <laughs> we always just say yes. <laughs> but no, I don't know. PvP based games I find are really tiring, and that's what's better. I like games that have a little bit of everything. Um, so that's one thing about MMOs that can be really nice, is you have a lot of different things to do. Um, so like ESO, I would spend lots of time decorating my house. And I would do lots of PvE content and do quest completion. And then I would uh, find, I would like decorate and get cool items and achievements so that I can decorate my house more. So there was like a good balance. Stardew is similar. Stardew Valley, love it. There's so much to do. You can engage with every aspect of the game. You can engage with some. They got co-op. It's so fun. Um, no PvP, really, in that game. But, you know, generally I like when games allow you to do multiple things. Because if you're tired of one thing, then you can move on to something else within the same game. And I always really enjoy that. Um, yeah. Last thing I've done in that game? Yeah, like, oh, I honestly can't believe how you did that. It looks so good. But, like, 
I didn't really enjoy that part of Final Fantasy XIV because they made it like really clunky to decorate. Also, um, you have to... The, the way that Final Fantasy XIV, this is one thing I really, really dislike. To get a house in that MMO, you need to literally basically bid on a plot. And the plot is like instanced, so you're basically competing with other people and you have to log into the game once a month to guarantee that you keep it. And if you stay away for a month, you lose the plot and it gets bidded on, like it gets sold to other people who bid on it and then it's gone forever. So like, you literally have like an address and if you spent hundreds of hours decorating your house and you didn't log in for a month, pfft, goodbye, all your furnishings are done. Used to be first come, first serve. Wow, even better. Oh, okay, we're, we're on. Good. <laughs> if I had to rate our solar system, I'd give it one star. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> Thanks for the underbits, Cheese Master. People on Discord who haven't played in like a year, they just log in every 10 days to keep their house. Yeah, it gives you the sense of like, you know, you need to or all that effort's forever gone. Um, I hadn't played ESO for years. I logged on and showed off my house. You know, like it was, well, at the time, I think I'd only stopped playing for two years. But still, I could go and my house is still there. Um, Everyone can get the same house because it's like your personal instance of the house. It's not like you have a fucking address. And like that really bothered me because I'm sitting there like so they want you to FOMO this game forever and nah it was just that really that actually soured me severely on the game you know what I mean oof no rest for the weekend on April 18th I haven't heard anything about that probably not though um I'm I'm gonna have trouble fitting in everything that I want to play in this time period so for today let's talk about that actually <laughs> excuse me sorry hiccup you haven't no I I really. It's like top down Dark Souls. I really haven't seen much lately. Um, the um, the only game that I've heard about lately has been, of course, Dragon's Dogma 2 and uh, Rise of Ronin. I don't know if I'm going to play Rise of Ronin. It's just nothing against it. I just I think I have to squish it back a little bit. I simply do not have the time to fit it um, from the Ori people. Eh. Listen, it, it sounds great. Now that I know it's the Ori game, I know what you're talking about. Um, my friend told me about it and told me it was really really neat looking and that sounds great but i seriously do not have time to play anything right now so we're gonna finish dragon's dogma one i'd like to try next week so if we can finish it then we can play dragon's dogma two i'm really excited about dragon's dogma two also i've heard there's some issues with performance in the game i i cannot confirm nor deny but i have heard that there's some issues with performance in dragon's dogma two specifically in like the town and stuff like that so because of that, I want to kind of, you know, maybe give them even like a couple days. So hopefully they can fix it a little bit. I don't know if that's their intent. But we will do that. Don't A the Ori devs, they do great work. Yeah, I simply don't have time to play it. We're playing Dragon's Dogma 2. I can barely, I can barely fit in Dragon's Dogma 2, but I want to. Um, so next week... I'm gonna do at least one bonus stream on Monday to try to get Dragon's Dogma 1 done. Um, so next week, at least one bonus stream. I'm very excited. Save some, to save some CPU power in towns? Wow, it's that bad, huh? <laughs> Performance thing was a meme? No, apparently the the there is performance issues. I've been hearing about it. I, I like a few people played it early, and some people said there's no problem, and some people said there is a problem. So we'll see. But no, because I played Dragon's Dogma one, I'd like to play Dragon's Dogma two. I literally played Dragon's Dogma one, so I would be able to play two when it released. And then Shadow of the Earth Tree came and kind of goofed everything up. But we also want to continue the Lorathon, so we're gonna kind of intersperse those. I want to at least try Dragon's Dogma 2 on stream because I really, really enjoyed it. So that's the plan for next week. Also, next week, um, I <laughs> this is like the randomest thing, but I have a sponsored stream. I'm very excited about it. We're going to be playing... <laughs> I can't believe they asked me. We're going to be playing Rainbow Six Siege. <laughs> and I might be like, why are you laughing? That's not really that funny or anything. I have a history with that game. I played it, uh, actually. 
uh, myself uh, a bit. Before I started streaming, I, I dabbled with Rainbow Six. And um, I am really, really bad at that game. It's it's quite an experience. Um, so they were like, hey, you're going to play. And I'm very excited. It's genuinely the type of game that I really wish I were good at because it has so much going for it. Not even getting into the toxicity and the, the hate messages and the team killing and the, like that. Not, not even that stuff. It's so neat. I was really intrigued by it. There's so much like I keep thinking about like the how you could like repel and stuff. Oh man, like I'm pretty excited. So we're gonna be doing that next week as well. <laughs> I've never played it on stream, but I'm very excited. Dabbled partook? Yeah, I did I done did dabble. Mm-hmm. Didn't know that one bank map and two teammates shot me. Yeah, um one time I went to um put a to reinforce a um a thing on the ceiling. Like a, a what do they call it? Like entrance points, um, and I was technically not. I, I my, my character for on defense was a uh, was was an anchor, so you're not really supposed to leave spawn. But I was like, oh, real quick, I'm gonna run on over and I'm gonna you know reinforce this one. And then when I came back, um, my teammate shot me, and I was like, what? What? And I th the, the only thing I can think of was that they were upset that I left the spawn room, but I made it back in time, so it was really weird. Um, but then he sent me a message saying, you're garbage, like, stop playing or something. And then I remember this very distinctly. Because I replied, well, I just started playing a week ago, so have you considered that maybe I'm learning and you should perhaps be more patient with people? And then he was like, oh, oh, okay, I didn't know. And then I'm like, yeah, like, consider why you got so angry and, you know, maybe, like, look into yourself. And he's like, oh, I guess, I guess so. Anyway, have a good day. And I was like, bye. <laughs> Like, straight up. <laughs> oh my god. Nah, seriously, it was really funny. I had been playing just- A barricade, yeah, a barricade. Um, Dragon's Dogma? Yeah, no, not Dragon's Dogma, but I'm sure some people are playing it soon. It, it just came out today, I think? Oh, you must understand, I didn't have chat on. I don't ever talk with chat, ever, 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 um, because I... I, I've played, I've been on the internet long enough that I know that all it takes is you say hello with a voice that isn't that of an adult male and folks will get weird. Now you might be like, oh, but I had the same experience, you know, even with my adult male voice. Mm-hmm, yeah, I'm sure, mm-hmm, yeah, it, trust me. It, shit gets, shit gets fucking weird. So anyway, I, I perpetually have muted and like, you know, whatever. So I think that's why they went to the messages, so <laughs> I'll see. <laughs> No, but I genuinely had a really good time playing that game. It's just, it was sort of like, I played with other people who were way sweatier than me and also had more hours in the game. So they were like, oh, we want to do comp. And I'm like, no, thanks. Um, I would like to not do comp. I would like to maybe learn the maps. And then they were like, well, we already know the maps, so we're going to do comp. And I'm like, sure, you go for it. I'm going to go not do that. So I had trouble like learning the maps. You know, it felt like a full-time job to like learn that game. So, um, we're gonna see what I remember. But I really- I remember I really liked the Canadian girl with the bear traps. Um, I- my favorite character is Mute. Um, Mute's the goat. I love Mute. That is all. Missed a save in Rocket League and I heard a young kid say, Bro, I cannot with this guy. <laughs> and I never felt more judged. Yeah, but the thing is, that was something you did. Imagine just existing. And folks, like, get in on you for, like, that. You know, that that's the thing. Slapping people as sledge. <laughs> Is that the guy with the literal sledgehammer? <laughs> There's something so powerful about that. I don't remember who I played on attack. Actually, now that I'm thinking about it for Rainbow Six. I don't remember. I, I really only liked defending because I really only liked mute. If someone took mute, my day was ruined. I was devastated. I was a really good mute too because I learned, okay, not like really good, but I learned some really cool synergies. And for example, mutes, um, jammers can operate sort of with other things. So if I put a jammer in front of a barricade, um, it would have a similar effect to like other things and stuff. So... Oh my god, 
I remember one time, who's the guy that puts down the car batteries and like electrifies things so they can't be interrupted or you can't destroy barricades or something? It's like mini, he just electrocutes them. He like electrocutes defensively or something. One time I saw a guy put that freaking car battery next to my jammer and it destroyed my jammer. And I, for a second, I was like, I understand why people TK, I get it now, I understand. Because my jammer does literally the same thing, but better. Probably, I think. I don't, I don't know if the car battery does something different. But anyway, play Doc because like supporting. I like Doc too. He's really fun. Also, you could like heal yourself too. So it's like... <laughs> How y'all doing? Good, good. Um, we're going to start playing the game soon, but... Tell him maybe you should make me a sandwich story. Okay, see that? That was a good story. Okay, so I have a story. I have a, I have a story request. So I was playing uh, Call of Duty. This is way back. This is my... This is my um, Call of Duty days, um, and I used to play a lot of Search and Destroy. This is in Modern Warfare 2. I played with a lot of my friends, and in Modern Warfare 2, Search and Destroy, it was basically like, uh, like permadeath, like if you, if you decease, you're done till the next round. So it really made it, you had to be more strategic, slow paced. It wasn't quite like Rainbow Six, but it was very comparable because you really had to think about things or else, you know, your team would be in danger. And of course, for some reason, I didn't mute or something. And uh, I was talking to my friends. And of course, uh, some some wiener on the other team butted in from the other, butted in on the conversation was like, Oh my god, a girl, oh, you should make me a sandwich. Oh, blah, blah, blah. What are you doing playing games? You should play My Little Pony and stuff. You know, just the usual, like, you know, just... I wish that to make that joke, you had to give me a nickel. Because, whew, you know, I have a lot of nickels. Anyway, um, during the game, I was the last alive. And I'm not really normally that good at clutching. Because, you know, I'm just kind of, I'm just a gamer. You know, I'm not really, like, you know, super intense. But I was like, I want to beat these nerds real bad. So I activated my gamer instincts. And I managed to take out three of them. And then, at the end, when it says that I won, uh... You know, of course, they're all like, bah, 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 bah. everyone's talking, everyone's talking, we didn't hear in the enemy team. And I just said like, hey, maybe you should make me a sandwich because you're clearly not very good at this gaming thing. And then my friends went, Ooh, and then his friends went, Ooh, and he was like, Bruh, and that's it. That's the end of the story. Anyway, we won. So there's a lesson there. There's a very important lesson there. <laughs> <laughs> should have said you should be playing Barbie Horse Adventure. Funny story, another time someone told me that I should go play Barbie. And I was like, sure. Brother, are you kidding me? I absolutely would love to play Barbie. That'd be really fun. The Barbie games are sick. Have you ever played a Barbie game? And he was like, no, I haven't. And I was like, well, you should. They're really good games. And he's like, maybe I will. And then we were kind of like friends, you know? <laughs> Honestly, cooked his ass. I done cooked him because I know how to cook. I hope he does too. Barbie Lorathon when? I actually would love to play Barbie Horse Adventure. I've still never played it in my life. You ate, girl? I freaking ate. Yep. Make the match unfun for that person. The best part is the rest of the enemy team. Let us do it. <laughs> That's so funny. I actually remember I once had this guy on our team. I was playing this MOBA. It's a dead MOBA, so it's no longer around. It was called Paragon. I love Paragon. I talked about it. What happened was Fortnite killed it, and I'm not joking. Um, Paragon was being made by Epic, and then Fortnite exploded. So they canceled Paragon because they were like, screw it, we have Fortnite. <laughs> and I'm heartbroken <laughs> to this day. But anyway, I was playing it with some of my friends when it was like early access or whatever it's called. They're trying to remake Paragon. Yeah, they've they've tried to remake it like four times. Um I I'm I'm I don't want to get my heart excited anymore, you know, I've kind of given up. But anyway, I was playing Paragon and there was this guy on our team who was actually genuinely playing so badly he was feeding. He was absolutely like he had like 20 deaths and he was the um, what do you call it? The, the guy who you're supposed to feed lots of kills to. I don't really know MOBA terms. Um, but basically, he was playing this one guy who you... He was he was feeding really hard. ADC. He was the ADC, yeah. 
And um, the thing is, I was on console. So y if you wanted to type, you needed to plug in a keyboard. 99% of people did not type in a keyboard. It led to a gen generally more chill experience because to type hate messages, you had to work really hard. You had to be like, <sighs> for like 10 minutes, right? So people generally didn't. This, this guy had a keyboard. And he was typing in all caps in our game feed, like, you guys suck. Like, this is the worst team. You're making me want to, like, just absolute, like, garbage going through, you know, the feed. And I'm looking. I look at the corner of the screen where he's typing. I look at this. I look at the game. I look at the score. And I'm like, none of us have died. Because I was playing with my friends and, like, one guy. The one guy. None of us had died. We weren't doing great, but it was almost as if he was the only one dying on nonstop. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, why is this guy so bad and so angry? Like, you gotta, you gotta look at the numbers. You know what I mean? Taught me how to type fast on a controller, useful life skills. I did too, except it wasn't for sending hate messages. I've actually never sent a hate message in my life. Um, cause, you know, I'm a decently well-adjusted person. All the time he's typing, he should have been playing. Honestly, I actually would have rather he typed because at, when he was typing, at least he wasn't throwing. So I was glad I was watching him go off in the corner and I'm like, perfect to keep him occupied. It's like giving a little, like a little toy to a, to a toddler. Like here, look at the little sparkly. Like you, you got this, you're like, hey toddler, look at the little sparkly. And the toddler's like, eh, and then you're set for like an hour. You know what I mean? That's how I felt. I was like, okay, as long as he's typing, go, 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 let's try to recover. <laughs> But like, there was this weird moment where I'm like, listen, like, I'm not saying we're doing great or anything, but the only one on the team who's doing bad is the one who's talking all the smack. It was a weird moment. Oh, thanks, Quaither. Set until the toddler says done food now. True, true. Paragon, the one with the lady with the big yellow robot arm. I don't know. Yeah, this is my absolute. I, I had it here for some reason. I I I believe I got this at a at a convention. I I'm pretty sure it's a bootleg though. Multi-layered map? I don't think so. I really I really don't multi-layered. Uh, I I don't know what you mean by multi-layered. Keep in mind, it's the only MOBA I've ever played, so I don't know what's normal for them, so. I love Absol too. Yeah, I got this plush at a, at a convention, but I think it's a bootleg, which doesn't make it any less cute. But, you know. Go under the lanes? Mm, no, I don't, I don't think so. Sourdough bread and spread butter and drizzle honey on it? Oh, that's good. There was indeed a woman with a yellow robot arm. Okay, maybe maybe I'm misremembering. I've led you astray. I apologize. <laughs> I don't remember that. All right, Absol. Thing about Absol is he's very t head heavy, so he like. I trusted you, Sag. That was your first mistake. Let's be real here. All right. Well, we've had the wonderful dulcet tones. Oops of uh, our wonderful boy, Hug, hammering away. Let me get this game up. Beautiful, there we go. <laughs> okay. Ever play Final Fantasy XIV PvP in Crystalline Conflict when your salty teammates will spam shoutouts? Yeah, I I genuinely think that Final Fantasy XIV might have the worst PvP of any MMO I played. But then again, once again, I've only played like two. Yeah, yeah, it, it felt like playing Rocket League, you know, when people are just like, "Good job, good job, good job, good job," and you're like, I have this weird feeling that you don't think we did a good job. <laughs> I actually, I remember when Rocket League came out and there was like no text and you could only do shoutouts. I was like, wow, that's such a good idea because that way you can like communicate with your team if you need to and no one can be mean. And then I played um, one game and someone was like, 
good job, good job, good job, nice save, nice save, nice save. And I'm like, oh, oh, there still is a way to be toxic. <laughs> I was so naive. I was like, there's no way. You got two Magna Blades? Yeah, I had someone drop these for me just so I could, you know, have them. People in Frontlines are just trash talking the whole team. Yeah, one of my very, very first games of Frontlines, and I mean ever. Okay, do I have a, pl a Somber Sun plus five? I don't think so. Oh, I sure do. I have one. Okay, well, we can upgrade a little then. Um, yeah, Frontlines has full-on chat, but Crystalline Conflict doesn't. Crystalline Conflict well, is like a small-scale PvP mode, so they didn't let you type. They just You just do call-outs. It's a little hilarious. Beating you to spam the Crying King emote on you was awful? Clash Royale. Oh, God. Yeah, one time in Crystalline Conflict, someone um, emoted after they killed me. But the worst part was they didn't even kill me. I felt like I, I got hit by an effect by accident. And then he did the sweep emote, which is considered very toxic. It's, it's you, literally you pull out a broom and start sweeping. And apparently in PvP language, it's very toxic. And Because, you know, it's like you're sweeping away the trash. And I was like, I can't believe this guy like literally went into his menu to use an emote. <laughs> it's a weird culture in that game. People were mean on that without even being able to talk to you. I wonder if that's why they were so mean. Do you, do you think about that? Do you think that maybe that's why? Like, because they were limited, they had to find other ways to be cruel? You rock and cancel that. Wait, so you could say you rock and then cancel that passive aggressively? That's so juvenile. Wow, good job. Not. People are, people are interesting. The only time I've ever messaged anybody online from like a game was when they did really good. And I wanted to be like, wow, you did really good. Or um, if they had like a pretty, like a, you know how Call of Duty lets you make those little like your little pictures or whatever back in the day or probably still i don't know i haven't played um you can make like your emblem if someone had a really cool emblem i'd be like wow your emblem's cool <laughs> to the capital. The two fingers with you, maybe. uh you have nothing for me cool <laughs> t-bite in present day <laughs> So silly. All right, let me see where we left off here, gamers. Getting back to the Lorathon. I'm very excited for next week. We we really do have a lot to do. Like it's 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 almost stressful how much content we have to engage with. Like in a good, it's like good stress. There's so much to do. We got Elden Ring. We got the Lorathon. Corin, because I haven't found gold mask yet. Okay, so let me think in terms of what we've done. We have to go to the Shaded Castle to progress Millicent's quest line. We have to go to talk to gold mask to progress Corin and gold mask's quest line. Um, Yuri's quest line is completed. Um, the Church of Marika. Where's the... Uh... Right here. I want to go over here. I think last time I was working on Fortisax. Uh, Lanciax, I mean. And it did not go particularly well. Did I do the Sainted Heroes Grave? I actually don't remember now. Hey, Strip Dog, what's up? Armory Core's Emblem Maker is great. Really good, really good. I am not particularly good at that one. But it's neat. Okay. It looks like I've cleared it because I can teleport out. So it looks like we're good. Nice. Wait, yeah, no, no, no. I remember we did this so I can get uh, that Ash. Which one was it? Kristoff. Yeah, Kristoff. Okay. This is really important lore, actually. After the first defense of Lingdell, Kristoff earned the hero's honor of Urtree Burial for the feat of capturing Godifor the Grafted. And then, I remember now, I wanted to go take on Godifor the Grafted. Because we haven't done his Everjail yet, so we can get that done. Any kind of, like, toxic messages after beating two people cheating at Monopoly on Xbox? Imagine cheating at Monopoly on Xbox. Goodness. Honestly, I don't- I, I remember I was friends with this, with this individual who would send hate messages. And you could always tell, because he'd get quiet. I'd be like, you sending a hate message? He'd be like... <sighs> yeah. And then, you know, he was just generally an unhinged individual. <laughs> but it was always like something bad would happen, or someone would do something, and he'd be like... <sighs> 
I want to message this kid. I want to message this kid right now. And then, you know, I just hear silence and I'd be like, mm, I bet he's messaging that kid. It's really an unhinged individual. But um, let me tell you, when you're raiding in MMOs, you really can't pick because uh, when you got to fill 12 people on a console based MMO, you do what you can. You're, you're not exactly dealing with the, the best of the best, as they say. I had a de friend that broke his desk getting mad at League. <sighs> Yikes. Killed him for his sword. Rest in peace, Yura. Understandable, though. I do that for Diallo sometimes so I can get his whip early. So, do you drop something? I have this feeling that you might have a drop for me. Um... One second, please. I can't use L1? This is new to me. What? What the fuck? What? Uh-oh. Something is wrong here. Uh-oh. <laughs> Did Mikula Melania never get a shadow? They probably have a shadow, but we simply don't know about the shadows. Based on the fact that the Empyreans we know of have shadows? Okay, something's going on. Hasn't this happened before? I don't remember. Disengage and fast travel. Okay, okay. Um, one moment, please. Um, Dom Noddle, thank you so much for the reset. Thank you for four months. It's not working. That's troubling. I'm uh, sorry. You just caught me uh, having controller issues, which scares me deeply. Hey, it just worked in the menu. It worked at... It worked in the menu. This happened before. I remember this happening before. Maybe this will work? Thank you so much for the support for four months, Dom Lala. I appreciate that. Are you giving Dragon's Dogma 2 a try? Next week, I plan to play it. Okay, it works in the menu. But outside the menu, it doesn't work. This happened before. I remember. Character state thing. Okay. Okay. I can't... Good. Sorry, I, I, will, I will talk more about Dragon's Dogma <laughs> once I figure out what the... Okay, we gotta get out of here. The sound is tilting me off this earth. I remember this happening once, and I don't remember how we fixed it, but for some reason, and also when I would switch to this, it auto casts the spell, which I'm not clicking the button. What? Uh, I'm not clicking block. This is a new one um, to me. How long did it take you to farm those two blades? I had someone drop them for me for the lore through, or Lorathon, I mean. Remap L1? Did it... What? What do you mean, remap? Do you think I, like, goofed up my settings or something? What the heck? Is your controller broken? Are your buttons messed up? But the thing is... Gamers, when I go in here, I can click. It works just fine. Just unplug and replug? You know what? It might be that easy. Oh, oh no. Okay, whoa. Oh. oh god. Are we good? Okay. <laughs> it's this mic, right? Okay, good. Sorry. Sometimes this this thing... It's not working. Reset game, unplug, blow into the port, you know. Okay, the thing is, I was just using this controller and it works in the menu. So I don't I don't think it's the controller because it works. It's not auto-clicking. There's something with the game. All right, let's just close game completely. I should have done return to desktop or return to desktop, whatever. Blades from DLC? No, the DLC is not out yet. The DLC... I think something might be wrong because I didn't click anything. Okay, one sec here. 
Let's switch controllers. I have a second one right here, actually. Force close the app and relaunch. We're also going to switch controllers. I don't think there's anything wrong with the controller. So we're just going to restart the game. Your controller is death. No, it's Elden Ring. Trust me, it's Elden Ring. Might be reading mouse input. Um, the mouse is not doing anything. Mouse is like not in time. <laughs> Save me. It's coming. It's coming. Ugh. <laughs> Every time. All right, let's see what happens. Seriously though, chat, this is probably the game. This happened once before. It works. We're good. We're good. Okay. Um. Now, of course, as you know, I did change the controller, so it could be the controller. But so what? We're fixed. We closed up. We're set. Rainbow Six is kicking the door down as we speak. Yeah. Okay. So give me one second. That scared me. And also the coffee. The coffee's hidden, so I gotta use the restroom. I'll be right back. And then we shall begin the Lorathon. And I'll answer the question about my plans for DD2. I know we talked about it, but, um, you know, just for folks who are coming in. So, okay, let's sec. Okay, hello, now that we have fixed the video game. I tell you, Elden Ring, it's got its issues. Really though, you wanna know what I'm gonna say? I think it's a PC issue because I don't think I've had this problem on console, but maybe I did have it on PC, I don't remember. Hey, Vanda, what's up? All right. Sorry, I'm a very well hydrated individual today. I had a strawberry smoothie that I made. Um, because it's strawberry season, baby. I have, uh, I had a coffee, two coffees actually. I need a lot of caffeine right now. And a water. Great deal of hydration. Okay, okay, okay. So number one, we're continuing the lore -a Feel free to ask questions about lore. In the meantime though, we're gonna work on the quest lines that are in this area that I remember. We've already handled Dung Eater's quest line. We're not done Altus, but we're we're quickly careening toward being done Altus, let me tell ya. Seen the wall outside Malaketh Bonfire? Uh sorry, you're gonna you might have to clarify further. Beautiful. 
Love seeing these tree sentinels. It's interesting that in these statue depictions, they have these gorgeous golden vines traversing them. I really wonder what these statues look like in the age, in the golden age of the Erd tree. They were probably way more golden. At this point, you can just see hints of it. Honestly, this whole area is probably, oops, one of the prettiest entrances to a city in any game. Now, of course, we don't use this as an entrance, but it still leads to one. Also, these spectral standards. I'm going to be honest, I've looked at these before, not in terms of their design, but just simply the fact that they are spectral. And I'm not entirely sure what they signify. Like, not in terms of who ran them as standards, but seriously, like, why are they spectral? What's really interesting is they're very much like the spectral trees we see later in that the bottoms are absent, but then as you go up top, the spirits, like, it, go it goes clearer. Not entirely sure what your face signifies. I'm pretty sure it just, like, signifies, like, my general facial expressions, you know? We in Altus already? Lore Master? I really appreciate that, Dare Pico, but the thing is that I just feel like this is like the, I not even feel, this is like the 10th stream. <laughs> so I'm getting to Altus. It's been a slow one, you know what I mean? Love Altus and Land Dollar, so beautiful. Genuinely agree. Honestly, gorgeous. It's a great example of how you can make things fairly monochromatic and still make them visually interesting. One of my favorite things about Elden Ring and, you know, it, it won the award for art direction. I forgot about you. Ouchie, my whole face. Hi, what are you perhaps like elementally weak to? That didn't do what I would call the best damage. Just once I must use this my full power. Ooh. It's whatever. Just, you know, 500 distinct hitboxes. It's okay. I am not what you would call the biggest fan of these enemies. Oh, here they go. Okay. Cool. Oh, Elden Ring. Oh, he's already gone. Oh, oh there he goes. Oh man, gargoyles, I tell you. I tell you. Yo, Rob, thanks for the gifted membership on the YouTube. Enjoy your emotes. Are you joshing me right now? Did you just yell at me so hard that it hurt? Listen, can you just get your shit together real quick? Because the thing is, I was actually gonna ask. I wanna show off how pretty the entrance to Landell is. And you're making it really difficult when you're shoving me around and such. Yo, Tana, thanks for the gift and sub to Deathbird LOL. <laughs> run. Run. Okay, we're good. We're good. Oh. Great Bridge Race, there's this carving up the wall by Marika Respawn statue. We must take a look. I, I feel like I've looked at what you're talking about, but I didn't really get the impression of under of upside down. I have to say though. All right, so I, I'm editing the Elden Ring first playthrough, and I actually did some editing today. And in that playthrough, I just hit the, the giant's mountaintop. And what's really interesting is I'm remembering that a lot of the things that we've covered this playthrough, such as the fact that Marika is a Newman, but perhaps that she has a tie to the giants that isn't simply, like what if Marika is part giant as well? I don't know, I'm not saying this is for sure. But it's funny because we talked about that during the first playthrough. I was like, I wonder if she's a giant. Holy, that was the luckiest moment of my life. <laughs> All right, goodbye. Now I can appreciate how pretty this whole area is. Thanks, bye. They're probably not spectral in the DLC. So you think that they are you think that those are solid. See, okay, what's interesting though, 
is in the lands between, uh, or in the land of shadow, we know that there are spectral gravestones. But the land of shadow, while comparable to the, to the lands between, really basically because of them both having this major tree at their center, they are, they are clearly distinct. So they appear able to have unique architecture in one area to another. Arrow's Reach Talisman, that's a good question. I think I know where that is, and I, I think I forgot to pick it up, so we might have to go do that. Doesn't look like it. Yep, let's go pick that up. That's actually a good reminder. Also, the fact that, you know, some people are like, why are there these giant skulls in, uh... Did you just throw a rock at me? Huh, okay. Why are there these giant skulls in Kaelid and the Mountain Top of the Giants? And in the first play there, I was like, what if those are just bigger giants? And then 2024 Raph was like, yeah, what if they're just bigger giants, dog? <laughs> Clip that to increase the zoom on your telescope. You know what? I don't think I've ever done that, which is really neat. Clap's floor inside Lane Dahl by the closed entrance is where the Eternal City in Deeper Depths was. Uh, wait, the collapse floor. In sign lane down by the closed entrance. You mean that? Let's go over to this entrance. Oh, but first let's read the giants or the great I forgot what it was called. The great axe something. <laughs> Not golems. Gargoyles. That's what that's the word I can think of. The gargoyles, great axe. Let's actually take a look at it, because there's one really interesting thing about the gargoyle weapons. There's a few interesting things, but let's take a closer look at them. Okay. The bronze great axe wielded by valiant gargoyles. Just like the wielder, the missing parts have been mended with corpse wax, a patchwork of champions. Once again, the idea of using what came before you is present here. So we have it with the gargoyle great axe. Pretty much all the gargoyle weapons are mended with corpse wax, a patchwork of champions. Initially, or, you know, when, when I think of this, I think... Alexander. He's also filled with a patchwork of champions. Although what's interesting here is the corpse wax. I don't remember how you make corpse wax. This is something, or I think it's like it might be naturally occurring. It's a little gross, but it involves, I believe, decaying corpses. I'm not certain of the process because I remember reading about it in Sekiro and I was like, ew, that's gross. What if giants? Yeah, they might just be larger giants, but it's interesting. Titans in Greek mythology? Yeah. Um, so there is a distinction. What's interesting is that the Titans are the parents of, I'm pretty sure, every god in the Greek pantheon, barring a couple. I forget if Aphrodite's parents are Titans. I think they might even be pre-Titans, because in Greek myth there are these beings that basically represent, they're like primordial beings, they represent the Earth and the sky, for example. They're not titans, if I remember correctly. They might be. Aphra was born of sea foam. Yes, but it was... Her birth is a little interesting. The sea foam, something hid it uh, from her father and it, you know, turned into her. So that's what's interesting. Is decay a theme in Elden Ring? Because I think Bloodborne is, is childbirth. Um. Stagnation and decay are pretty much always themes in FromSoft games, but I really think this game does a really interesting job of depicting it in multiple ways because there's so many different figures involved in the decay and there's different types of decay. Aphrodite born of Uranus' genitals being severed and flung into the sea. Not only his genitals, but his, his genitals, um, I believe, in the process of climax. <laughs> Greek myth is freaking weird. But yeah, I just don't think, I don't think those primordial be beings like, like the sky and Gaia are titans. What? Yeah, it depends on the version of the story. It depends on the version of the story. Yeah. But that's, yeah, basically she just emerged from the sea foam. Um, from where his, 
genitals were cut off. Yeah. Fun. Now you might be like, why were his genitals out? Well, um, because I think was Ouroboros or not, not Ouroboros, uh, Uranus. Sorry. Wait, Uranus. Was it Uranus? Hang on. This is stuff that I haven't looked at in a while. Um, Yeah, one of the Greek primordial deities is what they call them. So let's take a look here. He's he represents the sky. Wait, his parents are Gaia? Hang on one second. Oh no, 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 I remembered right. Okay, yeah, so basically Uranus was the sky, representing the sky, was very excited about making lots of children with the earth gaia the mother the fact that gaia was also the sky's mother you know it's greek myth they don't have too many figures to wor to worry about um so basically he was non-stop making babies with the, with the earth like non-stop she was like bruh i got too many babies this is too many babies and then i think it was chronos who severed the the genitals and the severed genitals hit the ocean and then Aphrodite came up came up, which is why is she such an interesting figure? Greek myth is so random; it's hard to remember. Yeah, I was born of sea foam. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Hecate is probably my favorite figure in Hellenic myth. Ooh, yeah, I like her too. Kronos is also Uranus's son. Yeah, yeah. Now you might be like, why did Kronos cut off Uranus's wiener? Well, because Uranus didn't want his children to be born, but he wanted to make kids. So he would he didn't allow them to be born. And then Gaia's like, bro, I got so many babies, like my, my stomach's so full. And then Kronos, the reason he didn't want them born was because there was a story that his one of his children would kill him. So then Kronos managed to be born. He snuck out of uh, his mother's body, killed, not killed, but cut off the wiener of Uranus so that he could no longer make more babies. And boom, then all the Titans were born. The end. So that's what's interesting about Aphrodite is she is considered a goddess and not a Titan, even though the people of her generation are Titans. They might be like, this is weird. Yeah, I'm not kidding. This is Greek myth. Um, a lot of the stories get really weird. But this is the first generation um, of beings that we call Titans. They were called Titans. And eventually the Titans were kind of like not... Like the gods didn't really like the Titans. And a lot of them were killed or trapped or hidden away so that the gods could have their age. So this is before Zeus was born. And the Titans are children of these primordial beings. But Aphrodite is kind of this interesting figure in between because she isn't a god. She's a goddess, but she's also born along with the Titans. Zeus honors her above all, and after the war with the Titans, he let her keep her share of the heavens, earth, and sea. Aphrodite? Yeah! Aphrodite is really interesting. She's one of the oldest. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, by this, by this point, she's older than Zeus. One of the Titans decided to eat his infant children. Oh, maybe I'm confused. I think Kronos was eaten by his father and then he had to cut his way. I don't remember now. It's it's either they weren't allowed to be born or he ate them after they were born. 50-50. Brickhammer tells about Radigan? Uh, Brickhammer. Um, Brickhammer? Anyway, maybe like, why is this important? The reason I'm talking about the Titans is because there's this... I don't think I have that. Uh, the reason I'm talking about the Titans is because it's possible that those super, super tall giants are kind of meant to be the precursors to the giants and are in fact Titans, but we don't know. We do know that there was a hierarchy based on height in giant um, myth? Not myth, but in, in their in their... In their belief system, there was a hierarchy, and if they, they basically hated short giants. Do I have that weapon? Hang on, where is it? The one that looks like a spine. A sword of Milos? I don't remember what sword of Milos is. I should have it by now, though. I defeated Dung Eater. I might be passing it. Do I not have the sword of Milos? Huh, that's weird. 
Oh, no, that's my bad. Zeus was the one who was eaten by his father. Kronos. Yep, 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 that's it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can't believe I got those two stories confused. I thought I got the Sword of Milos when I defeated Dung Eater during his invasion. Wait! Oh my god, that's my bad. That was that was editing. I oh man, this is a pro sorry. I <laughs> haven't done that in this playthrough yet. I haven't even been there yet. I was just oh man, the editing really got my brain messed up. Cause I was like, yeah, I just did that two days ago. No, that was that was while editing. Whoops, sorry. That's why I got so confused. But no, uh, the Sword of Milos, which we drop, which is dropped from Dung Eater during his invasion, tells us exactly that. He tells us that uh, the giants hated, they had a hierarchy based on height. What does this do? Is this just death light? No, it, oh. It just does damage, but a lot of damage. Interesting. No frost buildup like the death birds and no death blight build up despite these beings being those who live in death. It just stimky. Yeah, real stimky. Mhm. Mm What's the lore on that move? I don't know if these are the only figures that do it. But it's not the most common move. I think these might be the only ones. These guys are weirdly programmed to constantly do this move. And they are also the ones that have a chance of dropping the uh, Sun Realm shield, which actually you can see this guy using. Right there. Uh, we don't have it ourselves. And he didn't drop it for us. It vanishes because I took him out. Aw, oh, man. Bandit's Curve Sword. That's a freebie. Curve sword with a light crescent-shaped blade used by the bandits who ran ramp rampant in the wake of the shattering. Most of the blade is now darkened and covered in rust, but with enough dexterity, this weapon may still stand up to some use. There really are a great deal of curved blades in this game. Run to the other side of the arena while I did everything? Aw, well, at least you didn't want to die. Well, divorce. But yeah, that's what's really interesting about the uh, the the move that those enemies do. I don't remember the lore about the sun sun realm shield off the top of my head, but it's pretty key. And unfortunately, since it's drop based, I hope we can get it. But it relates really strongly to uh, Nox, not Nox. Sorry, uh, Soul. The opposite, Soul. Oh. No, what's in the brick hammer? Um, no, I don't. I can't. I can't think of what the brick hammer is. More known details about becoming a true god. Honestly, I really think with the information that we have now, it's kind of hard. I think they had to have been that they came from one personally. Highest bleed in the game? Dude, does the bandit sort of the highest bleed in the game? I thought it was the scavs. There he goes. Their bones are gold in this area. Yeah, they are buried closest to the tree. But it really does make you think that it might have something to do with the royal remains as well. The thing is, for me, it's hard to tell whether their bones are yellow or golden. If they're like just really ancient yellowed, but either way, there's, they're different than the others. This particular one is interesting.
accidentally reported them, block them? Uh, wait, what, what's your, what's your name? Yeah, we should remove that if there's a stolen account on the Discord. No, I definitely, I definitely think they're gold. Because it looks very much like the royal remains. I don't know why you're chill with me. Also, at the, at the light, they do look... No, they shine. They're 100% gold. Okay, I've become one with the bone people. Also, interesting that the ones who who use this shield have different armor and like a red cloak. Armor graced with gold human bones. It is said that the bones belong to an ancient lord, the soulless king, the lord of the lost and desperate, who was known as Ensha. So it might have something to do with soul. Perhaps the soulless king ruled in Castle Soul. Perhaps there was more of a nation involved. There's only like the fort left. Maybe there was a bit more to it. And that's why these figures use this attack and have golden bones as well. I definitely don't think it's a coincidence. Like Balder Knights, the Sunrealm Shield guys? Are those the ones from DS3? Coating them in gold. That's the thing. The bones don't say that they were coated in gold. At least not in English, from what I remember. Yeah, they're simply gold human bones. It doesn't say that they were... Uh, Colored gold said that they are just simply are gold. DS1. Ah, uh, yeah, the Balder Knights. The Balder Knights, I remember now. Yeah, they look really reminiscent. But really, it's just interesting that they have that unique shield. So, the Soulless King, I, I really... Okay, I have this sort of very early theory, and it's pure speculation. We don't have too much information about it yet. But I wanted to talk about how in the DLC trailer, we have that figure... With golden bones, he's in a portrait. Twiggy crack tier. Crimson crystal tier. Okay, bye. These guys are wearing black robes, by the way, covering their faces and are praying at the tree with this omen. If I'm not mistaken, I don't think we see figures with like the the noble garb. Or is this commoner garb? Oh my god, I get commoner and, and noble goofed up. But yeah, either way, they're pretty unique. I don't think they appear anywhere else. Um, it's real complex. Hello. Single crab heading up to the shack with a painting. Single crab heading up to a shack with a painting? Which painting? Do Tarnish have gold bones? Probably not. Ensha, that guy from the round table? Yeah, so we get this from Ensha. But Ensha calls himself Ensha, and the soulless king was called Ensha. So I really wonder if perhaps the guy didn't possess Ensha or if Ensha didn't take the name or whatever, if anyone who wears the armor becomes Ensha. So I want to talk about this a little bit because it, it always reminded me. Okay, in the DLC trailer, we haven't seen the DLC yet. There is that one figure in a portrait with that lady. And then later on, we see the same guy wearing the same outfit with the same brooch as a skeleton. Um, who has become impaled and is like trying to pull what has impaled him out of him. But it's also, he's, it's just his own spine. So he's like kind of gone impaled on his own spine. Pretty cool. And we, that's all we see in the trailer. His bones are pure gold. Also, he looks centipede-like. The way that the bones have flayed outward and his, what's left of his body to me looks centipede-like. So I think of two things. Number one, golden centipedes. They are considered a fetish. Uh, for those who hunt those who live in death, the hunters of those who live in death. And I wonder if the reason they don't point it as an image is perhaps this guy in the trailer is not the, he might be the origin of the hunters of those who live in death. Pure speculation. I just looked at the guy and I'm like, yeah, that looks like a centipede to me. So that's one thing. But the second thing is the fact that his, go his bones are golden. That immediately evokes images of the, um, the royal remains and the soulless king. Now, could the soulless king also be 
the one who started those who live in death it would be i don't know i don't want to conflate too many roles to a guy we saw of for 20 seconds in a trailer but it is kind of interesting because if he was some sort of undead figure and then and it was the soulless demigod and and ruled over those who eventually became those who live in death i don't know it'd be pretty interesting to be to have him associated with the hunters of those who live in death anyway all theorizing but there is one really interesting thing um in demon souls there is a boss i think it's old not it's not old monk is it i think his name is old monk he is basically all right <laughs> there is a really old slash dead guy who found a golden robe and i'm talking huge golden robe and it granted him power but it also possessed him and when the robe wraps around your head it possesses you and the boss fight is literally this guy sitting in a throne as like this desiccated skeleton looking guy the robe literally wraps around the head of a random guy and an invader and that invader is the boss. It's really interesting in Demon Souls. And it is a PvP fight. You can actually become the boss. Old monk from Demon Souls, yes. Now, when I think of an old guy who looks dead or desiccated and is also golden, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the Demon Souls old monk. Um, I really, really wonder if there isn't something going on with that, and it isn't supposed to evoke a similar image, except instead of a golden robe, it's golden bones. I don't know, but the moment I saw that guy in the trailer, I also thought of the old monk. So it's pretty interesting. PvP boss fight, so cool. Really cool, yeah. Artishak and East Liernia? Demo it, become monk. I don't get the demo it part. Oh, because the demon I get it. <laughs> Thanks, Wolf. Uh the Artishak and East Liernia. Ah, that one. Um crab in a small tree area by itself, eating it has gold hair coming out of it. Does it happen to have a whole face on the back of it? And does it perhaps do death blight? Because I don't know the exact crab you're thinking of, but we can go find it. And if it's if it is, then okay, let me show you these crabs, and you can tell me if they look the same. Because the story and the answer will be the same. Golden bones will make them break easy, not if they're magic golden bones. It's true though, gold is very soft, very malleable. All right, I can't think if these guys have golden hair. Oh, yep, this is them. So, um, does it look like this? There's also a big one in the area. Now, the answer is this guy. Uh, that's Godwin's face. You might actually notice if we take a look right here at the, the talisman that I have, that they look kind of similar. Do you notice how that there's two eyes and there's a nose? It's just up, it's a face upside down. So this is, of course, the Prince of Death's pustule. You can see the the golden hair growing out of it. It is a feeded pustule taken from facial flesh. It is the visage of the Prince of Death, Godwin. Um, then we have these crabs. I haven't been underground yet, so the map's like you know empty. But right underneath, the, right in this area, this is where deeper depths would be, because it's at the at the base of the Erd tree. The crabs have passive animations that they eat; they're always eating, and Godwin's face is growing upon them because they have been infl inf inflicted with death blight. Perhaps because they're constantly consuming, and also you can actually see, I actually didn't notice this, but you can see the worms flying off of what they eat. They eat things that are underneath the ground. Godwin's under there. Basically, this whole place is infected, but we don't have... This is like just a hint of it. It seems the animals are afflicted first. Now, you said it's a big one? Yeah, there's a big one here too. It'll pop out right when I go over here. Every time. Unless maybe it's during the fight. I don't remember. There he is. Right here. 
It, he's a little harder because he's he's aggro, but you can see the face. He does death blight as well, by the way. And then if we try to get to his back, he's got the face on his front, but I believe it's on his back as well. That's your answer right there. It's Godwin. Godwin has infected them. What's really interesting about the crabs, though, is they appear to be very much transformed by the things they consume. So there's crabs that eat Trina's lilies, as far as we can tell, and, be and are able to spew sleep on you. They're kind of environmentally susceptible, let's say. Okay, cool. Nice. Use the freaking crab hammer on me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you get a good look at the uh, at the face there. Blech. You know that about the sleep crabs? I'm not certain if that's why they, they use sleep on you, but you'll notice that there's a lot of crabs that use an element on you. And considering that we know this crab is god when afflicted, it suggests that the things they consume change them. Crab hammer is a very strong move, yep. Crabs who have glintstone crowns? Yes! That's a great one, yeah. The crabs literally drop glintstone crowns. It's possible that they are somehow transformed people who have become crab. I think it's more likely that they simply ate the people who wore the, the crowns. Either way, they have been transformed by them and they're very glintstone-y themselves. Poison crabs? Yeah, they live in poison towns, so they have poison element. So yeah, that answers that question. Good moment to bring that up, um, because we are indeed going here. And we're gonna go get some crab! How did you find crabs that aren't, um, deathblight afflicted, huh? Oh, you again, is it? Perfect bloody timing, Ashley. Yeah, some crab. crab. Oh, cooked up fresh. Oh, tasty. Boiled crab meat, a prime specimen of plump and moist meat. True connoisseurs know how to keep from oversalting. Greatly boosts physical damage negation for a certain duration. Unlike the prawn sold, this truly is crab. Not that it matters, it's delicious all the same. Um, now this is some really big missable lore as it happens. Hey, there's something I should probably tell you. You heard of the dung eater? He's a madman. Has it out for everyone. Curses him. Goes round in his rank armor and all. You see him though. Stay well away. I was in the same jail as him once, so I know first hand. He's a god forsaken monster. Not just some petty thug like me. He's a killer. Kills people. And curses the souls. Does all sorts of shit to the corpses. To keep them cursed forever. I ain't seen nothing more disgusting in all my years. I ever been more scared than you. Rooted to the bloody spot while he did that to my friend. Never met someone with a taste for crab I couldn't trust. You've got a real thing here, eh? And it's only getting better. So... Honestly, that kind of speaks for itself. He was there, and he watched Dungeter work firsthand on his friend. And he couldn't do a thing. Have you ever seen Boggart without the helmet? I sure have, and he is handsome. Deathblight is like tapeworms, not a problem if you cook to 165 Fahrenheit. Yeah, considering how gross these crabs look and how delicious and red those ones are. Boggart's a god, I tell you what. What is the optimal build for this? For for what, sorry. Oh no, you doomed him? The thing is, by befriending him, you doom him. By, by simply speaking to him and progressing him, you doom him. Where's Bogart's second spot? You mean right there? It's right outside the gates, down here. Supposedly he's ripping out or defiling the Shriek of Dama, a mythical ball in the ass said to contain the soul in Japanese mythos. Yeah, that's exactly what he's doing. We've talked about Dung Eater and what he's doing before, um, but that is it. He basically consumes souls and does something to the corpses. He, he takes 
a seedbed curse that he creates and then plants it in others. You can avoid Dung Eater? Yeah, of course you can. But we're doing a freaking Lorathon, so unfortunately, his fate is sealed. <laughs> I.e. the Headless from Sekiro. Yes. So the Headless from Sekiro, you might notice they have this really weird... And oh, I forgot you. Ugh. I don't know how good this is going to go. We might just use Bloodhound Fang for this, because I just have this feeling that this guy's going to be resistant to fire, because, um, dragon. But no, he literally takes your soul out, consumes it, and then it transforms within him, and then he does something to the corpse. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if the seedbed curse is not the soul of someone that he... that he consumed. That was a bad roll. Energy fields in Chinese and Japanese esoteric stuff in the lore channel. Oh, please, if you have a chance, that sounds great. Oh my god. But no, that dialogue about Dung Eater is really interesting. He is a creature of immense fear, and now we know why he was hung up in his uh, in his opening cutscene. What's interesting, too, is he was doing this outside the lens between... Based on the the two fingers, not the two fingers, the confessors, there is... Oh, I'm dead. Maybe. I, I'm not the biggest fan of this fight, nor am I very good at it. Great. Oh, that was a bad roll. We can do that a little better. That's what he does is rip the soul out, consume, curse it, then put it back. Yes, there is. He definitely consumes the soul. The thing is, though, is that when he's in the round table hold, Roderica can hear the spirits in despair, which means they are still in him. So he consumes them. Okay. He eats. He consumes. He gets the energy from it. Just, just like food, right? When we eat food we acquire energy from the food and then the waste the things that the body can't use is expelled so considering he takes the strength of what he consumes he keeps the souls with him roderica can hear them it suggests to me that what he's doing is taking the soul out of people consuming it acquiring its power and then the waste that he expels he puts it back in his victims and that is where the seabed curse grows and what's really interesting too is, well, waste is a really, really good fertilizer. It's used as fertilizer in to grow things for a reason. There's a lot in it that plants can use, if, even though people cannot. So that's likely what he's doing. It's very similar in a way to what Rikert is doing with consuming people, uh, Tarnished, acquiring their strength. Godric, once again, consuming, uh, using people's body parts, attaching them to himself. Why is he wearing omen armor? He's wearing severed omen armor. So just to repeat, just I know some folks have heard this already, but we're get, talking about Dung Eater. He, um, I have come to the conclusion, especially during this playthrough, and there's quite a bit of evidence, omen are not cursed. Not for being omen. But they are despised because they are omen. So the reason that Dung Eater takes on a symbol of a severed omen is because the omen are horrifically mistreated and have taken a curse onto themselves because they are so despised. Omen themselves are natural and normal and fine, but they have been mistreated for such a long time and despised for such a long time that they've taken on curse-like attributes. They're able to wield curse against others as a weapon. So I don't think it's a coincidence that Dung Eater uses not omen armor, but severed horn omen armor. There's a difference. There's a reason for that, if you ask me. An omen in soul, but not in body. Yes. So he takes the curse and he curses others because he embodies that omen feeling of like, please don't curse me. God, this fight freaking blows. 
Just spam fireballs. I feel like I'm in PvP. How many was that? Like 10? It's really interesting, though, because honestly, based on how Omen stuff is discussed with characters like Dung Eater as well... Okay, he roll caught me. That was my bad. I hate this guy. The, the Illusory Wall? Um, you can tell me. I pretty much know every Illusory Wall in this game, I, I'm pretty sure, at this point. It'd be cool to find one I haven't found. But, yeah. <laughs> Poison mist this guy into oblivion? Yeah, it sounds like a good idea. Unfortunately, my strongest weapon remains the Bloodhound Fang, so. Oh. Dang, push him too far. Cool, I used up all my green. Fireball? Oh no! Standing Margaret Shackle, trying to see if anything happens. Do you think the its interaction in that one place is a is a bug? That one hero's grave or whatever? Bottom of the pit where the three fingers are? Oh yeah! <laughs> you know, I just uh yeah, I found that one during my first playthrough. Um, did you happen to notice that there's another one? No, the shackle works everywhere. What do you mean? God, this guy sucks so much. Like, he's so insufferable. Yeah, that's a great hidden wall. I found it in my first playthrough, and I remain so pleased that I did. There's a couple I missed in the in the playthrough. <sighs> it's actually, in my opinion, not quite a reference, but it's meant to evoke the... Uh, oh, I forgot. Sorry, it's a double hitbox. That's my bad. The path to Ash Lake in Dark Souls 1. Trigger traps and illusory walls in dungeons and caves. That's really interesting, but that's kind of what I mean. I don't know if that's intended or not. Goodbye, Draconic Tree Sentinel. You're not the worst in the world, but you do drive me a little crazy. Thank you for the Dragon Great Claw and the Dragon Claw Shield. I honestly don't really want to look at them. Like, lore, yeah, but not look at them. They're just... They're made of dragon parts. Monster Hunter moment. It's definitely not intended. Pretty sure it's not intended, yeah. <laughs> but what I mean is, you know, because in that one hero's grave... There's a lot of illusory, uh, not illusory, because they sure do hit you, but there's the spectral uh, chariots. And I wouldn't be surprised if that whole place wasn't sort of run by more gods. I wouldn't be surprised if there's some secret interaction, but I don't think it's intended. Nothing other than shackling Morgoth is the intent of them. Remember when you discovered the elevator skip in Halic Tree? Yeah, I do. <laughs> From the Great Hollow? Exactly, yeah. Mm hmm Okay, sorry. The weapon and shields. Here it is. The dragon... The dragon Great Claw. It is made of a dragon claw, probably. Weapon said to have been whittled from the claw of a great ancient dragon, wielded by grotesque tree sentinels who yet serve the Erd Tree. The claw is enwreathed with lightning and tears through the dragon's feeble descendants with ease. Huh. Yeah, so it's made of an ancient dragon. So, similarly, there's a sense of... 
Devolution and time weakening, pretty much everybody, dragons, their descendants are a lot weaker than they were. Giants, trolls, whatever le whatever is left of them, way weaker than they were. Um, the demi-humans, not particularly, you know, compare with Bach, who seems to be a lot older. I want to point out something about Bach, and I think we have to double check, because I noticed that the model that Bach has, he uses a slightly different model than the typical demi-humans. There are demi-humans that look exactly like him, but I don't think you find them until you go to Altus, and they're also on the mountaintop of the giants in the Forbidden Lands. The ones that look exactly like him, the sort of narrower snout, they tend to wear clothes as well. They look almost like more like rogue, sneaky ones. I only find them in Altus from what I can remember. I don't have every demi-human memorized, so it's possible there's a few in Limgrave, but I remember the ones in Limgrave more commonly having the model of the, um, they're more like human-like, flat-faced. The bigger ones still have the snout, and the large ones, like the queens, also have the snout, but the ones that look like Bach, the very little ones, are only Altus and later. Yeah, the sneaky little knife ones. I found them in a cave in Altus. For the first time. Maybe they're in Liurnia though. There might be a couple in Liurnia, actually. Why do you find demi-human ashes in the Impaler's catacombs? I don't know. Last arcade leads to Latena. That's, yeah, th I found them there too. So not fully, not fully later in the game. But it's interesting that ones that look like Bach are not in Limgrave. They're later. So it almost feels like Bach is from a different... Like, they're still, obviously, they still work together. But the ones that look like him are not in Limgrave, which suggests he's from somewhere else. Are the demi-humans related to the beastmen? Mm -hmm. The thing about demi-humans is it's interesting because what that suggests is they're part human, part something else. And it's possible that they're like beasts and humans combined. Possible. I don't really know, though. It could be... Mm, I don't know. What's interesting, too, is the beasts, like Sirash, are considered very evolved. Um, Sirash is the... What is the term they use? Like the he, he advises the Golden Lineage. And Godfrey, a human, is sort of tempered by Sirash's presence. Maybe he comes from a lion that's always served royalty? Um... Not necessarily, but he is definitely different than the others. So it's interesting that the ones that look like him are not in Limgrave, but he is. So I don't know. Anyway, my point is, though, that the things that exist in this time are way more um, devolved. Pretty much all of them. The dragons are weaker. They've devolved. And it, it's interesting because it's as if things that were closer to the Crucible were stronger things that were more na that were less evolved were more natural the ancient dragons um the beast men things that were more animal like were also stronger and better and more intelligent because the dragons that we see currently don't seem to be particularly intelligent they use a different type of lightning without red in it they um if they even use it at all actually no the dragons i don't think there are any dragons that use lightning it's only ancient dragons that use lightning, so they can't even use lightning anymore. Box size demi humans in box cave. I don't remember. To be fair, I do run through it pretty quickly, but let's go take a look, because I don't remember there being any in that cave. Crucible tree became becoming weaker, so beasts are becoming weaker as the Erd tree grows. It's possible. I also wonder if it isn't sort of forced removal from the crucible. Like forced distance. Okay, so you're the human type. This is what I'm talking about. This does not look like Bach. You look more human-like. Oh, I can't see your face. Maybe you're more like Bach. Whoops, did not mean to do that. Oh, thanks for the string. Um, hard to tell. The ones that look like Bach tend to have open faces, though. Dragonkins achieved ice lightning. They were experiment experimentally created. Are you suggesting that the demi-humans are more feral because they're humanity with that parallel to Godfrey? Thing is, we can't be sure with the demi-humans where they came from, 
But I don't think it's because of their link to humanity. I think it's more how they were treated. No, that looks more human-like to me. I don't see the snout. No, I think they're the same. They're just wearing a different outfit. Let's see if they can't take a look. Box size one's in the boss room. Let's see. Oh, I forgot that happens. But yet, yeah, Bok... Bok looks like other demi-humans that exist, but yet he learned a trade from his mother. Alright, see so we got... Oh, right. The boss room will be empty because I defeated them. Um, human size... Human size, human size. Nah, there. I don't think there's any. Nah. No, no Bach ones. Seems an educated soul and perhaps an outcast. Or is it true? Just just as I I pos uh, I um I suggest that he is older because he literally was a bush for a very long time. Like, these guys don't use any magic. How do they turn him into a bush? Guess I remembered wrongly? No, I mean, that that's what we're doing. We gotta double check these things. Because I, I realized on replay and while editing that we find Bok guys later, but not here. So it's interesting that they're not here. But, oops, wrong button. But yeah, I'm wondering if maybe he didn't get transformed into a bush earlier. Hiding his bushes in several areas, but not there. Some clod turned him into a tree. Yeah, it could be someone else. Bigger ones that use magic? It's really interesting because it, because a transforming spell. We do see them that, that do that. In fact, in Limgrave, they use that to trap people here in the south. Let's go take a look. I think here? I think this might be a good spot. Three hour each, 10, 10 hour bit plus? No. No. I have no attention span for uh, long YouTube videos, unfortunately. It's a weakness of mine. <laughs> Every time I try, I end up just zoning out, which is a problem. I like reading better, is the thing. This is why I love written lore so much. Okay, let's get down here into the forest. Because, yeah, you do get ambushed. We actually did that during this playthrough, but I like to showcase it a lot. Five-hour YouTube video essay? Dude, there's ten-hour ones. I, I love it. I love it, but I cannot give all my attention to YouTube video. I am completely incapable. Ow! Forgot about that. I'm not saying it wasn't the demi-humans that did it. I'm just saying that there don't seem to be any demi-humans in his area that are able to do that anymore. The demi-humans that appear to have intelligence are closer to down here, near these ruins. No Bach likes. No Bach likes. No Bach. Use him as a seamster at Lane Dell? Yeah, I didn't think about it. Okay, no Bach likes, no Bach likes. The queen's done. I didn't think about it until recently, but it's interesting that like Hugh, Hugh is really old. He's been around for a long time. Owl. You're a random spot, just staring at me. Interesting. Okay. I can't remember exactly where they are, unfortunately, but we did showcase it, at least. Where else do you see Bok like Starting in Liurnia at the soonest, in Laskar, uh, in Latena's Cave, I forget what it's called. And in um, Altus, as well. And in the Forbidden Lands in the Mountain Top of the Giants. We see them there, too. I found it while editing the other day. So... I'm not saying that Bach isn't from where he where he says he is. I'm just saying that there's a chance that the reason that we don't find any figures that could actually do, like that look like him and stuff, is because maybe he's been there for longer. I mean, he talks about how his mom was a seamstress. We don't see any demi humans who appear able to communicate, who wear clothes, who are intelligent, who know any trades. They literally just sit there and they're largely, you know, just chilling, bonking people with sticks. 
Mount Galmir with the canyon. Basically, Lyurni is the soonest, but then way later. You hear that little tent? Oh man, I'm so lost. Everything here looks the freaking same, dog. Where's the ambush? I didn't see any tent. Bok likes in the village in Galmir where Leonia sources are teaching them. That happens to also be the exact same place that we find the prattling pate that looks like a demi-human. And when we play this for Bok, he says that's my mother's voice. You likely already grabbed them? I sure did. That's why I can't find it. It's fine. You know what I'm talking about. We showed it during the Lorathon. Just because I can't find it again doesn't mean it doesn't exist. <laughs> we get ambushed. Pretty. So I don't know. I'm not saying that it's for sure. But I think there's some pretty strong evidence that Bach has been transformed for a quite a bit longer. And the demi-humans have only de-evolved further in his absence. Mimic Vale's ability? There's hints that Radigan likes sewing. What are the hints that Radigan likes sewing? Because I don't think Homie creates a thing. I would be very intrigued by that. If you mean the, the, the golden needle? I do notice that. But the thing about it is it doesn't say he uses it. It says that it's a treasure that he took. And then he kept it in a freaking chest. I don't think he was able to use it himself. Prattling pates are all connected to demi-humans. No, only the one is. This one is a twisted clay sculpt in the shape of a demi-human head. The others are all human heads. The tailoring tools? The thing is, he doesn't use them. It doesn't say that he uses them. I'm not saying he doesn't, it's just everything in the lore suggests that the man is completely unable to create. However, to be fair, one thing he does seem to be able to do is alter things. That's a narrative hint, come on. The rest of the narrative makes it very, very clear that he is incapable of creating anything. He can't fix the Elden Ring when it gets shattered. He isn't able to create a sword, he is able to alter the sword that he is given by Renala and turn it into a um a golden order sword he takes a spell from mikola and alters it he is a completely uncreative being and what does the golden needle let us do alter it's possible he alters things but he does not so tailoring tools might have been a gift from mikola who i personally believe to be the craftsman the thing is the tailoring tools were taken when he went to marry Renala, which is before mikola's birth so i don't think that's possible Mikkel is a creative one? Yeah. So is his mother. Marika is a creator. Radigan is at best an alterer, not a creator. Or largely a traitor. So personally, I think that, yes, I definitely agree. Mikkel is a craftsman. But where did he get it from? I think he shares the trait with his mother. Also, let's take a look at Melania. She doesn't create anything. It's not a dig, but she doesn't. She destroys. She is a warrior. Corpse after corpse left in my wake. Who does she take after? Her father. Powerful leader, loyal, dogmatic, uh, fierce in battle. Devastating in battle, in fact. That's Melania, and quite possibly her father as well. Mikla never had any relationship with Marika, that we know of. But I truly believe that was probably Radigan's doing because since Mikola was his favorite, he wanted to keep him away from the bad influence that was Marika, his other half we fundamentally disagreed with. Genius craftsman in the Golden Order could have been Gold Mask, maybe? Uh... Hang on, I just wanted- this guy. This is a bok like And this is the soonest that we see them. And even then, looking at you! Do that again! 
Can you do the grab again? One second. A falchion. Cool. Hey, can you jump on me again so I can see your face real quick? Goodness. Okay, one second, please. It's really hard to see their faces. They move really quickly and they're covered. They look different to me. That's the thing. I'm looking and I'm wondering if they don't look a little different from Bach. Still, these ones look like they have more human like ah fuck, I forgot. These ones look like they have a wider snout, almost like a mixture between these two, like a midpoint, but Bach still looks way more animal-like. I'm wondering. Mikola and Melanie never saw their parents both at once. We don't know. We really can't tell. Radigan forged his own great rune. He created something. This is really, like, I can't believe we're defending Radigan. No, no, no. He created something. He did. He did. He created a rune that is literally only used to block things off and is literally a, a lattice net that is completely impenetrable. Yeah, he made that. He used it to cover his people's mouths so they couldn't share the truth. Yeah, he made that. Okay. <laughs> I guess he did. So yeah, like I said, this these guys appear here, and even then, they still look a little different than Bach. Well, Radigan created was a hot mess. <laughs> he took things that other people made for him, and he changed them. It's pretty interesting, conceptually. Disparaging the defense of Radigan, but not the same for Marika. Because we've Marika gets enough hate. And at least Marika didn't leave any fucking children because they had the wrong hair color. Yeah, these guys look more human-like still. So I think Bach is way earlier in their development. I think Bach might be unique. I'd have to get a closer look at their model. It's really hard when they're constantly moving. It's just like, Radigan doesn't need your defense. He's like the ultimate fuck boy, you know? She did leave those who had horns, though. I believe that was when Radigan showed up. Seriously. If Godfrey and Marika hated their omen children, then why do they appear to have enough of an education that they're very well-spoken and intelligent? They weren't thrust into a sewer from birth, nor were they shackled from birth, because if they were shackled from birth, and thrust into a shoot into a sewer, they would not speak the way they do. Morgoth is like the king. The way he talks. Let it be writ upon thy meager grave. You think he learned that in a fucking sewer from birth? You know what I mean? It seemed very protective and biased toward Marika. Yes. A, every single person is biased. B, um, she gets way more shit than she deserves. And she's a largely misunderstood and very intriguing character. Very, very interesting. Very, very flawed. A lot like Ronnie, but the difference is people aren't going, haha, Ronnie evil, haha, Ronnie bad. So I feel the need to counterbalance all that discourse. Additionally, Radigan is literally the ultimate fucking asshole who left his wife and children, who hated them because they had red hair. See, this one, these ones, the more developed ones, look way more animal like. Not quite like, like, Bach is definitely different than these, obviously, but still, it's interesting. Did Marika not giga betray Malaketh? Yeah, she didn't treat her pet very well. Radigan hated children because of their red hair. What relationship did he have with any of them that we know of that is confirmed in lore? No, no Bok types. You might be the closest, but once again, since your face is entirely covered, I really can't tell. Can I share a thought? Sure. The only child that we know he had a relationship with was Mikola. 
Now, it's possible that they just didn't think to add anything for Melania, Radigan, or uh, Radon, Riker, Ronnie. But it is a little interesting that the only one that we have lore about them exchanging gifts is the Golden Child. Ronnie's pretty evil? Oh, yeah. But people don't reduce her to her flaws and her evil actions, which I find really interesting considering. Her and Malekith might not have gotten along since he was basically controlling her. Malekith loved Marika, but she only had one use for him. She needed him to destroy the Glomite Queen, defeat her, and then be a host for the Rune of Death. That's it. Um, the betrayal happened later because even though that was the only purpose that she had for him, the Rune of Death got stolen. I believe she had a hand in that. So, how is Malekith Marika's half brother? Yeah, there's a dialogue about how uh, one of the items has that Malekith is her half brother. I really wonder about that. One thing I will say is it could be the fact that the Empyreans all have a shadow. And what we learned from Ronnie is that they are raised like siblings. I'm not, Ma Marika seems to have been older than Ronnie was when she became an Empyrean. So she doesn't have that same bond. But I wonder if the half brother is literal and meant to be taken literally. Or if it's not, well, you know, they were both chosen in a different way. So the, the, the shadows are created by the two fingers for their Empyrean making them linked and related in a way that might not be literal blood. Do we know for sure Mark and Radigan are actually two separate beings? No, that's constantly in flux and in, in discussion. Ronnie, Ronnie, uh, it's suggested that Ronnie had red hair. You can see the, um, what's left of it on her corpse, her true body. I think that was meant to be literal. The thing is, like, if they're half-brothers, that means that Malekith wasn't created by the two fingers. Because that would mean that they- what a half-brother is, like, they share a parent. A single parent. So we don't know anything about Marika's relationship. It, her, um, her parents. We know nothing about what, what came before. Um, okay, so that's... Millicent. Let's do Shaded Castle. Yeah, I'm afraid I don't know very much about um, Game of Thrones or whatever. Um, so I'm just going to work with what we got. But, um... I did see something fairly recently. I don't remember where this was. It was on Twitter. But something about uh, Alina Hetty, I believe her name is. The actress who played Cersei on Game of Thrones. How she did really well with the character, with her subtle acting, to sort of develop her even further, better than she was in the books, made her a lot more complicated than she was in the books. I don't know, I haven't read the books, but I thought that was really interesting. She's a fantastic actress. That much I know. I've seen her in other things, if not... Wait, where's the second one? I can just drop down here. Rhaegar Targaryen? Oh man, everyone's named the same thing. Oh, there it is. Oh! Yeah, that, that doesn't look that high, but I guess it is, huh? Grey runes are similar, and judging from the DLC, if it's Mikola's Grey Rune with C, it's similar to Melania's. Could it be possible that Radon and Rikert are twins since their runes are similar? Um, no, they're probably, they, they're probably not twins, they're probably just siblings. So Radon and Rikert have similar runes because they're siblings. Uh, Melania, yeah, people think that rune in the DLC is Mikola's because it's, uh, it looks like Melania's. It's really interesting, though, because it's 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 a fucking moon. <laughs> like, I look at that and I'm like... So Mikkel is associated with the moon now, too? Could just be a coincidence with the shape. Or it could simply be... It's not meant to be a, a moon, but it's meant to be like a, like a part shape. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's incomplete. And that's why it's got that opening. Because... Um, oh, my runes are up there. Because Mikkel is cursed with youth. And his rune represents that. Considering the runes seem to take on traits of their uh, their wielders, it's pretty interesting. An eclipse? Honestly, doesn't look like an eclipse to me. Could. It could be. It's just, to me, I see a moon with a line through it. That's it. 
pretty little associated with the moon via the eclipse, but he was trying to trigger an eclipse and the eclipse is associated with the soulless demigod. So I don't think he's associated with the eclipse. I think he's using an eclipse. Do you know what I mean? It's a little different. It's possible that he's associated with eclipses, but I think it's more he just knows that an eclipse will help him help Godwin. So he tries to trigger an eclipse, realizes that the stars are frozen, and then tries to get Radon killed via Melania so that the stars will move so he can trigger an eclipse so he can help Godwin. It doesn't mean he himself is associated with eclipses, you know what I mean? Radon and Riker's rune not similar though. Appearance-wise, they are. They have the line in the same place. I don't think I have them yet. No, not on this character. Not yet. Rune from trailer can be waypoint left by Mikola. Yeah, that's what people are theorizing. I really hope it's not that case because that sounds so boring to me. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It could not be a crescent moon. It could just sort of look like one. Considering the full moon is what Ronnie is associated with. The dark moon, but a full one, as well as her mother. Eclipse to moon is a stretch connection at best, yeah? Yeah, I don't think they're linked. I don't. I think the shape might not be in a... It might not be a crescent moon. It might just look like that because it's trying to evoke a different image. Do you know what I mean? Melania's room have same shape. Exactly. That's what people are talking about. Melania's room rune looks the most like the rune we see. And since siblings have very similar runes, that's what people think. Does Elden Ring have a sun? It sure does. Ronnie's moon full. Assume dark moon meant new moon. Honestly, it's it could be red either way. It could be a it could be a new moon. But her spell, like when when she activates her dark moon, it is a cold and leaden moon, but it is a full one. Technically, the moon is always full, right? It just we don't see all of it, and that's what's really interesting about the moon and its its transformative phases is that it is always full. It is simply how it appears. A new moon is still, it's not like it literally vanishes, so. I personally associate her with a new moon. But technically, in terms of, you know, cosmology and that sort of stuff, not, not quite cosmology, but you know, that sort of concept, the, the new moon is the weakest. It is at its weakest point. But yet her moon is quite powerful. Rygert has a portrait of Radon in the manor. Champion song painting. Not one of Ronnie? Yeah, um, it's also possible Ronnie didn't want her body to be visible because she was, um, like, getting rid of it. <laughs> Ronnie took the body sets, kind of a Jungian concept. Um, yeah, but what I'm saying, like, uh, the Eclipse, we know its associations, it's just, it's not Mikolas. It's, it's not directly associated with Mikola. Mikola is not represented by, a, by an Eclipse or a moon. But his symbol might still look like one because it's meant to evoke a different image. I don't have that many great runes, unfortunately, so I can't show too much of an example. Um, the great rune of the unborn is pretty interesting, too. It's smaller. It doesn't quite look like the others. Godric's rune is the anchor rune, so it's unique, and he's not directly related to anybody that we can acquire the rune. Death was meant to be, meant to be Marika? I mean... The thing is, why would the Newman serve someone else if if Marika wasn't involved? It's possible the Newman turned on Marika for some reason, and they were like, we don't like what you're doing anymore, and they tried to assassinate her. But to me, that seems like a pretty big screw-up. Do you know what I mean? Also, yeah, um, Rikard and Ronnie worked together in the end. Ronnie was targeting Marika? Why Why do you think that? So Radon just stupid because the meteor didn't hit Celia? I mean, pretty much, I, I believe so. I don't know if he was stupid or if he was manipulated. It's pretty interesting that we get a portrait of Radon in uh, the arena, though, for uh, in the Volcano Manor. Rikard, and it, that, that's what's really interesting, the siblings probably had a relationship. We just don't know a lot about it. We know that Rikard and Ronnie conspired together. Ronnie gave Rikard a piece of the Rune of Death. That's a pretty big deal. Maybe it was meant to be Radigan? Does Radigan count as a demigod? 
That's the thing about Radigan. He's an Elden Lord that would make him, and he is also the Rebus to Marika. So what is his title in that context? Would he be a god? He's clearly not as important as Marika is though. Created Marika's plans and betrayer with the help of Ronnie. So why do they turn on Ronnie after that? And what plans of Marika's were they fearful of? Honestly, the Newman, the, the Black Knives, I mean, I really don't think they screwed up. It's possible they screwed up. Definitely. That's always a possibility. We don't know. Something could have gone wrong. But they seem pretty professional, all things considered. They don't take targets willy-nilly. They don't appear to be hireable in a traditional sense. Not like the, um, the other assassins. They have goals. And we can tell what those goals are. Man, where the heck am I even? I have to get over there. We have to get more in the swamp. Naturally, things go wrong. I mean, we know part of the assassination went wrong. Electo, um, the ringleader, lost her daughter. She was about to get attacked. Tish defended Electo. Tish is Electo's daughter. And Tish died, which is why Electo has her spirit ashes. So clearly, I'm not saying they're perfect, not saying everything went right and according to plan. And if that went wrong, it's possible something else went wrong. Why would she make the trek to Lane Dell just to sit there? That's a good point. There is a Black Knife. The Black Knife locations are really interesting. They're very scattered. Uh, there's one outside of the arena or the um, Hero's Grave in Altus. There's one outside of Marika's bedchamber. In general though, they're not doing so hot, right? Like they're, they're very much struggling. They tend to be weak, they tend to be scattered. And they apparently have been quite inactive. We were talking a bit on the Discord and theorizing, because one, one issue I have with this game is that Ronnie has not left her childhood home. According to Rogera, she just returned, but she is not, she's been there for quite a length of time. And you're telling me the Black Knives couldn't find her or Blythe or EG? EG is sitting in front of a field. He's a giant. He sits undefended in the middle of a field, right outside of Caria Manor, the ancestral home of the Karn Royal family. And you tell me they, they couldn't find him? So we were talking about it and Basically, we know that the stars guide the fate of the royal family, but personally, I believe the stars, the ones that Radon is holding back, probably control a lot more than that. Ichi's helm stops them from being detected. Uh, detected by, I believe, the greater will. Because the helm he wears is a Nox invention. The Newman and the Black Knives are scions of the Eternal Cities, so they are closer and related more to the Nox than they are related to anybody else. But the moment we manage to achieve Ronnie's goal, we find the, the weapon. It's also possible, by the way, that they went after her specifically because we took the treasure of Nokron. And that was the trigger. There are no black knives in the Eternal City, though. There's none in the area. There's none underground that I can think of. No, there's none. They're all above ground. So you got to wonder, but is it possible that their fates were also stalled by what Radon did freezing the stars? Maybe everyone, maybe way more figures are associated with the stars than just the royal family. Learn all this just from playing? Yeah, mainly. Riker, Ronnie, and Bernal all have something to do with the stolen rune of death. Uh, sorry, I don't know when that was. It was a, little, it was a while ago. Uh, but Ronnie took it, and she gave a piece to the to Riker in the form of the Blasphemous Claw. When we defeat Riker, Bernal takes it from Riker and goes to Faramizula. So yes, but not quite the same way. Trigger was when you become Ronnie's consort. Yeah, but either way, they're already they seem to be out and about, and one of the main triggers seems to be Nokron. Black Knives no longer take Ronnie's orders. Can they go after EG because Blythe and his madness tells them so? No, I really doubt it. 
Because the Blythe um, attacks the Black Knives. He kills them too. The Black Knives are after Ronnie. They they almost they try to they try to kill Blythe and they successfully kill E.G. I'm pretty sure they they pretty confidently don't take Ronnie's orders anymore. We just don't know who broke the pact first, so to speak. The alliance, I should say. Is it Ronnie after no longer needing the Black Knives? She um, trapped their ringleader in an Everjail on her. Uh, mountain at the moonlight altar possible is it possible that electo furious over her daughter's death went after ronnie and had to be imprisoned who threw the first stone is it possible neither of them did it is it possible the two fingers imprisoned uh electo yes all of these are possibilities we don't know ronnie and the assassins just happen to have aligned objectives killing marika i really don't think like, it's, it's definitely possible, it's just, I don't know why... When it comes to taking the risk of the assassination, they take the bigger one. Ronnie takes the risk in imbuing the weapon with the Rune of Death, but still. E.G. only dies if you tell him about Blythe? Yeah, but that, that's less to do with you telling him about Blythe and more to do with his quest progression. All right, I'll be right back, and then we'll do the Shaded Castle. Give me one sec, everybody. Okay, hello. Only need two great one taxes the capital? Sure do. Shaded Castle is a really weird area. It is. 
wish there was a streamer out there who would cover and discuss AC6 lore, like how Wrath discusses and analyzes Elden Ring lore. Honestly, I love Armor Core 6, and I did really talk about this stuff while I was playing. I didn't do like a lore through or anything. That game is a little intense to talk about lore. I would love it, um, and I would love to do that for that game, but unfortunately the community terrifies me a little bit, and I'm, I feel the need to stay away from it a little bit. And that sucks, that really does, because <laughs> it's such a good game. The community is just too much when it comes to streaming, goodness. Most people are fine, most people are just excited. Um, yeah, I covered AC6 as well as I could while I was playing it, but I really love how small and focused it is, because you can really go in deep on each character. Public appearance next to Riding and Godwin? Oh, you think that that was like the alibi? Sorry, I'm a little confused. Yo, take it easy, Radiant. Okay, so let's talk about this place and let's try to be thorough here. Sorry, I was we were focused on other lore while we were here, but the Shaded Castle is really interesting because it is one of the few uses in the game of shade, shadow, shaded. The thing is, it is clearly in decline. So this is to pre pre present progress. Millicent's questline, the Valkyrie's prosthesis, golden prosthesis once used by the one-armed Valkyrie. A masterwork of craftsmanship with practice and skill, it can be used as proficiently as a real arm. When Malay Marai, Lord of the Shaded Castle, embraced this prosthesis, he claimed to feel the presence of his personal goddess. Um... So this is a golden prosthesis, really well made. It's definitely a little bit bigger than the other stuff associated with, with uh, Mikola, but honestly, when it comes to the craftsmen of this particular piece and all the prosthesis associated with Melina, I honestly think it's gotta be Mikola. Mikola was definitely a craftsman. And I think like his mother, he was actually good at pretty much everything he did when it comes to craftsmen craftsmanship he understands the essence of life and so creating a really intricate prosthesis for his sister would be well within his skills um these are karian royal statues we see these at rea lucaria outside Ronella's bostrom and we see them all over the karia manor exactly the same the others i really I'm not sure, but I have to say, this place, this area specifically with all the statues, reminds me a great deal of Kanehurst and Bloodborne. Also, just a ton of statues everywhere. This one I don't think we've seen elsewhere. This one, I think, is a potential recolor of the one... The, the handout. Uh, the Chapel of Anticipation. Hey, kitty, come here. Let the door open and, and a demon came in. Why is it poisonous, though? I don't know if it was always poisonous or if it fell into poison. Um, either way, Marai, uh, Malay Marai started worshipping Melania as a god. Um, but the thing is, he sort of... She didn't really like that, necessarily. She didn't really... She doesn't really want worship or anything. But uh, a lot of them worshipped her rot as well, which is kind of the problem because her rot, like, tortured her from birth. You know what I mean? So kind of messed up but it happened a lot and uh he definitely is reminiscent of a rot worshiper because of the um weapon he uses made poison on purpose possible hi dog is it melania's arm yeah it's definitely melania's arm she's got multiple so this is uh this gives us some context of what happened here House Marai is ruined, just deserts for falling for that severed harpy. No surprise that guilty cretin took the castle and our storied sword. Um, this guy's really fun because he blames Melania for people worshipping him, which is really cool, really cool. Severed harpy, really neat, really cool. Make statues in the field besides the castle? In the field? Yeah, I don't have these praying ladies anywhere. But we'll have to keep an eye out. 
They're very caners, though. One thing I'll say about these is this is almost the exact pose that the enemies in Canehurst use. They have their hands bowed, bound, have uh, a weapon and dagger in their hands and stab like this. And when you see them passively, you'll hear them cry and you'll see them just like this, kind of looking forward and up. I'm not saying they're 100% a reference, but it is pretty notable that they're straight out of Bloodborne in terms of statue. D3 is also a masterpiece on its own. D3 has got a lot going for it too. Poison because it's not possible to make rot. I mean, they tried. Hi, Marlo. Hi. Good boy. I like DS3. I'm not the biggest fan of, of DS3's lore. So, um, just to go over what happened here, Malay Marai, he's out there. We'll deal with him in a sec. He started worshipping Malay. He basically fell for her, started worshipping her, collecting, asked, like, uh, he, be he became a collector. And he started finding, uh, like, the prosthesis, things associated with her, a portrait of her, etc., etc. And because he was so distracted, he wasn't doing his duties. One of his duties was to execute prisoners. Um, House Murray was was supposed to execute the guilty, and um, because he was so distracted, he didn't. And one of the guilty got free, and that would be Elmer of the Briar. Elmer then took the storied sword, and that's why we see him in the center of the castle, and he's the boss fight here, is because he took their sacred relics, transformed them with his thorns, and is basically just chilling, without anyone being able to contest him. Also, when we get invaded by a bell-bearing hunter, that's Elmer. It appears to be only him, and each of them is a different invasion by him, because he's the only one that we encounter in Spirit. You might be like, oh, but if you kill him, you still get invaded. Yeah, time gets a little weird with spirits and, and invasions, so it's actually totally possible that happens. Also, there are clean rot knights here. I don't know if he was ever directly here. I wonder if uh, they weren't simply collected by Malay. How exactly did they execute them with Marika taking the death from the ring, though? That might actually be part of why he failed in his duty. It's quite possible that since he wasn't able to execute people anymore, that he simply had to keep them imprisoned, and he wasn't able to do that very well because he was distracted, and eventually one of them got free and took over the castle, killing most people. Why is he staring at the Melania portrait? Is he in love? It suggests that, yeah. And I mean, can you blame him? I love uh, DS3 too, but it's just... It was the first Dark Souls game I played for, of the three, and I loved it at the time. And then, um, not so much now. Still still like it, but it's, it's the weakest of the three, in my opinion. Still stronger than most other games. All right, we got the page trousers. Trousers worn by pages who serve the nobility and are mindful to keep them out of harm's way. Traveling wear tailored with exquisite precision to avoid any undue shame for the page's master. Elmer comes from the land of shadow? I don't think he comes from the land of shadow because AOK is described as a different land. I believe it's called a foreign land, but we'll go over our AOK lore. Um, but the land of the is the land of shadow, but also different. Unless AOK got a tree, you know what I'm saying? Think I'm impatient? Could be. Dark Souls 1 is very much about wait for your opportunity to strike. Hi. Nice. You know what? Fair enough, fair enough. Uh, I didn't get the second shortcut though, did I? Dogs are cool and good. Voice sounds too low versus game sound? Um, I didn't change the balance. <gasps> oh my god, no. Yeah, my desktop audio should be lower. I don't know why it raised. What the heck? I don't know how that happened. Okay, that should be better. That should be about where it was before. I actually just noticed that. Thanks for that. 
AOK to AKA New Londor? AKA, we're definitely going to New Londor in the DLC. Or Londor in general. Dark Souls 3 is gonna be about Londor. It's gonna be about Londor. Poltergeist, I probably misclicked. Let me know how the balance is. I'll have to fix it later to like double check. What do you think the DLC will be played back in time, New Zone or New Dimension? I personally think New Zone, that is also lands between, kind of in terms of a world layered on top of one another, because once again, as has been mentioned, the lands between and the land of shadow implies a land of light. And potentially what the land of shadow or what the lands between is, is a lands between other lands. It's possible. I definitely think another realm in that, in that sort of way. But also, I personally think it's going to be focused on the past, considering the characters we have mentioned is Mikola, who is future, but he's following in Marika's footsteps. He's trying to traverse. Um, he's trying to stand where she stood. And we also know... Okay, we've seen this statue. Isn't this the spear-wielding guy, or is it slightly different? Smoldering butterflies? Or no, those are Aeonian, probably. Probably Aeonian. Sorry. Um, yeah, so also, it, the description says something along the lines of uh, the land where Marika first trod as a goddess or something like that. Something along those lines, paraphrased. Um, so it's going to be focused on the past. No, 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 let me finish. Let me finish. I know it's not going to be the past, but Bloodborne's DLC wasn't the past either, was it? But it was. But it also wasn't. And that's basically what I'm referencing. Almost every single DLC in a FromSoft game has referenced the past or been about the past, some more blatantly than others. We know we likely aren't time traveling, not in a literal sense, because this is just, we're going into a different realm in the same timeline, but the area that we're going to is very focused on what happened previously and something happened in this land that we don't otherwise know about which means it happened in the past so i'm not saying we're going to the past but we're likely going to be traversing lands that reference the past that have sort of been trapped in uh in sort of like a like a time things are locked away there sort of like a mix between the painted world and the bloodborne dream Bloodborne DLC, I think, is really, really, really evocative for this. Let's see. Can I fit a bubbler? I don't think I have Karen Retaliation on. Dang, I forgot. We'll see if I can manage. Um, Bloodborne had us enter a dream, which is a different realm. But it was also about the past. We didn't enter the past. It's a dream. But the research hall was a place that, that existed in the lore of the game. Um, the characters that we met were characters we knew about from the lore, from the past. And it was their present. Do you know what I mean? Like, they, they play with time. And the fishing hamlet was a major surprise that we didn't know about until that DLC. And it involves the past. So that's what I'm thinking based on what we've seen. Okay, not great. I'm really uncomfortably used to Karen Retaliation parry and the extra iframes, or the parry frames, I should say. So, give me a second while I try to. You can't parry that. That is his charge. Well, that's my bad. Bad roll. Yep, just slice me. Just send me. Good freaking night. Let's go put Karen on. Never played Bloodborne either? Oh man, Bloodborne is the best. <laughs> I'm not saying that's what it's going to be about, but considering that, in my opinion, their best DLC was the Old Hunters, and we're already getting into that we're in the present, but we're exploring the history of the land. I think it's pretty interesting. Dark Souls 3 didn't involve direct exploration of the past. Um... Kind of, not really. So that one's kind of different. Of course. Dark Souls 1, we literally enter the past. 
So Dark Souls 1 was very literal, and Dark Souls 2, uh, just location travel. The only DLC that involves 0% time travel at all. Not even like, this is the past. Well, kind of, it technically is the past, but not the past of the realm that we acquired. Okay. So it's really interesting, too, about Elmer of the Briar. So thorns are associated with the guilty. Um, they are put upon them sort of as a, as a punishment, meant, meant to sort of harm them, uh, be torturous. We see them in like weapons like Staff of the Guilty. Briar sorceries are all associated with the Blood Star and also guilt. Um, Elmer uses them. He is guilty of crimes, but he uses them not because he is guilty or because they were inflicted upon him, but because he uses them to harm other things and others. So it's pretty interesting. Yeah, come here. Goodbye. <laughs> you know what? We should always handle those three like that. Gonna go for all items? Not all items because this game is just freaking way too big. But a lot of significant items, yeah. I didn't need to do that. We're gonna uh, respawn the stake. I just want to get Karian. One or more shields, also the shield of the guilty, but also his shield. But he applies it as a, as a as a weapon to inflict upon a, a weapon to inflict harm upon others. God, great curve swords take way too long. Really? Oh, my bad. I'm a little rusty. Whoop. Very rusty. Okay. My inputs! I know that looked like panic rolling, I swear. It wasn't. Yep. Just dead. Man, this guy sucks. The giants and mountaintops are also full of thorns. Mm-hmm. I really wonder when the thorns came in, though. I don't know. It's possible Mesmer wasn't involved at all. It really, it totally is, you know, we don't want to assume too much based on two lines of dialogue and a figure introduced in DLC, but I can't get the Impaler part of his moniker out of my head. Shield and Stormveil with briars on it. So those briars, and this is where it gets a little fuzzy, they have marred the shield, and they are associated more with Death Blight. Death Blight is associated with thorns, but in a different way, and they tend to be depicted differently. At least safe? Oh, I know. Fuck. No. Oh, I forgot he's a jerk. He got a multi parry. Right. Okay, let's go. That you bitch ass, freaking punk ass bitch. They went too close. What? What? No, I really thought I got those. At least one of those. Really, Elmer? Also, I want people to realize that his name is Elmer, not Elmer, because everyone calls him Elmer. And you got it. Listen, I don't respect him very much, but you gotta respect him to give him his letters. Everyone calls him Elmer, dude. He's not the glue guy. Elmo is acceptable. Elmo is acceptable. Listen, if you call him Elmer, good. If you call him Elmo, good. If you call him Elmer, I'm sorry, that's a typo, dog. Oh, sorry. I dared to heal. That's my bad. That was my bad. I used a uh, third L1. I... Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. That's fine. Three L1s is just too much. I call him LA because we tight. Fair enough. Okay. 
No respect because he whooped that ass? Yeah, but like the thing is, I worry that people actually think his name is Elmer. But his name is Elmer. Don't you like Elmo? He's chill AF. I, I hate him because he smells bad. Sorry. Go shower, stinky. Oh no, he's gonna grab me. Oh, okay. Do you like how I teleported like further away? I love, I love FromSoft grab hitboxes. I love them so genuinely. <laughs> oh shit. Oh, sorry, I friends disrespect me. You're getting up. I'm so sorry. I apologize. I really feel like I'm getting some of these. Like, I'm not spamming. I'm trying to get the timing, but like... That, that was, that was, that was, yeah. I literally couldn't even get up. Dude, honestly, it's more like Elmer of the bitch. You know what I'm saying? Like, God, for real. Uh... His name is Elmer, and in DLC we fight Mesmer, so they're sure are connected. You take that back. You take that back. No, my my boy, my boy Mesmer, my boyfriend, who we haven't even met yet. Who's my best friend? No, 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 no. That, no, he's not related to this fucker, okay? Uh-uh. Absolutely no shot. That's my boy, Mess... Messimer, don't clean his room? Shit. There we go. Finally. Okay, that time I don't, because, you know, why could I do something twice in a row? Makes sense. Ooh, Elmer? Ah, uh, it was probably too far. Ah, uh, it was too slow. Oh, that's my bad. I dared to heal yet again. Yeah, Mesmer don't hang with scrubs. I know Mesmer's a dude. Wait, Mesmer, really? I mean, I guess we can't assume, but, um... He has a boy voice? Then again, there are figures in the lore who have girl voice and are boy. But that's mostly because they're young. I went for it. I don't think we get confirmation on gender yet of him, I guess. But I mean, he looks like a dude. Boy voice. Seems adultish. So like, they're not doing the, he's got a girl voice because he's uh, young, which they do sometimes. You know, a lot of uh, women have, are uh, male voice actors, like boy voice actors, right? He is pretty. All of Marika's children are pretty. Even the ones with Radigan. Just kidding, I hate Radigan, but he is pretty. Maybe Mesmer is Envy? Yeah, I suppose so. I did forget how far that goes. That's my bad. Even Moog is pretty? I mean, he's pretty, but his personality isn't. That's his main problem, realistically. We don't have confirmation. What was I talking about? About assuming. We gotta be careful of assumptions with the lore. Bye! God, I 
forgot how he just explodes into redness. Very, very cool effect. Alrighty. So here we have Portrait of Melania, the only one in the game, from what I can remember. And if, if, honestly, I'm pretty sure it's the only one. There might be another. That's the one I can think of. Um, oops. Actually, this is kind of cool. It doesn't combo or anything. Uh, also, lots of prostheses. Pr Prosthesi? Uh, sorry, I don't know the plural. Prostheses, probably. Uh, let's take a look. So this is his ultimate fanboy room where he kept his collection. Books, clean rot knight armor sets, and more of these praying statues. We'll have to keep an eye out for these because I don't remember these figures anywhere else, personally. Why he loves to hunt merchants? Was he a robber? Um, I mean, sort of, he would take your, uh, he would kill you so hard he took your bell bearing. But yeah, he was a thief. And a killer. And on this side, we have these same statues. I could have sworn these ones are the ones holding spears. I think we see some of these in Altus, but with spears? But no spears. Statues praying to the misbegotten in the Halig tree. I don't remember the Halig tree very well, but yeah. Handsome in an androgynous sense. The one thing I'll say about uh, Mesmer is he is definitely handsome, but he's also kind of terrifying looking, and that's what I like about him. Like, I like that he looks scary. He has that sort of monstrous face, the intensely modeled skin, um, severe dark circles to the point that his, his eyes look bruised. Like, he has an intense look to him. He, and he's very lanky, yeah. He's his, he's literally stretched. His, org, his, his body is long and extended, so he's not quite what I would call, like, traditionally handsome, but that's why he's so handsome, you know what I'm saying? Actually, there is food here. This is pretty notable. Fresh food. Bread and apples. Pretty interesting. Didn't impress me, honestly? It's okay, more for me. Been to Radon's tower yet? Yes, what about it? Looks snaky. Where? Sheldon Cooper of FromSoft? I, you have to take another look at Sheldon Cooper. And another look at Mesmer. What's Patches doing there anyway? Honestly, I don't know. I understand that this is why people think they're... Well... Oh, let's read this, his weapon, of course, too. Hang on. So this is House Marai's Executioner's Sword. Storied sword of House Marai, the family of executioners who presided over the Shaded Castle one of the legendary armaments. Elmer of the Briar, the bell-bearing hunter, snatched the sword from the site of his looming execution and furnished it with battle skills from his home of Aeocade. Aeocade's dancing blade. Infuse the sword with energy, then fling it forward in a corkscrew attack. The sword continuously deals damage while violently spinning. That's a sort of, like, um, special thing he does. It's not the only sword that does it. One thing I will note, the horns look quite interesting. Or the thorns, I mean. They look red. And if I'm not mistaken, the Aeocate's Dancing Sword, the other one that we can get, is a very interesting red color. But I don't think it has thorns on it. I think thorns are an Elemer thing. I wonder if it isn't him sort of taking on his identity as the guilty? Because thorns equal guilt. He could also have an association with the Bloodstar. That would track. Um, especially the arcane scaling. We've come to the conclusion during this playthrough that arcane also relates to space stuff, but primordial, uh, primeval space stuff. So, for example, Selin's hat raises arcane and intelligence, and her main source of study was the primeval current. So, arc, yes, it, it affects your blood damage and how much bleed you do and arcane based weapons which tend to be bleed but why is it called arcane it's not blood it's arcane because it's associated quite possibly with primeval sorceries primeval things and the blood star as a result so yeah i think that's what he's doing here i think that may be the thorns that's not an aok -okay thing that's a him thing then we have the briar great shield
all them at specific locations at night um yeah but if you kill the the church hunter you miss out on his gear i believe you don't get unless does it it's been so long since i played bloodborne if you kill him early does he just drop his gear or do you lose do you lose it wow i have to, I have to remind, remind myself about i don't remember it's a real pity to miss his quest Arcane also needed for bottle bubbles, and they are surely not classic glintstone magic. Exactly! That's actually where we started to make the association with arcane as related to space magic. Because those bubbles do magic damage. But they are way, 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 way older. Here we go. Sorcery, the claimant who served as priest in the ancient dynasty. Produces several small magical bubbles that drift toward foes where they naturally pop. The claimants search for lost oracles within their bubbles. It's like a tiny pocket for a moment into their space magic. So this is basically where we started to develop this association. Based on things related to Ark, we started to come to the conclusion that it equals space magic, which is very much like Bloodborne. Bloodborne um, arcane relates to basically space magic. Oh, now let's take a look at the shields, the Briar Great Shields. Now this is this is what you're talking about, the Shield of the Guilty. Shield made to venerate a maiden whose eyes were crushed by Briars of Sin. So thorns equal sin. Oh, hang on, I forgot to read this. Great Shield said to have, it's the same more basically. What I will say though, hang on, let's take a look at this. Whoop, sorry, there. What are these on it? The, the, the is that wood? It's like dehydrated wood or roots. What's really interesting about this is we see things that look exactly like these roots everywhere in the DLC trailer. Like they're huge, massive, growing out of everything. They're probably just roots, but it's pretty interesting. They are tree sentinels after all. So it makes sense. Fire set triggers Melania's great rune. When we're talking about great runes, I'm afraid I have no idea. Omen growth? Looks different. No, I don't think so. You don't have a big one? Do you mean the bubble spell? No, I don't remember where you have where you get where you find that. Yeah, when it oops, sorry, when it comes to great runes, I will have very little idea because I've only used a great rune once, and that was so I could get uh, the spell. Uh, law of Regression. I wanted the Law of Regression secret uh, when I wasn't running an int build, so I had to use Godric's rune one time. I don't use runes. <laughs> Day bubbles near Dragon Halberd. We forgot to fight the Dragon kill kin Soldier underground. That's my bad. We have to go do that. Crucible roots like on Siluria. Silurias are antlers. But Soluria is meant to evoke an image of the Crucible. So definitely, definitely a link, but not direct. Ancient Deer Place, there's a portal to go to him. Yeah, I completely forgot about doing that. So we'll do that right away. Okay. Great shield from a foreign land used by Elmer of the Briar. Attacks with this armament utilize the iron thorns that have been wound around its frame. But they're red iron. That's really interesting. Originates from Aokade, a land a land of proudly solitary ascetics. Um, I really wonder if Elmer isn't the dung eater of his culture because he's proudly solitary, but he doesn't seem much like an ascetic. He's you know stealing and thieving and killing and murdering. But let's take a look at the shield. It's really hard to tell, but you can actually see his mask. But it's covered in stuff. Wait a second. Uh, is this just me? Huh. Do you see that guy on the left? Does that not look exactly like the knights? The the undead knights that we see right over here? We were just talking about them. The one that looked kind of like Baldur's knights. Like these guys. The dead ones. Red iron may just be indicative of poor care and rust. They're not rusty though. They could be simply covered in blood. It's, it's honestly, they do look bloody. It's possible they're bloody. It's basically barbed wire. But the color red is pretty notable, especially since this whole thing looks red. Let's go teleport somewhere so we can see better. 
It's a mural. Yeah, but I wonder if this isn't linked to the soulless uh, king. Maybe we are going to Aokade. The thing is that the, the Aokade is described as a foreign land, so I don't think we're going to Aokade because the land of shadow is not a foreign land. Yeah, that figure right there, that is a skeleton. The helmet looks similar. It's holding a spear. Honestly, now it's hard to tell that he's wearing red. Maybe it isn't red in this lighting. Let's look at the other side. Either way, he's framed by skeletons. Did we get all over his gear as well? Mm, guess we didn't. I don't remember where we get his drops. These guys. The helmet on that one looks a lot like this one, but if the... Well, no, no, it looks a little different. The back looks similar, though. Still, there's they're definitely skeletons. Buy it from Enya. That's what it is. Perfect, let's go do that. Oh, but first let's fight that dragonkin soldier, because that's actually quite key. Um... I don't remember exactly. I know you teleport up there, but I don't remember which teleporter it is. We'll just have to wander around a little bit. It takes much more than robbery and massive scale to reach Dung Eater level of degeneracy, but he's from a culture of ascetics, and he's basically this hunter who kills and invades and slaughters and steals. Like it's pretty it's pretty intense. He's not cursing people forever, that's true. not fight this boss either oh my god i yeah i left things undone here that's the problem we get so into discussions that you know i forget what i'm doing a lot it's a slight problem dragonkin and ainsel there's a dragonkin there too but we actually haven't been to ainsel river yet only uh shofra i think there's one around here there it is Hello. I think this is the one I'm currently looking for, but we do have to find the remaining torches. And there's one right there! Okay. <laughs> Didn't know about the show for one. There's a couple ways to access this one. Um, so I personally found it through this way in my first playthrough. It's a teleporter. But it's... Oh, now that I think about it, it's a one way. It literally doesn't appear. Um, that up there, you might recognize it. That area... It's a little hard to see, but you can fight Mimic Tier. Like, that's Nokron over there. You might even be able to see a little bit of it over in the uh, distance. You fight Mimic Tier up there. Sort of in that direction. And right up there is the high level of this boss. The um, Ancient Ancestral Spirit, whatever. The Regal Ancestor Spirit. So we haven't been there yet, but you can jump down from here safely to access this area too, and a lot of people use that way. Moose number two though. No, we haven't even touched that area. <laughs> A corpse should be left well alone. feet for lore. Dragon feet. They're basically humanoid dragons. I'm trying to take a look at the symbol on their back. These guys hit pretty hard. So, yeah, okay. I do too, but they're mean. Get a good symbol. A good look at the symbol 
on their back. Unfortunately, it's probably gonna have to be like a Zuli thing. I'm sure Zuli's already done a video on dragon pins. I just haven't seen it. Huge skeleton on a throne? What's up with those? Honestly, not sure what's up with the skeletons on the thrones, to be honest. Could be a remnant of the old civilization. Probably is. This one drops, I think, an axe? Halberd. Close enough. What is an axe if not a halberd, but like shorter? Halberd shaped like a dragon and wreathed with both ice and lightning. Alas, the dragonkin soldiers never attained immortality and perished as decrepit, pale imitations of their skyborn kin. Sucks to suck, nerd. So it is literally a depiction of a dragon. You can see the head uh, leaning backward, its mouth wide open. You see its claw in the front. And then the back, the halberd part, the, the blade is a dragon wing, or at least meant to be. At the top though, what is that? Is that a little mini dragonkin there at the tip? Do you see that? At the very top? I think that's supposed to be a dragonkin. It's got the same head shape, I can almost see teeth, and then the body, it's like wide open and broad. Interesting. And the tail of the dragon is coiled around the blade. More coiling, more serpentine behavior. Oh man, I did that wrong. Just a straight up quality weapon. Yeah, so this one doesn't... Hang on. There we go. So it's just spinning slash, but when you use it, you can see the ice lightning, and this is a unique trait of the uh, the dragons, the dragon kin. They were never able to achieve what their what like immortality. They were never able to become dragons, but because they also had never seen the sky, their lightning was also unique. That's pretty neat. I've never looked at that weapon so close either. And then we get Marika's Scar Seal. So another reminder that Marika is a Newman. And the Newman, they came from another world, for sure. But the Newman that we know of also seem to have come from Nokron, or there, there were they were they eventually, if I'm understanding correctly, became the Nox, but the Nox... See, it's a little confusing because this, they're described as scions of the Eternal City, the Numen, the Black Knives specifically. Um, the female Numen who, you know, were... So they're associated with the Eternal Cities, um, which we know as Nokron and Noxtella, but they're also very close to this ancient civilization, which is otherwise known as the Civilization of Old, which are what all these ruins are. So I wonder if the Newman didn't predate the Nox, but maybe eventually kind of became, like, mixed with them? Mixed up with them? I think it's more like descendants. Ants with the big balls on there and also drop Numen runes. Yeah, the, the ones that look more, they're not queens, but they look more queen-like. I always call them queens. Um, they likely drop Numen runes because they consumed Numen. That tends to be the trend. If an item is dropped by an enemy that, like, that doesn't look right, what are you afflicted with? Anything? These scribes look pretty normal, actually. Yeah, if an enemy drops something, like a, like a human drop, like a rune arc, or, um... For example, rats. Rats in Dark Souls drop humanity? You might be like, oh, does that mean the rats are human? No, they probably just ate humans, thus having humanity in them. That tends to be the general lore consensus. Wait, where is this? I remember there being, like, a, like a door in here. One moment, please snake with one leg. Can you tell me where that is? I can't believe we missed that. If so. Oh, the sword seal. Yeah, sorry. I wanted to read it. I got so distracted. Yeah, they're eyeballs. They're eyeballs with a rune upon them. And the rune is directly the the elven runes. Um, an eye, or uh, this legend, wait, sorry, that's this one. 
an eye engraved with an Elden rune. So there's a difference between a great rune and an Elden rune. The Elden runes are associated directly with uh, Radigan slash Marika, and as far as we know, they're the only ones. Godfrey, as far as we know, did not have an Elden rune. We don't quite know what's up with that. Um, an eye engraved with an Elden rune said to be the seal of Queen Marika. Raises mind, intelligence, faith, and arcane, but also increases damage taken. These seals represent the lifelong duty of those chosen by the gods. So this one, Scar Seal, drops off a Zamora warrior in the Whipping Peninsula. As discussed, Radigan's Source Seal is like a lattice. Um, it's literally like got X's all over it. It's used to block, prevent the spread of information, lock things down, seal them away, etc. Um, Marika's looks like her uh, pose when she is crucified. Interestingly, it's interesting that apparently even before she was crucified, this was her symbol. So it's, woo, sorry, pretty interesting. Top the stairs, setting down the tower. Neat, let's take a look. Is it different than, wouldn't that just be the, the divine tower symbol stuff? Is it different than the others? Wouldn't things where they put people on all over Limgrave? Yeah, those are, those are uh, meant to mimic Martha's crucifixion. Yeah. Great Oracular Bubble. All right, thanks so much Chad, for the reminder to do this, because that's a lot of interesting stuff that I hadn't yet done. And important drops. Sorcery of the Clayman who served as priest in the ancient dynasty. Produces a gigantic magical bubble that drifts towards foes before it naturally ruptures. The Clayman search for lost oracles within their bubbles. Unfortunately, the lore is the same, but still really cool. Remind me of the position of spreading a god's blessing while Radigan is a net locking things in place. Yeah, definitely. I think it's definitely meant to evoke all that, for sure. Marika's... Marika's pose, even in her statues before she was crucified, is the crucifixion pose. Her arms are out. She has this... It's very interesting how they're both depicted. Marika sort of hanging. Uh, Radigan, chest out, you know? Marika's willing to take the blame while Radigan makes sure no flaws can be seen from the outside. Definitely, but I think it's also the fact that Marika martyrs herself. She, it was almost like foreshadowed with her rune. She knew that she had to do this pretty, pretty early from what we can tell. And she actually tries to fix the mistake she made, unlike Radigan, who leans in further on his errors. Mesmer impaled Marika? It's possible. We don't know yet, though. We don't know their relationship yet. Um, top of the stairs? This? I do not know what that creature is. It definitely... Is it... Are those fish legs? I don't think it's a snake. It definitely looks snake-like. It's very long, but it's also got, like, legs. Is Mewtwo? Why did Marika steal the rune of death? That's a big mistake. She killed the right course of things. Yes, yes, she did. Um, partially because the main goal of alchemy is immortality. Everything else that happened in the lands between. The Elden Ring is a philosopher's stone. Marika and Radigan are a rebus, a perfect alchemical being. The main goal was to create gold from lead and immortality. Those were the, the main goals of alchemy. Everything was to create perfection. And that's how perfection was defined. So I think when Marika sailed the rune of death, it was an effort to prevent death. She wanted everyone in her in her nation to be immortal. She wanted immortality for everybody. Now I'm remembering FMA where they tried to transmute entire country. They sure did. Sorry if that's spoilers, but we talk about FMA too much. <laughs> Marika's pose is vulnerable, inviting while Radigan's is, def is defensive and intimidating. Marika's open, Radigan's close. A hundred percent, a thousand percent agreed. Thinking about their poses forever now is really great lore. Great insight, Apophis. Yeah, absolutely. 
I definitely see fishtail, but I can't tell like what's going on with this. It is interesting that this particular one does have a like. How much of this is Godskin stuff? Because we do have Godskin stuff. I wonder if they weren't renovating the tower to remove some of this Godskin stuff. I think the Godskin stuff here predates Radon trying to use this as his tower. I don't know though. I can't be sure. Because this part looks normal. Everything looks the same here as all the other Divine Towers. But this stuff and the Godskin stuff in the basement, definitely not. The Divine Tower doors? Like this? Or other tower doors? Going down the stairs, you'll see them at the top of each. Ooh, the same mural? The same mural. Hmm. I forgot that happens. I don't know. Like, listen, if I were to describe this creature in the center, its leg, that one makes me think of, like, a rabbit. Obviously, no other rabbit traits. It looks like a, like, is that... Because that one looks like a foot. That one also looks like it's supposed to be a foot, but it extends straight from the spine. There's also other parts that look weathered and eroded as if they've been, like, broken off over time. Was this incomplete? Or was it, you know, damaged by time? I don't know. This is definitely interesting, though. Uh, background similar to Radigan's Thorns. Mm, no. Vaguely, but the thing about Rattigan and Thorns is they're, is they're very harsh, straight lines versus these are curved. Every time we see Rattigan symbols, they are harsh, straight lines. This is similar, but they're too curved. And definitely a distinct shape. I will say, down there's, there's like a sort of heart in the center going upwards. It's very dainty. I think this might be some sort of godskin symbol. Because it's definitely looking like animal parts. Like, that looks like a fishtail to me. That looks like some sort of unknown warped creature. It could even be like a baby godskin. We know they were swaddled. Snakes on Mesmer have any legs? No, they have wings made of armor that seems he seems to have attached himself. Like little armor wings. And otherwise, they are coming out of his body and don't even have ends, as far as we can tell. Both Radon's and Ronnie's Vine Towers have godskins chilling in them. Dif difference. This tower is always weird. The entrance point, the way to access it. Look how it's like literally visually wrapped up like this. Like it's wrapped in stone. It honestly seems, actually they all have that sort of symbol, but this one more blatantly looks like it, right? No, not there. Um, this tower is incomplete. Celtic knots? Definitely reminiscent of Celtic knots. Where is it, my tower? This way. Radon's tower is different than the others. For sure. Um, so the fact that there's godskins in the basement, like they are there. They are hiding a treasure. Oh, great, Kayla Dog. I'm trying to lure. Versus Ronnie's, the godskin is outside the tower and appears when you try to enter it to attack you. And it's a godskin apostle versus a godskin noble. They're not hiding something within the tower. Ronnie's tower, other than the whole Karian inversion thing, is otherwise you walk in, you ride up, you get what, you, what you're looking for. It's very simple. This one has a whole ass basement with a secret treasure. None of the others have it. I wonder why. It's possible that Radon knew about this aspect to his tower. But I really wonder if he did. It just seems like he's like, oh, this is a good tower. I can use this for my, for my rune. I don't know, man. It's weird. His two fingers is up there. It's got to be his because that's the one that powers up his rune, right? Maybe I shouldn't say his two fingers because it looks like only Empyreans got their own two fingers. But a two fingers associated with his rune. Hang on. That's the same symbol. It's just the symbol on the divine tower. Do you see up there? Right there at the very top. That's the same symbol we saw on the outside of the divine tower. Do they all have that symbol? 
I think we gotta take a look at some divine powers. Let's go to this one. This is an easy one. Repurpose and other architecture built around them? Hmm, that sounds about right, definitely. Like the idea, I think the godskin stuff predated the tower. Or the use of the tower for the demigods. Each of them has a two fingers at the top. Maybe that's what made them divine. Also, I know I've jokingly referred to the two fingers as TV antennas because they get messages from the greater will, but they are getting messages from space and we do see them very high up at the top of divine towers. It's as if the towers were built for the two fingers to speak to the greater will. Like TV antennas. Even the one in the Erd tree at the Round Table Hold, which is definitely, you know, a little bit more symbolic than the others. It might not even be a real two fingers there. There's, it's a little questionable, that one. But that two fingers has the, uh, yeah, it's the same symbol. Now, this is just the symbol on the towers. It's on all of them. We've just never looked at it. Or I haven't. That's really interesting. Could be Crucible stuff. Also, how much were they repurposed, you know? Looking at this one, though, it is also hewn into the rock, right? The fact that Radon's is a basement is just kind of unique to it. They do it all extend downward. Look at that, though. We just can't access it. Just some Radon's yesterday looking around. No, that's a great insight. We wouldn't have, we wouldn't have looked at all of them if that weren't the case. You hadn't mentioned it. That light is really... There's light and dark falling. Pretty interesting. Pretty interesting effect. Also, the music here is like ringing of bells. These are weird. These are really weird. We see those in mines. We see, um, they seem to be meteors. These are literally meteors. In the center of the circle they make? What do you mean, like, um... Oh, you mean the Divine Tower? Yeah, the whole thing with, like, how it hides the DLC. I think that's very likely. Explicitly snake-like, it is vaguely serpentine. I think the head... Sorry, I'm trying to look up, but it just looks like I'm looking up this character skirt. The head, I can see it as being snake-like, but the problem is, like, it's literally got legs that we can see. So I don't really want to... I can see it as being snake-like. Especially if you look at that's the top of the snake head. Do you know what I mean? So you can see the two eyes, and then it goes... But then the body's, like, super warped, and it's got multiple limbs. Doesn't mean it's not a snake. Also, those things... Is that a turtle? That looks like a snapping turtle mouth to me. Or a bird? It could be a- oh, It's a fucking bird. That looks like a hawk. That- Heck if I know. But I do see fish parts. Like, I see those as fish tails. They could also be scaled feet. Like dragon feet, but they don't look like they have claws. This is definitely- there's definitely some animals depicted here, though. Reminds me of the squirrel that climbs up and down the world tree in Norse myth. Oh my god, Ratatoskr. I totally forgot about Ratatoskr. We talked about how the Erd tree... Sorry, I keep saying that. It's too close in my head now. The world tree in Norse myth has multiple animals upon it. Um, Ratatoskr. I believe he's a messenger and is able to traverse multiple realms. Kind of like Hermes in Greek myth. Um, I don't... I don't know if he's a messenger. Super fuzzy on his allure to be honest, but um, the animals on the Erd, the world tree, world tree, world tree, in Norse myth, there are nine deer, I believe. There is, technically he's not on it, but there's a dragon at the roots who's constantly chewing through, that's Needhog. Um, and yeah, Ratatoskr, the, the squirrel, is able to traverse the entire tree. It's one of his unique traits. 
No snakes as far as I know. Maybe it's the twin birds? It could be. Yeah. Gronk might have put the Glomide Queen's sword in the basement. The thing is, there's still a Godskin Apostle there almost defending it. So I, I don't think they lost their sword. I think they're keeping an eye on the sword. If Gronk took it... Well, then again, they could have just reclaimed it. Yeah, no. It's possible Gronk hit it there. Because that is supposed to be, like, the Godskin sword, right? I will say, there's a... This, this one... Hey... Oh, you're a warhawk. <gasps> Look, and its legs aren't hurt and it's not shackled. So you're not a warhawk, you're just a hawk. Oh, I didn't mean to do that. I actually meant to use catch flame, but I clicked the wrong button. Stormhawk, not warhawk. Jormungandr, he said to eat the world at Ragnarok? World Tree 2? Jormungandr wraps around the entire world. He's not directly associated with the world tree, but technically, yeah. Jormungandr, the giant serpent child of Loki, is definitely worth mentioning, too. Ratatoskr is a messenger. The reason he's a messenger, and I thought he was a messenger, because like Hermes, Hermes is special. He's able to traverse all realms of the gods. That's what makes him a messenger. He's able to go to Hades, to... Um, I don't remember the realm of the gods, it's in Greek myth. But he's very special, he's the only one able to do that. No one can leave Hades except for Hermes. There's something very special about messengers. So, the fact that Radatoskr can climb the entire world tree and enter all of its realms, there's something significant about that. That's why he's, um, it's, it's important, basically. Yeah. Gnawing at overgrowth to rot or on parts similar to Needhog, but a much smaller and more measured capacity since Needhog is trying to devour the whole tree. Needhog is trying to... Needhog will eventually cut through the roots, gnaw through the roots, and trigger Ragnarok. So I would say Needhog is more negatively depicted in, in, the, in terms of Norse myth. But then again, I don't know the full story. Melina is our special messenger? Um, potentially. I don't necessarily think she's a Hermes or a Ratatoskr. But she is, she's got a foot in multiple realms with her uh, spiritness, yeah. Idea of a sacred messenger getting diplomatic immunity was huge in the ancient world. Yeah. I'm pretty sure killing a messenger was like a big deal. You did not do it. No one did. I, I think there's a story about, um, what's his name? Genghis Khan? It might be, it might have been Genghis Khan. He sent a messenger into a city and they killed him and that's a huge no-no you do not kill a messenger so genghis khan conquered and absolutely annihilated the city with a vengeance because of because of the fact they did that and he would have spared them if he hadn't or not like spared he was kind of a vicious man but i remember reading that story somewhere and it's, it was like the whole thing is do not kill messengers because once you kill a messenger how are you supposed to communicate it's not like you have text it's not like you have the internet like you have there's something sacred about them because terms you know they, they had a sort of immunity diplomatic immunity effectively it was a huge deal to kill one or hurt one great gods even have a dedicated realm besides Olymp olympus that's it yep that's it it's olympus technically olympus is like the top of a mountain so it's not like a realm, but yeah, no, that was technically their realm. It was like a, a forbidden realm for humans, of course. It's why you didn't touch the mountain. Um, that was for the gods. Okay, uh, let's do a little bit. Oh, let's give Millicent the prosthesis, and then we can progress her quest line while we're at it. You wouldn't attack the city if they agreed. Yeah, I think, but he he did want them to like bow to him sort of thing so it's not like it was like i'll leave you alone if you say no but definitely they made a big bad move by uh killing this messenger that's for sure hello millicent we found a weapon for you now i'm tracing the path melania took she's passed into the lands that lie beyond the Erd tree give the valkyries prosthesis Are you giving me this arm Thank you. I am in your debt yet again. I think. If the arm serves well enough, it might be possible for me to wield a sword again. 
So I want to talk a bit about Valkyries. Uh, Melania is associated with them. A lot of my knowledge is sort of... I don't know a ton about Norse myth. I know a fair bit, like a like a slight amount. I know some of the figures, some of the interesting stories, some of the funnier stories, frankly. <laughs> but generally, I have a sort of incomplete knowledge. But I will go over what I do know because it's pretty significant. So the Valkyries, when we think of a Valkyrie, normally think of an armored woman with wings. But their role was to take spirits to, I think not just Valhalla, but also to uh, Folkvanger, the the realm of the dead ran by Freya. So Odin controls Valhalla, but half the souls would go to Folkvanger. It was like a 50-50 split. So they definitely take the spirits of those who died in battle, and they take them to their resting place where they can party and have a good time. But... I actually am unsure if they did the 50-50 split. I think they did. But the thing is that Valkyrie are depicted as warriors and warrior women, but they also are these sort of liminal figures that take the spirits of those who have died and take them to where they're supposed to go. Also, their their job was to create things. They also, when they weren't taking souls, they uh, they were doing traditionally feminine crafts, such as spinning. But they would do them in grotesque ways. So, for example, they would, um, instead of spinning thread, they would, out of wool, they would use, like, human innards and stuff like that. So they were really weird and interesting. <laughs> Norsemith is cool. But they, they were also kind of terrifying in their way. Neil Gaiman's book on Norse mythology, I haven't read that. Wielding a sword again, she used a sword before. That's what's so interesting. I did want to talk about that too with Millicent. She apparently, she's a very, very gifted swordswoman. I wonder if she didn't just sort of, she wasn't born with it uh, because of her mother, for sure, because she uses waterfowl when she invades us. But she lost her arm. It's possible it's because of the Scarlet Rot. It's possible because it was cut off perhaps by us during her invasion. Um, but as discussed, since the invasion is not required to encounter her, you know, it's 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 possible. We, we got to look at what can, what definitely happens, and what definitely happens is she has no arm. We meet her, but she nonetheless is a talented swordsman. And what's really interesting is she gives you when you help her, she gives you this talisman from the very get go. A talisman engraved with a scene from a heroic tale raises dexterity. Though born into the accursed rot, when the young girl encountered her mentor and his flowing blade, she gained wings of unparalleled strength. It's Melania. She has a talisman depicting Melania with her mentor. Also, the same blind swordsman who uh, apparently sealed the rot god under the lake of rot. Pretty interesting. Gary poisoned her or provoked her injury to get her closer to being more similar to Melania with a prosthetic and so forth. It's possible, especially since I don't think the other sisters are missing limbs. We only see them very briefly. So, couldn't get into God of War. Uh, I played the first game, liked it, couldn't beat Ragnarok. I, it got, ugh, I'm not the biggest fan of Ragnarok, which is too bad. Elrond invades you three times. Yeah, but it's not about an invader who loses their limbs. It's about Millicent invades us. Although I think that's not her. It's more the rot aspect of her. So we have precedent for figures who invade you being sort of controlled by an outer god. Vike invades you at his... Um, where his maiden is. But he uses nothing but frenzy. Um... Presumably his frenzy is sort of taken over and is attacking you there. It could be what's left the Vike, but it's kind of hard to say because the Vike that we encounter in the Everjail uses no frenzy stuff. Even his spear, Vike's war spear, doesn't inflict frenzy upon you because the one sealed in the Everjail has no frenzy within him. Or at least it's locked away. It's, it's a really interesting case. But Millicent has no ill will towards us, has no reason to fight us, is unable to move. Yet when we approach that needle, the needle that can seal the rod away... The rot invades us, effectively. Waterfowl itself is too much for a rotted body to handle? Um, I mean, she does it in her invasion, and Melania does it, so... But no, she's, she's definitely used a sword before. Frenzy requires the sustained attention of the big fire dude. 
Oh, you mean the, the frenzy god? I don't know. Isn't Millicent immune to the rot when she invades you with the swamp? I don't know. I've never used rot on her. But probably. The Church of Inhibition. Yeah, where his, where his maiden is. Mm -hmm. Seems ironic to me. Yeah, yeah, it's a good point. <laughs> now that you mention it, yeah. Anyway. If Hi. the arm serves well enough, it might be possible for me to wield a sword again. Perhaps then I can aid you in battle. If the arms okay. it might be perhaps then one more time just to be sure if the it might be perhaps then we've learned that sometimes after saying dialogue twice they have a new third secret line commander's also rot immune from the swamp yeah that's that's probably just gameplay over lore they don't want you to run into the swamp and just kill uh <laughs> your invader or your uh, boss. And Millicent is still there. Okay, let's go talk to Gauri. I know he has some dialogue and he might it might trigger now, but I'm not certain. Hmm, I didn't get all the stuff down here. I've never even been down here, huh? Wow, I don't have that golden seed. Okay, we have a couple things to complete here. Let's go... Let's go grab a couple uh, sites of grace down here that I completely missed. And we also wanted to get that talisman. Uh, what that is on the map, just north of it? Sorry, north of the shaded castle? Oh, this thing. Yeah, that is interesting. What the heck is even that? Sinking ship? Whirlpool? Doesn't look like a whirlpool. But it could be. That's a good question. Deathrite bird? Ugh. Yeah, I gotta do the deathrite bird. I hear deathrite bird and I take out my bloodhound fang. <laughs> Alright, let's go south here. There's a couple sites of grace here. There's a golden seed. There's a couple talismans. Things like that. Fallen, fallen warrior chooser. From Val, those slain on the battlefield, and Kyosa to choose. Interesting! I actually didn't know about the meaning of the word, so Valkyrie literally means... Um, those slain on the battlefield chooser. Literally. In... Hello! I never remember where the Sights of Grace are around here. Champion gear and the girl oh, I'm poor. Headman reserved for the Badlands bravest, proof that the wearer has slaughtered countless foes. Following the example of their chieftain Horalu, the brave warriors of the Badlands shun excess adornment. Sturdy great helm made from iron, though it is uncomfortably heavy and obstructs the vision of the wearer, it provides considerable damage negation. Lore is the same as long as we get one piece. I will get all of them though. Forbidden rune time. Death right, more like death wrong. <laughs> Got him. Yet. Excuse me? Sir, I'm trying to boost the local economy? Can I freaking help you? I heard the music and I was like, it's a knight's cavalry. Don't hurt the merchant, you dickwad. Best. Oh my god, get over here, brother. That was my bad. Oh my god. Tokyo freaking drifting all over the place. We go. A little bit of dot damage. I 
actually forgot about this one, so that's really great. Ashivore Poison Moth Flight. Let me start to click X to get rid of that. <laughs> See immune to Rod Song, by the way? Nah, honestly, if we want to test that sort of stuff, I'd... Eh. I don't think there's lore. There is sometimes lore in terms of immunity, but there's a, we got so much to do. I'll leave that to someone else, man. <laughs> I'll leave that to another playthrough. Picking up a raw weapon and poking somebody until we see if it affects them. Checking out sleep immunity, rod immunity, it's just it's another time. This Ash of Aura grants an armament the poison affinity and the following skill. Poison Moth Flight. Slash with a poison infused blade. If the follow-up strike lands on a poison foe, it will deal significant damage. Very interesting. Yeah, I kind of forgot about that one. Love for PvP. Yeah, you know what? I still remember uh, Adam Barker way back when told me he was doing like a like a rot poison build with the mushroom stuff. I remember that. Oh, I have been here. I just never got this talisman. Wait. I gotta get the Sight of Grace closer to this to this guy here. It's the one I normally take to find Gowrie. Oh, what the heck? What the heck? Windy Crystal Tear. I have I ever found this in my adult life? Probably, but I don't remember it. Holy heck. Crag Blade? Crag Blade. I don't remember. I don't remember where Crag Blade is. Oh my god, the bird. Real pissed. Oh my god. They're just staring at me menacingly. Joke's on you, bitch. <laughs> I can't believe it let me do that. I didn't think it would, but it did. 50% damage? Yeah, yeah, it makes your weapons uh, get all rocky and ugly. Yeah, yeah, No, I know what it is. I just, um, it's really strong. It's just, I'm good. It's like at what cost, you know? It's what Radon does. His weapons. I think there's only one other Kaled dog in the game that has a collar. Because this is likely Gowrie's pet, by the way. It's got a collar on it. See, Gowrie can't be bad. He has a dog. Hello. Ah, welcome, welcome. How may I help? Study sorcery. Study incantations. Do you have an interest in rot incantations? Yeah. Then you might like to Any bad people have pet dogs? History. No. Of millennia. You're only a good person Goddess if you have if you like a pet. Look at Radon, he has a horse and he's the best guy. He's like so nice and good. So liking an animal just immediately makes everything that you do morally okay. Thanks for listening. I'm joking if you can't tell. <laughs> The rot, the rot incantation. Right, right, right. Incantation of the Servants of Rot. A technique of the pale pests who crawl through the lands, afflicted by Scarlet Rot, the abandoned children of the goddess. Do you have any interest in rot incantations? Do you need me for something else? The only pre-shattering Radon is probably a stand-up guy. You see what I mean? You see what I mean? I'm telling you, all you do is you like a single horse, and you do an animal cruelty to it, and people will still excuse anything you've ever done. So, you gave Millicent a golden arm replacement. This is a wonderful development. Thank you for your kindness. Now, Millicent may fully realize her true warrior's potential. Like her beautiful mother. About Millicent. The girl, Millicent, she is a bird. Green and undeveloped, waiting to flower into magnificence. What a wondrous day that will be. In truth, before her, I'd never seen a bird of such superior quality. She might very well outshine her sisters. About Melania. Queen Marika and her king consort Radigan were blessed with twin demigods. 
and Melania was one of them. She was born an Empyrean, carrying the Scarlet Rod. An Empyrean is no mere demigod. In the age of the Elden Ring and Queen Manica, the precious Empyrean was born, a new god, to forge a new order. Since Melania fought Radan, and the great scarlet flower blossomed in He's a rot worshipper. He wasn't always, but he is now. To and to the resplendence of the order of rot, the cycle of decay and rebirth. Desperate prayer. Bye, Melania is is Millicent's mother. Yes. Yes. Um, so when Melania bloomed, that bloom burst Caled as we know it, and out of that bloom came the rot pests and apparently five babies were found there by this guy who raised them. Melania did not get pregnant and carry children, but they are her daughters nonetheless. There's also some suggestion, especially with Millicent, that what Millicent represents is a is a fragment of Melania, and all of the sisters represent a different fragment of her. And I can't believe, listen, I can't believe I never made this connection. Because who else do we know is a father to four daughters who are literally that one figure split into four parts after his death? Manus and the four dark queens. All representing a different aspect. There you are, Death Raper. Hello. I can't believe I made that connection. I love talking about Dark Souls too. Motherhood and parenthood in general in this game, more than the others even, is definitely unique. You can't think of it as like, oh yeah, you need a boy and you get pregnant and then blah blah blah. It's a little different. She bloomed and even reproduced like a flower. Exactly. But not just. The, uh, the pest priests, I always call them pest priests. I, I always forget their official name. People always tell me, you know what I'm talking about. The creepy centipede looking at that person. They are also described as unwanted children. Okay. Kindred abroad. Yep, thank you so much for the reminder. I will forget again. <laughs> I don't want to, I just do. Yo, Rob, thanks for the gifted membership. I really appreciate that. Thanks so much for the support. Manus from DS1 fragmented into the DS2 queens. Did not know that. Yes, it is outright stated in the lore that the four queens are children of Manus. And they each are sort of described as embodying a human trait. Um, now, naturally, People assume that they are evil and that everything they do is wrong and that they're dark equals evil. It's a lot more complicated than that. But Alsana, for example, represents Manus' fear. They're basically just human traits divided. Um, once again, I do be forgetting their names, like always. Nashanda represents ambition, human ambition, lust for power. Goodbye. Thank you for deceasing. Appreciate that. Thank you for the death poker. The others whose names I am forgetting represent anger and uh, loneliness. Loneliness. Um, that would be the one who never finds her king directly. Now, what's really interesting, just, I, I don't want to go over it too much, but one really interesting about the queens is that they are perceived as bad, but they are simply humanity and humanity's traits. Now, we talk about how anger can be a good thing, it can also be a bad thing. Nothing, no emotion or human response or human part of nature is good or bad, they simply are what you make of them, right? So, for example, fear is considered bad because, you know, it's... You cower and you, you know, you don't act and you should be brave. Yeah, but like when you are scared of something that can hurt you and you run away from it, you 
live. It's fear is one of the most key aspects of a living being in general. And what we see with Elsana is thanks to her king and both of them working together, she conquers her fear and is able to overcome it. She is literally the embodiment of fear and she manages to be as brave as she is, right? Because she gets a good lesson in humanity from her king. Then we have uh, Vendrick, who was a warlord and a warmonger on his own, who encountered the embodiment of lust for power and want. And guess what happened? They both went warmongering together, done, didn't they? Nadalia. Yeah, that's Nadalia. Um, the, uh, the other two... Nadalia was loneliness, who never met her king, so she, like, grabbed onto... Because he, he died before she could. Um, and he, she sort of started to possess aspects of him, literally imbuing thing like objects associated with him with her soul and dividing it into parts to always linger like a, like a spirit. Those are negative emotions, probably in the sense you want to stop feeling them, maybe? No, there's nothing inherently wrong with any of these traits to demonize ambition, fear, anger, and loneliness. Like, loneliness on its inverse. Think of it like tarot. If you invert loneliness, what do you get? A want to be with others. Like, uh, humanity's socialness and our, our ability to work together is why we are the way that we are. It's a key aspect of humanity. In before, I'm an introvert, actually. I get it, yeah. But even an introvert still wants to hang out with others, right? You still want to associate with people. You still want to bond with people. You still want to work together to achieve goals, to build communities, to create wonderful things. That is a key part of humanity. And when you aren't able to have that, you have loneliness. This, this aching, awful, sad pain. And that's what Nadalia was struck with. But if she had encountered her king, there's a chance that they actually could have had a great bond relationship, just like any others, right? So anger is a little interesting too. If you are angry about, let's, let's give an example about an injustice. And you do something about it, you take that anger, you channel it, and you build it towards something productive. Have you ever been really angry so you've done something? Like, I remember one time, this is not a good example, but it comes to my mind. I remember these guys were laughing because I was bad at COD Zombies, but because I hadn't played COD Zombies in a long time and the new game had different timings. And I was so pissed because of course they were being such little pricks about it. So you know what I did? I played hours of COD Zombies. I hated it too. It was miserable, but I played hours of it and I got really, really, really good at it. And then when I played with them again, they kept dying and I'd be like, Oh, don't worry. I'll res you. I got you. He he he. And I never died a single fucking time because I took that anger and I turned it into fuck you. Spiteful excellence. Exactly. Anyway, my point is anger is not inherently bad either. It's how you use it. Right? Now you could be like, I could have just yelled at them. I could have just been like, fuck you guys suck. Fuck, screw you. Like some kind of invalid. Not an invalid. Sorry. It, um... I try to use the word for unga bunga and instead I said invalid. That's not the right word. <laughs> like a dingus. I could have just yelled and been angry. I wouldn't have gotten anywhere. I wouldn't have had those people to play with. I wouldn't have completed what we completed when we worked together, even though they're pricks. I channel my anger to something productive. If you don't, anger can be destructive, violent. You can, dis you can destroy objects, break things. It's not good, but it's, neither is it bad. Anger can be healthy, yes. If things happen and you get angry and you channel it into something good, that's my whole point. So, anyway, I managed to get on a side note talking about DS2 lore, but all this is to hopefully intrigue you. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm hoping that you stick around for the lore -a when we get to the other games. Right, Marlo? Follow for lore? Poggers. I don't know why you're capping. We do be loring, though. <laughs> all right, uh, hang on. I'm trying to find the death's poker. There it is, it was right there. Barbed rod carried by death birds. The birds are graveyard fire keepers. It is said they rake out the ashen remains of the dead from their kilns. Spirit ashes. So, I won't be able to use it. That's the wrong button, apologies. Int, I simply lack the int. I'm not smart enough. Where do you get uh, the int talisman? The stargate? So Ronnie's body! We'll be able to get that. We just don't have it right now. It looks sort of like a cane.
There's a troll up there throwing pots at me. Don't worry about it. Appearance-wise, honestly, not too much to, to look at. It looks like it's covered like in ash, kind of like, well, a poker would be. Too stupid to use the hooked stick? I can use the hooked stick! I just can't use its special effect. No, I can't use the hooked stick. It's real. Lilith is called the mother of mankind, also the goddess of darkness. It's very meaningful. Yeah, I really wonder if that was an influence at all. I, I don't know how much Christianity influenced Dark Souls. There's definitely some stuff, like the idea of a snake as a betrayer, but... I mean, the snake is a, is a bad guy. It's not exactly exclusive to Christianity either, so... Marika Scarseal? Oh, right! Marika Scarseal plus the... Ugh. I could just use that. And I'm smart enough. Don't look at me, chat. Don't look, okay? I gotta use follow-up, sorry. No, it's this and then this. Ooh, cool. That's really neat. You know I've never used this ever. enough to actually play the Kratos cosplay. Um, excuse me, I am not cosplaying as Kratos. Kratos fucking wishes. Okay. Mythology crucifixion is an act of sacrifice? Yeah, she's a martyr. The the crucifixion is there. I just really wonder, like, we have to remember, yes, yes, uh, there's a lot of uh, Tolkien-like references. Martin worked on this as well, influenced by Tolkien. Western stories, Christianity. Tolkien and Christianity cannot be, like, separated. He literally wrote, like, I forget the term for it, but his his work is is heavily inspired by his faith. It's it's inextricable from his faith. Um, so that influence is there for sure. Um, but Miyazaki and the Japanese dev team, I know that Christianity does exist in Japan, but it's not as prevalent. And they definitely are drawing from other influences than we would think, right? Like stuff more like Buddhism, Hinduism, Shintoism, things like that, and lots of other cultural things that aren't directly tied to religion, but culture and, and religion are very intertwined, you know. Hi, cat. I'm so sorry. My cat is being disruptive. Give me one minute <laughs> to see what he would like, okay? Give me one sec, everybody.
I petted the cat. Hopefully the beast has been temporarily appeased. Martin wrote us more leaning toward the Occidental Mist, though. The thing is, Martin did not write the game. Bluetooth mode. Sorry. Martin did not write the game. He wrote... Well, we can tell a very, very small amount of the background that was used to create a game upon. Um, so we really don't know what that was. And uh, honestly, let's be real, based on his track record for actually getting words to paper, I really think it was pro probably fairly short in the actual amount of content department. I'm trying to say this very diplomatically because I'm not trying to disparage him. It's just this game was created by FromSoft. He wrote the basis, but we don't know what that is. And I'm definitely leaning toward it being rather small. Different reports have come out that it was largely like a short story that he wrote that likely influenced the events. Probably stuff like the Night of the Black Knives, the really, really early stuff. Characters like Marika and Radigan for sure. Those are likely related to him. But what he created, um, and also, um, someone way, this is when the game released, asked Miyazaki in an interview, um, sort of how much did he work on? And basically Miyazaki said, well, um, we used him for the, he had, he wrote the basis and the background and then also said something, I'm paraphrasing, something along the lines of, I think Martin would be very surprised to see what we did. In other words, if you'd be surprised, it was, it's likely changed quite a bit. They fit it to fit what they wanted to create. They changed it to make it fit. So, once again, you know, um, Martin short stories are so good. I'm sure it's just, you know, a short story. I love short stories. They're my favorite work, personally. I love short stories. But a single short story that maybe sort of oversees, let's, for example, The Night of the Black Knives and an event like that um, is not enough to create a, a whole game, right? Wrote some of the history. Mm -hmm. So probably imagine, you know, the events that we discussed, like, the Shattering, uh, the Night of the Black Knives, these really, in, in the game, ancient, historical, very distant events. That might be what he was involved with. But um, honestly, he called this game The Elden Ring and said it was a sequel to Dark Souls. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> like, he, he knows what he's talking about. But if he played this game, I don't think he'd be, I don't think he, he would he'd be like, well, I guess they kept all the G, R, and M names. But other than that, I don't recognize anything. <laughs> This is such a cool skill. So you create a flame, you conjure a flame, you poke it with the poker, and then the flame that is conjured, you can create an explosion or a forward attack. It's really interesting. I didn't realize it's like that. It's almost like Moonveil. It's got like split movesets if you do R1 or R2 follow-up. So some of that origin stuff, like, I wouldn't even be surprised if the Newman thing is his idea, but we don't know. It's not like Miyazaki can't read Lord of the Rings either, you know? But yeah, Berserk is a big influence of Miyazaki's, but, you know, Berserk is also created by, by a Japanese uh, mangaka, so... I think we're largely done with what I was doing in Caleb. I just wanted to get that dialogue from Gowrie. Shaded Castle, mostly done. Got the important stuff. Oh, oh my god. We didn't fight Malay Marai. Last one's blade, in terms of badass weapon arts, it absolutely melt bosses. I have to take this stupid hat off, I apologize. Wait, is that the patron? Huh. When did I get this? The unassuming sack-like appearance befits their unseen and unknown stature. Sorry, I must have missed that I got that drop. This swamp is so dense, stagnant, like... Ugh. And what's funny is it's only where the castle is. 
I wonder if the poison swamp and its disgusting appearance could be related to sort of what happened here. Um, it's a poisonous place because this is a place of death. Or did they build it here because it's already a poisonous place? What's the lore of the Shaded Castle? Uh, so Malay Marai, he's of the Marai family. They were the Castellans and rulers of this place, and their job was, uh, they were a family of executioners. They were sort of, their job was to kill criminals. But presumably, when the Rune of Death thing sort of happened, they weren't able to do this anymore, and we can... We can guess based on that, that instead of killing criminals, their job was simply to keep them. But Malay Marai, the last ruler, the last Castellan, I believe is the term that's used. He's actually here somewhere. Let's try to find this, this dingus. I think he invades you, but it doesn't have invasion tech. So I'm gonna keep an eye out for him. There he is. I might've run past him. I didn't see. So this, this is Malay Marai right here. Malay Marai, Shade of Ca It is Castellan! Yay! I remembered right. So he's the Castellan. The mask is his ceremonial mask. Also, in my first playthrough, I theorized, and I actually am going back to this, I'm like, I wonder if there's something to it. The mask is similar to the Zamor mask. I'm not saying it's the same. And there are other metal masks. D has one, right? Like, they're not... They don't exactly have the only masks in the game or anything. But I will point out that it's interesting that this mask looks very similar to the Zamora, even the aspect that it has hair. But the hair has been braided. Okay, you're still here, huh? Now, the Zamor sided against the giants. They hated the giants. They fought on the side of the Golden Order. And I wonder if maybe their reward for siding with the Golden Order may have been some of them were able to like take on a take on a role, take on this role, and they eventually became the Mirai. Not certain, I'm not willing to like assume that. But there is precedent for, hey, you help the royal family, you get a title. In fact, that's a lot that's where a lot of nobility came from historically, is literally like you helped us out, you get a title now. Now, this current one, though, he's the last in the line. He became obsessed with Melania. It was a one-sided affection. Melania, I'm guessing, does not really appreciate... There might be some direct lore about this, but she doesn't appreciate those who worship her because of her rot and, and associate with that because the rot literally tortured her for her entire life. So let us cleanse this non-believer. Goodbye. Thank you for the Ansper Rapier and the Mirai Mask and Robe. It's more of a culture I'd like to see or hear more about. Highly doubt they'll be in the DLC at all, though. We never know, but we kind of have already been to their realm, right? So it's kind of hard to say. <laughs> Rikard have a similar mask among the paintings. Yes, that's another figure, actually. The figure that we, we think might be Rikard. It's definitely possible it's Rikard. Is indeed um, wearing a metal mask. So I'm not saying, and of course, uh, our girl, um, Tanith also has a metal mask. So I'm not saying that they're the only ones, but what's interesting about the Marai is they are a noble family within the lands between versus Tanith came from somewhere else. And Rikard, while he wasn't always this blasphemer, he did sort of fall in with a bad crowd, so to speak. Right? So I wonder if the mask is something he took from his culture or something he took from another. Sort of vaguely exactly what he did with everything else, with the whole snake thing, squatting in Mount Gelmir, presumably, things like that, right? So it's interesting. Okay, let's take a look at this mask. Mask in the image of a white-haired young noble, customarily worn by the head of House Mirai, increases arcane. Arcane, yet again. Interesting. So that's associated with bleed. The hair is actually really similar to Godfrey's, too. Also, that symbol in the center, the braids that attach to this brooch in the center. It's interesting. The Mirai family has a dual history spanning generations, serving as both executioners and castellans of the Shaded Castle. This mask bears the likeness of the first of their line. Ah, oh, right.
right, I forgot about that detail. Hmm. I'm just saying, we don't know a lot about the Shaded Castle yet. It sort of just exists outside of everything else, but there's a possibility also that um, we learn more about at least their origin in the DLC, considering it's the Shadow of the Erd Tree and they're the Shaded Castle, the Castellans of the Shaded Castle. So... All right, in the DLC, we're looking for somebody who looks like this, okay? Look out for this face right here. <laughs> Interesting symbol on the chest. Also, on the head, it could be an eye. I don't know if I want to jump to a conclusion it's an eye. It could just as easily be representing a like jeweled headdress with the, with the central jewel. Um... But it do be looking a little eye-like when it's all in silver. Like the lady that is sleeping in the field in the trailer. The lady sleeping in the field, the hair is, well, we can't really tell. She's kind of face down. But the mask that she's wearing is a pure white porcelain mask, when we can see, versus a metal mask. The white hair is interesting. Hello. <laughs> okay, and then of course we got his garb. So the Mirai robe, it's it's a different robe. We will get it later in the game. I'm forgetting the name. If someone in chat wants to say for sure, we'll get it later though. Um, robe with a black mantle across the shoulders. The mantle is different. That seems to be the signifier, customarily worn by the head of House, House Mirai. The black with the gold is the main difference. The, the, un, the robe underneath, we've seen it before. Um, the sons of House Mirai are all born, are, are, are all sickly born. Little wonder that Malay Mirai would be so beguiled by the beautiful and fierce goddess who was born into rot. So he's like, he literally, no joke, was like, she just like me for real. And she's like, who are you? Let's take a look at it though. Really? Is that a son? I will say, it looks... Listen, I'm just gonna put this out there. That, that's kind of what I would draw if I were drawing a like a son as a kid and then the gold tassels with the black I feel like I've seen this exact image somewhere else but I can't place it I don't remember What's the story with the snake we see eating him in the intro? Is that the great serpent that we hear about? Did it give him his ideas and ambitions of blasphemy? We really don't know. Um, I'm leaning toward now with the introduction of Mesmer that he got uh, the inspiration to allow himself to be consumed so that he could take over the, um, the serpent. But the serpent that we see him being a part of is that same serpent that we saw eating him in the opening cutscene. Now, did the serpent get bigger because it ate him? Possible. Is the opening cutscene sort of supposed to be like an artistic depiction and not literally what happened? Also possible. We can definitely get lore from the opening cutscene, but we have to be a little a little careful because sometimes what we see in the game doesn't match what we see there. So for example, there's an image of what looks like Morgoth taking out, like defeating Radon, but the helmet looks different. So is it really Radon? Is it one of his soldiers? Also, if that's Radon, he's way smaller, right? So we, ha we have to... Look at it with a bit of skepticism, I guess. Either way, when we see Riker, that's the same serpent that ate him in the first place. Looks like the gold mask, kind of. It's not a gold mask, but it does. It does look a bit like his son. But there's something that he wears. I've seen that symbol somewhere, but it's driving me crazy because I don't remember where. I remember finding it recently during this Lorathon, being like, wait, it looks like a sun in the center. Interesting. Polar star and rivets of gold. No. Crest of Stormvale. No. I don't even remember what I saw it on. Was it a chess piece? Was it like a shield? Was it a talisman? No. I don't remember. Oh well. What can you do? Shibri with the smirk, bro. 
Hey, Cosmicon. We are actually going to check out Gold Mask now. That's next on the list, so let's go do that. Ancient that snake is, it could have ate warriors for a thousand years. Mm-hmm. Also, snakes will grow larger every time they shed their skin. That's how they grow larger. And if we're talking about a god-devouring and presumably immortal serpent, there is no limit to how large it can get. Morgoth defended capital from Radon's army, where Radon went back to Caelid. Yes. Um, no one was able to take Landell. Others tried. Radon did. Godefroy tried. Both failed. I think there was only two defenses of Landell, but I get fuzzy. I, I know one of them was Godefroy that concluded. Then again, some of them might have worked together. I really don't recall. This place is so pretty, but so cursed. Worm faces all seem to be crying. Isn't there supposed to be a bonfire somewhere here? Oh yeah, I remember. Strongest demi cut my ass. Yeah, it's it's definitely interesting that he was soundly defeated by uh, our boy. Gold mask mask, gold mask's mask is definitely similar to the symbol on House Mirai. Or oh, we're still wearing it. What I will say is this looks as if all of the circle parts are evenly, are straight and even, versus this they're not. Then again, they could be broken. I don't know if I want to conclude that they're the same garb though. Really athletic torrent jump? It sure was. Also, I'm sorry to do this. I'm not trying to objectify you, but we're trying to parse what's going on with your garb. Um, so I'm not joking. He would be literally naked. Um, other people made those bracelets and the freaking cod piece for him and the shoes. Someone else dressed him. Could it be a sunflower? I personally always saw it as a sunflower because he is basically a sunflower for the earth tree and we have tarnished sunflowers and golden sunflowers that are facing the earth trees if it were a sun but it could also be a sun itself it's really hard to say exactly what he, what it is but yeah other people dressed him it does look like a face but i'm not i'm not actually sure hang on um I don't know. I really can't tell if that's supposed to be a face, like a really narrow face with a nose and like weird, like, or it's just pareidolia. Anyway, we're going to stop looking at his wiener. Hello. He an icon, dude. Does he react when hit? That is an excellent question. I'm a little worried about this. <laughs> Never done that. Uh-oh. Corrin's gonna be pissed about this one, dog. <laughs> Hey, Corrin, I found Gold Mask. Really? Where is he? Well, I don't know. I, like, kind of punched him and he vanished. You what? <laughs> yeah, don't worry. I, I have a I have a thingy for sins for exactly this exact reason. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, we're safe. Good. Well, I was very curious about what would occur. Whee! Uh, no! We're good. I really wonder, does, does that count as being a sinner? He do be kind of a spirit though, eh? Goes back after resting? Aww, I thought I need to say sorry. Good to know he doesn't care. Okay, I know I can make that. Maybe I can't. Nope, 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 nope. 
There's an item over here. I'm trying to grab it. Maybe I just jump from here? Huh. Oh, there it is. Sorry, it debated me. I was like, it's not here. Yeah, so what's really interesting about Gold Mask is that you can get his mask right away. A mask designed to resemble a blazing golden halo, created and left behind by Lord Gold Mask, a staunch pursuer of Golden Order fundamentalism, strengthens Golden Order incantations. Its striking design represents both the brilliant inspiration that once shone upon him and the vision of a ring that he will surely find at the end of his pursuit. To you who seek to shine as I do, wear it well. Actually kind of cute. Why did I do this? Listen, I... There was, there was an incident. He's got an extra, dude. What's really interesting is his other garb was not made, was made for him by others, but that one doesn't say that. That's the only part of his wear that he seems to choose for himself. Anyway, probably should have waited until I got the bonfire near the area, but whatever. What is it? Rot oh, sorry, I totally forgot to read the Rot Raper. Yeah. Um, so this is the weapon used by the Castellan of House Marai, the Ants for Rapier. It's made out of the um, pincer, the poker, the spur of a giant ant. What's interesting, though, is none of the giant ants actually do scarlet rot, but, you know, who cares, I guess. Spur of a giant ant which has been fashioned into a rapier. The blade drips with scarlet rot. Scarlet rot is an old legend of which Malay Marai of the Shaded Castle was a private believer, and indeed, he eventually found his own personal goddess. So he believed in the Scarlet Rot, and then when he f discovered Melania, he worshipped her because she represented the Goddess of Rot. But that's literally the parts of herself that she hated. A little funny. In this game, saying I'm sorry means cleansing yourself of your sins with Celestial Dew. Mm -hmm. And giving everyone amnesia in the process. Where does Celestial Dew even come from? Nokron and Noxtella, the Eternal Cities. Only item in a set that amplifies light spells, so it makes sense that he made it himself. Yeah, it's it's interesting. It seems to be the only part that he potentially made himself. And the fact that he leaves another for others, it suggests, yeah, he made it himself. Mm, is this the Dominion Lowen Milvilleja has a way shrine? No. Okay, I'll play with you guys in a bit, okay? You're real you're real sweet, thank you. The earth when you gaze at the earth tree, the earth tree gazes back. Exactly, it's true. I see a lot of really important things in this game were made in the Eternal Cities. Potentially Albinarix. Although that might be a split discovery. What's in here? Get a little distracted from Gold Mask, but one sec. This is a robbery. Great stars. The second great stars. Nope, that's not what I meant. This one, thank you. Goodbye. All right. Um, here we go. Hello. Are we, are we cool? You know, it's interesting. He's like the finger readers. If you punch them, they vanish and they don't seem to be affected. Sorry, I'm moving my mouse there. They just come back. 
The difference is he doesn't talk, so he doesn't say anything to you. But what's really interesting is Corin is not a finger reader, but he can read the fingers. He understands the language of the two fingers, which is presumably what Goldmask is speaking. Someone said that he he mumbles. The thing is, here I don't think we're gonna be able to tell because I think that's the uh, the worm dingus is below. That's the worm faces. Okay, we'll try maybe at his other location in the in the woods because I don't think there's any enemies in there. But I I never notice him making sound. It's possible I didn't pay attention. But yeah, that's the worm faces in this case. Wear his mask and pose with him? Nah. We also don't have a pose for him anyway. Creation of Albanarix was an attempt to make an artificial lord. Yeah, that's that would be um I think it was one of the Silver Tears descriptions. Yes, they try to make an artificial lord. They try to make artificial dragons, the dragonkin soldiers. They likely invented the Albanarix, but I wonder if the Albanarix weren't a creation of perhaps the astrologers, which then became the Nox and then became the Carian. So there's like a split evo there. Because we see Albanarix in the Carian Manor and in Liurnia. Um of course in Galmir, but in terms of creating them, it seems like Liurnia is a more likely, or like Caria is a more likely culprit there. Everyone needed their parts, though. Okay, well, either way, um, all we have to do with him is tell Corin where he is. Didn't play Dragon's Dogma? I mean, it just came out. I got plenty of time to play it. I haven't had a chance. The game literally came out today. Trust me, if I'm not playing a game day one, it doesn't mean I didn't like it. In fact, I'm assuming I'm really going to like it, which is why I want to devote a bit of time to it. <laughs> we will get to it. The plan is hopefully next week. Came out three minutes ago in my time zone. Oh, right! This is a great place! The East Windmill Pasture. So the burnt corpses rise, because as we know, there is no death in this place. The navy hood and the full noble set in the noble's traveling garb. Melted mushroom. Those are from Nokron. That's really interesting. Sorry, their laughing is probably going to drive you insane, but we got a vibe. Everyone's going to be on day one. Think about... Sorry, it's actually driving me insane before anyone else. Um, I don't always play games on release. Like, I'll play, I'm gonna play Elden Ring. I played Elden Ring on release. I played, uh, oh, it's the Halo Tree. Huh. I forgot. You can actually see the Halo Tree from Shaded Castle as well, but this is the Halo Tree right here. And this really puts it into perspective just how short it is. It's huge. But that's the Erd Tree. And that's the Halo Tree. That's the Erd Tree, and that's the Halo Tree. <laughs> no, but like, I play games on release, but I'm not gonna play every game on release because I'm playing other things, you know? I didn't even finish the first one. I want to. <laughs> I didn't get around to it though, we're gonna. Never knew you could see the Halo Tree? There's a couple locations you can see it from, yeah, from Altus. In fact, right there, you can see the Wandering Mausoleum, where, which is right next to Castle Soul. Pretty neat, huh? I'm not gonna lie, I actually don't remember if I've ever noticed that Wandering Mausoleum is visible. But yeah, right there, that's, a, that's around where you fight the Death Bird, the Death Right Bird, over here, the Wandering Mausoleum, and then Castle Soul right next to it. 
Some on Twitch aren't playing DD2 on day one. It gives someone gives me someone to watch. What not watching DD2 on Twitch after I play? Yeah, like I will play games day one, but not every game. It, it it isn't a personal thing if I don't play a game day one. It's just you know I I'm always I'm always doing something else, so you know. But no, I I do intend to play. I was very excited about DD1, and I would li really like to see. Okay, um, so we got a lot of garb and outfits and weapons there, so let me try to find all of them. There was a twin knight swords, which is a twin blade. Not a twin blade, uh, a twin blade. I don't know what I was looking for in my brain. An attractive twin blade of fine make that prizes the chivalric way can be wielded with a single hand, but its true strength is unlocked with dual handed spinning attacks. Then we got the navy hood. Now, actually, we did want to look at this. I just remembered. So, the iconography upon the navy hood is different. Still, still the exact same brooch. Trim's different, basically. A hooded cloak of deep navy, navy worn by expatriated royalty increases mind. Such cloaks were gifted to those who departed on missions to faraway lands from which they would never return. But what choice did they have having seen the guidance of grace? So gift of the cloak made it easier for undesirables to be on their way. So some read this one, Crimson Hood, from Roderica specifically, that she never saw Grace, but she was forced out despite not being a tarnished, right? That's how people read it. That as someone who wasn't a tarnished, she was simply undesirable, and they gave her this cloak to send her on her way. It's possible. I still believe she was a tarnished, but... The reason that I think she was a tarnish was because she ends up at the Round Table Hold, and no one is apparently able to enter the Round Table Hold except for Tarnished. So, being a tarnish appears to be something that happens to you, whether you choose it or not, no matter what your upbringing is, no matter what your history is, it's just something that occurs. Um, however, it is usually marked by seeing grace and we can see this in the opening cutscene so i wonder is roderica the exception or is there something else going on with her because um she has the same hue of eyes as a very important spirit tuner that hugh knew we don't know who that is it's a female spirit tuner that's all we know um but apparently she has the same eyes is it something to do with that maybe she's associated with someone else i personally believe the spirit tuner he's discussing to be marica the fact that Roderica has the same IKA ending, interesting. Perhaps she's like a spiritual successor to Marika. The thing is, Marika has so many kids, has an entire family line. Is it possible some of those tarnished, this, like she's directly descended? Like a great, 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 great grandchild? Possible, but I don't know. I, I never, I don't really associate her being as being directly related but clearly she's able to enter the round table hold. No one enters the round table hold unless they are tarnished. Maybe like, what about Hugh? What about Enya? What about the two fingers? Yeah, they were already there. But the two fingers is a bit sussy in the first place. Enya, I think there's more to her than it appears. And the finger readers in general tend to be a little odd and spectral anyway. And Hugh, I believe, is the reason it exists in the world in general. And therefore he's like the... He's like the seed that created the round table hold that we were able to enter. As a result, of course he's there, but no one else who enters is not tarnished. So I'm really wondering um, if this is not supposed to be read as she never saw Grace because she wasn't tarnished, then that's odd because she'd be the only one. Thought all tarnished were once warriors in service to Godfrey when he was cast out of Lands Between. Or based on characters like Boggart, Roderica, etc., descended from them. What about the twin husks? They're husks. They literally don't even speak to you. I'm talking about figures that we can actually engage with and speak to and therefore seem to have some semblance of life. We can interact with um, 
any uh, when she's dead. The two fingers aren't doing anything when they're gone. And the twin husks are apparently never quite alive. So the only one that needs to be alive for us to get something from them is Hugh. The others might as well just be illusory. Now, since we can't attack in the round table hold, we can't start testing to see who's illusory or not, right? So it's that's they kind of do that perhaps on purpose. So I definitely believe Hugh is the, uh, as I like to call it, the host of the dream, the same way that Garmin is in the Hunter's Dream. In fact, I love making that analogy. It's very much like Bloodborne. Because we need him to actually smith in order to achieve something. Enya, we can interact with her and get the remembrance items even when she's gone, when she's not there. So clearly, the only important one there that isn't a tarnish is Hugh. Either way, there's something special about Roderica. Whether you believe she's a tarnished or not, she is special. Now, the rest of it is also her set. Uh, a gift of such rare beauty, a royal wooden disgrace. Their illustrious... Oh my god. A gift of such rare beauty, a royal wooden disgrace, their illustrious heritage, even if found dead in a ditch in the middle of nowhere while wearing such splendid raiment. I really wish they kept the die in a ditch somewhere line from Vare be a lot more significant. So basically they made them really nice traveling attire and then sent them on their way because tarnished are utterly undesirable and it's a requirement to kick them entirely out of their location where they live no matter where they are, no matter what rank they are, no matter if they're royalty. If you are a tarnished, you're freaking donezo, kiddo. Oh, I'm so sorry. Someone asked me what blades these are. These are the magma blades. They are far from the serpents in Mount Galamir, or like me, you can get someone to drop them for you. Isolated Divine Tower. I haven't been there yet, but don't we? We get there from Altus. Wonderful. I totally forgot right here. Perfect. Thanks so much for the suggestion. Totally forgot, Voltman. Thank you. Thank you. But yeah, no. So the what we learned from characters like Roderica, Boggart, uh, the Traveling Nobles, there are some Tarnished who appear, like Godfrey, we literally encounter THE Godfrey, the first Tarnished. So clearly the Tarnished could be figures that literally fought in the war with Godfrey. But a lot of the Tarnished also appear to be descendant from, descended from the original Tarnished. And they awaken to it, and they sort of get this destiny they didn't necessarily choose. <laughs> Professor Raff, thank you. <laughs> Fia bypassed the peace pact by handling, handing D a death blighted dagger. Mm hmm. Only through us. And what's really interesting is. Uh... Oh, isn't this in dirt? I remember this being in dirt for some reason. Oh, God. I don't remember where this one goes. I don't, I don't really think I have a good s skill to catch this. When you roll into people with briar armor? That's a good question. Is it is it coming back? It the beetle? The be is the beetle coming? Oh, here it comes! Okay, okay. Okay. Okay, okay. And start spinning. Gaming. Prayerful strike. That's what it is. Eh! I'm under attack. Help. Help. Prayerful strike. Raise arm into loft in prayer, then slam it into the ground. This inspired blow restores HP to the self and nearby allies if it successfully hits. Cool. Three fingers and two fingers, part of the same hand. It's possible, but um, in terms of how they actually like attach, they don't seem to come from the same hand, but conceptually they might. It's hard to say, but generally, there is a possibility that they 
are, but also that they aren't. Nomadic armor? By letting the guys destroy the tents in the sealed section under Landell. I totally forgot that's where you get the nomadic armor. Yeah. Time is so weird in Elden Ring, it's hard to tell if something happened last year a thousand years ago. Yup, it sure is. All right, so this, the sealed tunnel, leads to a few interesting things. Number one, a bell bearing. I went the wrong way. <laughs> Whoopsie. Every time, this happens to me every time. I turn, I get turned around. I really do. Now, what's interesting about the sealed tunnel, it is literally an illusory wall. There is no stone sword key. They're not, it's not sealed. It's just sort of... There's a wall here. No, there isn't. And then behind this, here we go. One time in an invasion, I waited behind this wall, um, and then they they popped open the illustry wall, and then there was me. And I basically did that, and then I killed them. And it was one of my favorite invasions of all time. I don't really speak about that fake five finger ending. Yeah, I mean, it, it was it was definitely a thing. Like it was designed to be tricky. Um, in fact, just the other day, someone uh, someone mentioned that, and I was like, I'm pretty sure you're talking about the fake ending. <laughs> so, I mean, it was meant to fool people, you know? So I don't blame people for being fooled. I mean, do you remember way back when, before DLC was announced, there was that leaked image about how the DLC for Elden Ring is going to be Barbarians of the Badlands? For, I'm not joking, months I had people referencing that. I'd be like, oh, I actually saw the DLC is coming, Barbarians of the Badlands. And I was like, no, that was fake. That was fake. You know, like, maybe not months, but it felt like months. It was a weeks at least. You know what I mean? Like, oh my god. I don't blame people, because the thing is, you see something and you just assume, oh, cool, real. And then, you know, you don't play Elden Ring 24-7 like my ass does. <laughs> You don't have social media, you don't live on social media, you don't, like, exist as part of this sphere 24. Ooh, seven. Ah, uh, you know what I said about how this place isn't stone sword keyed or anything? But these guys... ...are present. That's pretty interesting. This gets you to Divine Tower of West Altus. Is the one in the middle of the water with Melina's graveyard? Dang it, that's Divine Bridge! I went to the wrong one. Either way, we still need to come here, so this is good to get. But no, we'll, we'll get to the one on the Divine Bridge. <laughs> What's this game about? Oh man, how much time you got? Hey, Tivo. Yeah, I don't blame people for being fooled by- Oh, I freaking done slipped. There was some moss on that tree, you know, really slippery, etc. You know, I've never done that, actually. I've never slipped. Feel like a whirlpool of events that all happen right next to each other? I feel like that's the vibe you're definitely supposed to get. Now you mention it, yeah. Oh dear. Excuse me. Ow. Dude, they look at you, and when you get close, they freaking explode. They're so silly. Wow, okay. They just shy? That's how I feel when someone comes close to me, it's true. Introvert. That's how you know they're introverts, bro. For real. Premature explosion? You took it in a very different direction than I did, huh? <laughs> I mean, they seem to time it pretty well. I don't know. Me win social anxiety? Real. Relatable content. Where? What? What? Nani? What? Rockworms? Oh, they're so great. They're so silly. Such silly little guys. Wee. Oh 
Thanks for the rune fragments. When you get the chest piece sadness, to be fair, the chest piece is the best part. But I feel that. Oh, what the? What? Wait. Oh, I forgot. Wow, this place is neat, isn't it? Hello. Onyx Lord, what's like what's going on? Can you use some of your stuff? You gold mask looking mf -er. Um, did you see his sword get real straight when he plunged it into the ground? I never noticed that. It's straight he straightens it out with gravity magic and then puts it back. Do it again. There it is, look. No, so show me the sword. I could have sworn it went straight. Maybe it was just a deceptive camera angle. Go, oh my god. I think it was just the camera angle? You tricked me, you freaking guy! Oh, well, that's the other spell you're supposed to use the first one. Wait, let's- I have to let that hit me, one second. What does that do? Does that does that shove or does that pull in? I'm trying to see the difference between Onyx and Alabaster. It pushes away, so Onyx equals push away, Alabaster equals pull in. And Alabaster is the one that taught Radon. walks toward you, though? I would say that's similar to Radigan, for sure. That's a shove-out, too. Sword also pushes when the player uses it. Yeah, so we were talking about the distinction between Onyx and Alabaster, and they seem to specialize in different forms of gravity magic, and the Alabaster Lord is the one that taught our boy, Radon. And if only I can get those meteors, they're really effective. Onyx Lord's Greatsword. I think it might be Int. Let's see if I can use it though. I passed it, sorry. <laughs> uh, I must pass it again. Greatsword. Greatswords are with the Greatswords, probably. There we go. Need strength and Int. I can do the Burke King again. There we go. Very bright in here, like too bright. I'm trying to see what's on the. Nothing too noticeable. Like the the handle's kind of interesting, but I can't quite parse what's going on with that. Greatsword forged from golden-hued meteoric ore. The blade conceals gravity-manipulating magic. A weapon unique to the Onyx Lords, a race of ancients with skin of stone who were said to have risen to life when a meteor struck long ago. Onyx Lords Repulsion thrust the armament into the ground to create a gravity well, in addition to dealing damage this attack sends enemies flying away. Interesting. So that's the Onyx Lords. Use a push version of it unless it locks, knocks people off stuff. It definitely would knock people off stuff. Yep. 
Mint Radigan, same body cosmetics as well. Yeah, he looks similar. I actually never noticed how much these guys look like Radigan. Really interesting. So yeah, that's the lore I was looking for, that they basically came to life from a meteor. They have intelligence. They appear to be the origin of gravity sorcery. Wait, what, what, what do I do here again? Wait, is this a dead end and then you do this? The statues too. I don't remember where you see these statues, though. Wait, this is a return to entrance. Wait, I'm having a moment. I'm having a bra moment. Oh, it's right here. You go through the thing. I went, it's a down. Yeah, I got turned around again. It happened again, chat. <laughs> I went the way that I came. And I was like, where is it? It's a dead end. <laughs> I'm good. I'm okay. It's fine. <laughs> Some type of superhuman from space. Yeah, and then we have Newman who also came from another world. But the thing is that they came to life on the lands between when we, um, when a meteor crashed. So they're from the lands between, question mark? Oh, look at that. Oh, we have to go there for God of Roy, for Gore. Look at that. Look at how much you can see from here. It's actually crazy. How well they did these views. Love the shirt, thanks. Critical fail on navigation check? Yeah. <laughs> right, we uh, can't enter this one because we don't have the rune. The same symbol though, yet again on this. Very interesting. Okay, so now we want to go to the divine tower, the divine bridge, and take out that golem so that we can teleport to the tower that we were trying to go to in the first place. I just got them confused. Yeah, the fact that the Onyx and Alabaster Lords also look, well, they look like elves, don't they? Traditional depictions of elves, the, the pointed ears, the, um, the height, their use of magic that isn't associated with anyone else, unique magic. They're like space elves. Um, is this like particularly loud? I feel like I turned the game up or something. I'm gonna lower the audio just a touch. I feel like I accidentally raised it. You've never been known for your sense of direction? known for my sense of direction. How dare you? I've known that my sense of direction is fucking bad. But, you know, I'm still being known for it. <laughs> Salted Caramel! Thank you so much! Wow! For the resub! Run it back for month four. Run it back, baby! Thanks so much for the four months support. Welcome back. And thank you for the prime. Yeah, one prime for month. Thank you so much for choosing to use it here. I really appreciate that. Hashtag primers. Oh, that's right. We're going to stab him right in the chesticle region, baby. Um, I also wanted to point out... I didn't think you'd die that quick. I was going to talk about how their weak point is in their chest. And yeah, they have all that fire there. But I wonder if there's supposed to be depictions of the golems. Uh, the giants, I mean. Also, Cash by Johnny Cash. Thank you so much for the prime as well. I really appreciate that. Welcome in. Enjoy your butterfly and your emotes. I have it. Okay. You have to. I think the trigger is entering Lane Dell or something, but I can't use this yet. I forgot. <laughs> but still, we cleared it, so we're ready for next time. <gasps> and the Blessed Dew Talisman. Yo, it's actually real pog. At least on the Divine Tower, remind me of Crucible imagery. Lots of animals. I definitely think that's, that's likely. Having no Dark Souls experience and on a similar difficulty? Yeah, there's no, since there's no difficulty, that's actually one thing. I know I, the difficulty discussion in this game has been 
done to death. We've talked about, I talked about it in my first playthrough. We've gone back and forth. Should it have difficulty settings, whatever. One reason I love no difficulty settings, and this is truly a community shared aspect. When you talk to somebody and you say, hey, what boss did you find really hard? People will tell you and you will be able to commiserate on your various experiences, all knowing that you played at the exact same difficulty. And there's something about that shared discussion that is really, really precious. And there's no shame in, you know, using summons or using this or using that, whatever. Like, I'm, I don't really care about that sort of nonsense. I don't care about gatekeeping, like play how you want to play and whatnot. Um, but there's that moment of like, oh my God, I, well, I first tried this boss. And then someone's like, you did? And then you get really excited about what you did good on, what you did bad on, everything. Golem comes back? I don't think this golem respawns. Uh, once I've killed it, it's always been gone. Blessed do talisman. Talisman depicting a drop of the Erd tree sap, a blessed boon, gradually restores HP. It was once thought that the blessed sap of the Erd tree would drip from its boughs forever, but that age of plenty swiftly came to a close, and with time, the Erd tree became more an object of faith. So I had faith in it returning. In in that, yeah, like in, it didn't give you anything anymore, but it still became an object of faith. Also, potential more evidence that the Ur tree that we see is indeed spectral and there's nothing left of it. Because it you can't get spirit sap from it, you know? Yeah, the golem doesn't come back. I think this bridge once extended from here to the isolated tower. Uh, wait, in which direction? Hang on. Oh, oh, this, 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 yeah. Um, honestly, probably it is like, listen, I can't see where the isolated tower is yet because I haven't gotten to it, <laughs> but probably because this is the divine uh, thingy. The divine bridge? And divine bridges usually lead to divine things, like divine towers. Comes back when the portal is active there? I don't... I don't remember going back ever. That really mean golem that you have to do a bunch of platforming to get down a cliff, and then there's a... There's a painting guy there? That guy comes back. That guy sucks. <laughs> Entire wrong direction, that's all? I mean, we gotta look. Also, I am a big proponent of the concept that before the shattering, the lands between possibly look different as well. That's why we have these massive changes in architecture because the land itself was sundered when the Erd tree was. Because the Erd tree became so intrinsically linked with the land. And not to mention, if you think about it, its roots are everywhere in the land. So a change in the Erd tree and its status could potentially warp this weird liminal land in the first place. What's the lore of that random magic golem? I never understood it. He's there to bend you over and fuck you in a bad way is what he's supposed to do. <sighs> I hate him. But yeah, the lore is probably that he fell. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, one other thing. I'd really like to mention this and it took me such a long time to realize this. It's really funny. I didn't find this till like New Game Plus. This leads to a courtyard that is linked directly with the round table hold. And we just saw these statues on the way to the West Altus Divine Tower. So this does suggest this was a path to a Divine Tower at some point. Ah, the Kirk Hammer. That's a very, very popular Bloodborne weapon. Okay, let's go tell Corin where Gold Mask is, actually. Elisa Frey, thank you so much for the raid. Welcome in. How's it going? How are you? How was your stream? Can we get a shout out for Elisa, please? Sopian Princess, thank you for the follow. Welcome in. Dark Souls 3, I was wondering. How was it? What are you up to in Dark Souls 3? Beat this game with a buckler and rapier only use encounter? That's poggers. 
Arch Thrones. Okay, do you think it's Arc Thrones or Arch Thrones? <laughs> it's alright, it has issues. That's basically what I've heard. It's still just um, a demo, right? Like, it's a solid demo, but it's still a demo, right? Looks pretty brutal. That's what I heard. I think, I know Aura played it. I know Prod, was it, oh, was it Prod? I think it was Prod. I saw Prod tweet about it, and I was like, mm. it's very unbalanced at the moment. Oof. Did you enjoy it? Did you finish? Either way, thank you so much for the raid. Welcome in, everybody. We're currently doing a Elden Ring lore -thon. I plan to play each of the modern FromSoft games, everything from Dark Souls to Bloodborne, Sekiro, all of them, before the Shadow of the Earth Tree DLC drops for Elden Ring. It's pretty ambitious. <laughs> We'll see what we get through, but that's what we're working on today. We are basically going through the game slowly, looking at everything, trying to find lore and all the details, discussing it. Um, it's very fun. It's very collaborative and very chill. So definitely stick around for that if you're interested in learning more about these games, because that's what I'm most excited about ever. It's actually pronounced Asthrones. Rathblush. <laughs> Asthrones? It's rooted to the devs. <laughs> thanks, Wolfite. Um, but yeah, thanks so much for bringing your community over. I really appreciate that. I'll take good care of them, hopefully. <laughs> Character looks great. Thank you. I took the sliders from YouTube. Um, her name is Mesmer's GF. <laughs> I gotta use more fire. What kind of Mesmer GF am I? I tell you what. Hi. Um... Take that's the wrong button. I apologize. Take this. Okay. T take this. Yeah, cook them. <laughs> they wrap. Thank you so much for the gifted sub. I really appreciate that. At least enjoy your butterfly and your emotes. Can I get some wrap snakes in the chat, please? That's why you have snakes. Yeah, baby. Corin, thank you so much. The Blasphemous Blade is what I intend to get. I just haven't gotten to Riker yet, so we're gonna we're gonna use that. <laughs> Why does Lancey Axe fight us? From item description, she seemed like a chill dragon. So a chill dragon toward the followers of the dragon um, cult. And the golden, like, they were linked with the golden order. Here, here's some interesting lore with the two fingers. Okay, mm here we go. No. 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 Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is an incantation we get from Corin, who I am very ironically standing in front of right now. Very fittingly, actually. Um, it's an incantation of the two fingers faithful. Um, and it's toward the tarnished. This is, this is, this is a message for the tarnished. Follow the path that has been set for you, and you will make enemies of all others. The monks, the sorcerers, the ancient dragon knights, and the scions of gold. Heed me, the lands between offers no welcome to the tarnished. Basically, everyone hates tarnished. That's generally the concept. Everyone hates tarnished. So you may be like, okay, but like, Lansiac seems chill. Not to you, not to the tarnished, not to what the tarnished represent. So... Yes, this is the Two Fingers incantation, and this is the message for them, but generally, the Tarnish is not well regarded. They are the only figures in the lore who do not have the Grace of Gold, which is considered a good thing in this game, and as a result, if you don't have it, you are largely despised. There's even a few figures who are like, oh, a Tarnished. Oh, well, I guess I'm really desperate, so I guess you can help me. Like Kenneth. Hello. You appear to be doing well. Very good. Well then, would you like to learn an incantation? Why does everyone hate the Tarnished? So, yeah, basically that's the big one. That's the big part. Uh, they do not have the Grace of Gold, but also, like is said, the path that they are to follow is a path that would be detrimental to others. Tell the Noble Gold Mask's whereabouts. Do, do you sport with me? No, I don't like sports. It can Just be kidding, I do. Than the gold mask himself. Of course, of course, I knew he would be close by. Yeah, I'm really glad Bless you went to search the for him. Order and its benevolent rays, and to you too. 
My sincerest thanks. Is it common for people to see grace? So the tarnished are the only ones who can see the guidance of grace. And what's really interesting is I wonder if it's because, and this is really interesting, they have been divested of, of grace and thus they can see it. Now, may the golden order shine through you. We've been over this sort of in various times, so if I'm repeating, you know, forgive me, but it's very relevant. Now, these are, I had someone drop these for me before you're like, why do you have so many runes? <laughs> We're doing a Lorathon. I don't need to get everything myself, you know, it's just, I wanted my cute fit and I wanted these. Um, these golden runes are very paltry, but as you go, as we go through them, you might notice that they have a really interesting shape. The center has this sort of little vortex of gold and then moving outward has these tendrils of gold always in a circular shape. But once we start getting here to the really high level ones, the Lord runes, the heroes, the Newman runes, it becomes even more blatant. These are eyes. They literally look like color contact lenses, don't they? So what this means is that this is the grace that exists within eyes. It is a filter. It prevents, it sort of sits in their eyes and like a contact or like a filter, it changes potentially what they see. The tarnished has no grace. As a result, the tarnished is not influenced by grace. We can choose to follow grace, these lights that guide us where we should go. We can also say, screw the grace and go wherever the heck we want. Like I always seem to and I always manage to take the side path. And that's kind of the thing that's special about the Tarnished. They are beholden to nothing and no one. They are able to make their own choices because they are not afflicted by the grace. Considering the grace comes from an other, outer worldly being, um, the greater will, as it's known, linked to the Elden Beast, though the Elden Beast is under the greater will, it's like a hierarchy. Basically, there's some sort of weird space being who is who infected everyone in this land with this grace and the only ones who are immune are the tarnished but because this is the overarching religion in the land and it's just something everyone has those without it are despised so basically it seems like the only ones in this entire land with free will are the tarnished um but yeah as as for seeing grace tarnished sometimes see grace they see it initially and it will make them oh, makes them awaken there's some implication that you don't necessarily ever need to see grace to be a tarnished but that's a little fuzzy it's open to interpretation but basically you awaken to grace you see it but it doesn't always lead you figures like roger used to see grace no longer do um figures like roderica never saw it boggart saw it for a very short time other tarnished don't see it we are very unique as well that's why Marika recalls them. They're the perfect weapon against the greater will. Not only did, yeah, absolutely. But the thing about Marika, she didn't just recall the tarnished, she created the tarnished. She divested them of their grace, sent them away, and then knew they would come back. It was part of like their, how, what she did to them. What is the grace of gold anyway? We don't know in its entirety, but we will point out that generally, the influence of something else upon you is depicted in the eyes. Now, the tarnished can have different eye phases, so we're not immune, but you have to make choices to get influenced by things. And even then, there's evidence that the tarnished, especially our main character, our main character is unique as the main character, is able to take on different influences without fully being influenced by them. So, for example, you can take on Vare's, aka Moog's blood, your eyes turn bright red, but you're not a mindless invader. You can be. Uh, you become frenzy-dyed, but you're still able to control yourself largely, even though the frenzy is within you. It's not like the game starts playing itself. Um, but yeah, frenzy lives in the eyes, grace of gold lives in the eyes, the uh, bloody fingers are evidenced by their eyes, and also, this one isn't linked to an outer god as we know, but there's the eyeballs uh, with the dragon. If you engage in dragon communion, um, your eyes go like dragons. It's a rare one to see. I personally never had it, actually. I kind of, I meant to do it this run, but I forgot. So it's too late now. We already got a different eye state. Um, no, no, I don't watch too many other videos because I have no attention span, unfortunately. So if it, if it can't be read on like Twitter, listen, I have more of an attention span, but it's just than Twitter, but it's just with Twitter, it's like so short and like quick to read. I would, I would read lore Reddit posts, but I don't want to go to Reddit because Reddit's a nightmare. 
So, I will soon leave yeah, the grapes. Entirely thanks to you. You have my sincerest gratitude. Sorry, I didn't mean to skip there. May the golden order shine through you. All right, and now we go to Gold Mask, and he'll be there. Melina sees it, but she is not tarnished. So the thing about Melina, she, she is a spirit. And the moment we get into spirits, it becomes a little, oh, I didn't get this bonfire. I'm such a goober. Let's just run over there real quick, just for ease of travel later. Um, does Melina see the guidance of grace or does she imply that we can see it? She knows where she's going. She doesn't need grace, but she does need help getting there, which is apparently what we serve as, a way to get there. But she also came from the Erd Tree, so she's also making her way back. Turn off and on eye cosmetics in the mirror in Fia's room. Yeah, the dragon eyes, though, are overwritten by others, and I don't think you can pick them if you lose them. The dragon eyes are kind of unique. Vike and Burn all see the grace. We don't know their current status, but they definitely did, especially Vike, who is the apparently the closest to have made it to Lord. Other than us. Who Melina's mom was? Honestly, I definitely lean toward Marika. Um, it's possible they're going to be like, surprise, actually, there's uh, a whole bunch of women in the... <laughs> in the uh, Erd Tree, but when it comes to women in the Erd Tree, who I also believe are associated with spirit tuning, and could therefore be the, the mother to a spirit, yeah, it's going to have to be Marika for me, dog. It's a fair assumption, but nonetheless an assumption, and it is unconfirmed, so... But Melina asks you to burn the tree, and who else would be interested in burning the tree and taking everything down and helping the Tarnished? That's the other thing, too. Who would be interested in helping the Tarnished more than anyone in this entire game? Marika, the invisible hand that guides you every single step of the way. It's her. She literally created the Tarnish. The only reason the Tarnish is able to do anything is because she set it up in the first place. The only reason we exist is because of her. The one who has the most vested interest in making sure the Tarnish can succeed is Marika, including, apparently, sending her spirit daughter out there on a mission to be kindling. Man, it gets so dark in here, it looks like vegan four kings boss fight. But why? Because she wants the order to be annihilated, because she realized that it was a huge mistake to make it in the first place. She martyrs herself in order to help undo what she did, and one of the most pivotal steps that she takes is creating the Tarnished. Now, keep in mind that her first husband, the husband she chose, was Godfrey. So she created all of the Tarnished, all of them to serve a role for sure, but clearly the one that she wanted, well, not clearly, but we can safely assume that the one she wanted to actually succeed would be Godfrey, but she has a plan for everything. We were plan B and plan B ended up winning because we defeat Godfrey. NPC called Lore Guide. I would love to be the NPC called Lore Guide. <laughs> Marika planned for our deaths in Lands of Far and our resurrection? Um, I mean, definitely. It's really cool to see further evidence of that, but we know that from literally what she said with her own words in, I believe, the various churches of Marika. I believe the dialogue from the third church of Marika consists of her saying, paraphrasing, because it's Melina's really brief dialogue, but she says, Tarnish, you shall leave the lands between. You shall fight in wars, you shall die, and then you shall come back to life and return to the lands between. So her plan all along was exactly that. She wanted the Tarnish to go, to die, and to come back. It's just something about the Tarnish allows them to return. Um, they are the dead who yet live, which is also why they're in this really interesting state. So do you see this guy right here, the statue, the roses statue? This guy, he has little white light that guides you toward different dungeons. That's his role. Only the dead can see this light. So can we, because we are dead. But also we're not. 
Now, we can see spirits. Sometimes we can summon them, stuff like that. But there's also something a little bit more with seeing spirits. So Roderica, for example, is special. She is especially good with spirits. She can see them way more than we can, etc. So there's a lot of really interesting stuff going on with the with the tarnished, their unique abilities, their status. I'm in Landell. I didn't mean to come here. I just meant to grab this bonfire. <laughs> I got distracted, but it's fine. We don't want to rest here. We don't want to rest here. Melanin will leave. Um, okay. What did I want to do? I forgot what we were doing before this. Millicent. Mm. Gold mask. Gold mask. It's that easy. Bodies dissolve and literally just appear in the chapel. We don't arrive by ship or anything. Yes, some people do arrive by ship, but generally it looks like Tarnish have different entry points into the lands between for sure. Also says what it's like to have a mother. So what's really interesting about that, she doesn't say, she doesn't ask what is it like to have a mother. She says, is this what it is to be born of a mother? Now, the reason I'm making a distinction there is because some people think that means she doesn't know who her mother is. She's like lost. She doesn't, she doesn't know her mother. And she wonders, is this what it's like to have a mom? I read that a little differently, personally, because the thing about her is that she immediately understands what Bach wants. She says he wants to be told he's beautiful. And he yearns for that, like, mother's love, so to speak. That doesn't sound to me like someone who doesn't know the feeling. That, to me, sounds like someone who has the same feeling and therefore can empathize. Do you know what I mean? So when she says, is this what it's like to be born of a mother? She's realizing that she is born of a mother and she yearns for her mother. That's her whole goal. She wants to see her mother again. We need to help her get there why she needs our help, considering she has a spirit horse when we meet her. Who knows, but we are important on the journey. So she realizes that it looks like everyone born of a mother yearns the same way she does. It's actually a really beautiful humanizing moment. I, I personally read it the opposite way. Um, but it's it's one of those really quick dialogue lines. I, I, I personally read it the way you said it first. And then later on, I was like, hang on, I'm looking at this again now. Okay, uh, gold mask. We gotta get up there. Unfortunately, Indel is a no horse zone. <laughs> you know what? It could be that easy. Personally, though, the way I interpret her is she was told to find a tarnished, and potentially because of time, potentially because of the nature of who she was, she either forgot or didn't quite understand her journey perhaps let's, let's just let's just let me create an imaginary story for you and you can see if you agree with this interpretation so melina is born in the Erd tree her mother is give, gives her a mission but clearly she doesn't fully understand her purpose and until she sees her mother again and she brings us the medallion of rolled after the morgot boss fight she's sort of full of questions and is kind of confused. But after that point, she is resolved, sure of the information, knows exactly what to do, and explains several times that this is exactly what she wants and she is making her own choice. So the way I read it is that her initial message from her mother, whoever that is, was quite simple. Something like, find a tarnished and return to me. And so she does. She finds a tarnished, a promising one, offers them an accord, gives them torrent we go on the journey we prove ourselves we get taken to the round table hold we continue with her questioning things giving us some information blah blah blah. then we get to the earth tree and she returns to her mother having accomplished the goal she was given and then she gets the big picture after the journey but the journey is very key so i'm not saying it's exactly how it went down but there's a really really notable cho change with melina and how she speaks and she's so, so, so resolved after that point. It's really interesting. She doesn't understand why she is still alive and she has those burns on her arms. I think she was kindling to burn the Erd tree before. 
And I think that's why it needs to be her, is because she is the perfect kindling, because she already was the kindling. That might be like, okay, but she's a spear, how can she burn? Yeah, and when we burn the Erd tree, which literally looks like a spirit, and might literally be, we can't be sure exactly, because we never get to touch it. You never get to touch the Erd tree, except for the one part of it that actually looks solid. Other than that, we never actually physically, so it could be a spirit all along. But yet, when it burns, Landell is covered in ash. So it's really interesting. There's a lot of really weird spirit stuff going on. Or perhaps, to burn a spirit tree, you need a spirit as kindling. I don't know. I don't know. These are all just speculations, all ideas, but there's a lot going on in this game. And this is, once again, why I get so frustrated people say this game has no story. <laughs> Sometimes I think it has too much. Hi, Corin. Um, can you translate uh, this weird nerd's um, finger winglings to me? Ah, we Wigglings, not wingling, sorry. Thanks to you, I have become acquainted with the noble gold. I would love to see how that went. And taken my place by his side, as you can see. Have no fear. I will still teach you incantations as before, though we must do so quietly, such that we not disturb the great master's cogitation. <laughs> People saying this game is no story. It doesn't happen often, but I remember when the game released, especially after it won Game of the Year and won, like, story awards or whatever. It was like, this game is, how did it lose? It has no story. Or how did it, how did God of War not win? Because God of War is a story if Elden Ring doesn't. And it's like, my brother in Christ, what are you mean on about? Discus of Light, poggers. One of the incantations of the Golden Order Fundamentalist, which my boy Corin acquires right upon meeting Goldmask produces a ring of light and fires it forward. The ring of light returns to position close to the caster before disappearing. This incantation can be cast repeatedly. A gift from the young Mikola to his father, Radigan. Sweet Mikola. May the golden order shine through you. Tox makes it sound as if her entire body has been burned completely. Yeah, and then of course, I'm not even getting into the fact that after the Frenzied Flame ending, we see Melina in another form. We see her with a different eye open, different hair color, different eye color, acting real different. So there's clearly a little bit more to Melina that we know. I'm talking about what we do know for sure. There's a lot of theorizing she's the Glomide Queen and therefore is not truly Marika's daughter, but is perhaps a spirit-tuned version of her because spirit-tuning is not just, you know, uh, leveling up a spirit. That's how it works in the game on a functional level. But we also have Torrent, a very unique ancestral spirit whose spirit is linked to a ring and we can literally ride him across the lands between. That was made by a very skilled craftsman indeed, someone very, very good at understanding the essence of life, but also a talented spirit tuner. So there's more to spirits that we know and someone who can do that is definitely capable of taking an enemy's defeated spirit, tweaking it, and turning it into a tool that can be used. I don't know. Chance Miyazaki confirms any of the Elder Ring community lore? Never. No. No, not in never. Ever, ever, ever. Developer saving Melina Files as daughter of Marika was just a prank at us? No, so the... Um, that's... Okay, I don't know a lot about the JP text, but it's not as blatant in, in JP. The In Japanese, the original, that... Uh, descriptor for Melina is a little bit more like it's a word that means like lady or something. I don't remember. It's been a little while since I looked at this. And once again, I don't speak or read Japanese, so I'm I'm I have to just listen to others who tell me this. But in English, the translation was chosen to be daughter of Marika, but it is not so blatant in JP. So I'm not saying it's a mistranslation, but it's not an accurate translation. Still on? I mean, to be fair, it's only been five five and a bit hours is, you know, pretty average for a length of mine. The stream of mine, I mean. Why does this man wear a wheel on his neck? It is a warning to stay away from him because he is a exiled prophet, so you shouldn't listen to him. And I'm not kidding. Why a wheel? <laughs> he gets to have special drip because all the rest of us just have a thingy. Hello. Um, any more... Info on the cogitation. Further study of incantations, is it? Indeed, I applaud your enthusiasm. About the noble gold mask. So keep in mind, his name used to be Brother Corin, 
but now he is scribe Corrin. He has taken on a new role and a new title, and now he literally just writes down what the boy Goldmask says. Why is he exiled? No, he witnessed the flame. And when a prophet, when, when any figure sees a prophecy of flame, they are exiled. Is he blind too? Potentially not literally blind, but just metaphorically blind. The prophets wore a, wear a blindfold to represent their faith because their faith is blind. Tell me about Gold Mask. The master is always deep in contemplation while I frantically attempt to record his wisdom, the movement of his finger. And though I am yet to comprehend even the daintiest morsel of his wisdom, I know that this, this is my life's calling. The Golden Order has bestowed me, talentless as I am, the great duty of documentarian. May the Golden Order shine through you. And that's it. Playing when we burn the tree. This is an incantation taught to us by Corin. If you start as the prophet starting class, you get the spell at the very start. In other words, you start with the spell. Incantation originating from a sinister prophecy. The flame of ruin is anathema to the Erd tree, but prophets sometimes glimpse it within the faith all the same. Sadly, when this occurs, their silver ward is banishment. As if being a tarnish weren't hard enough. Additionally, with the prophet's gear, prophet robe, this is also the starting gear. The shackles around the neck warn passerby not to lend an ear to their sermons because their sermons involved the flame of ruin, which was anathema and cannot be discussed. If you do not recant the flame of ruin, if you if you insist that you see the flame of ruin, you get um, banished. I knew it! Hang on, sorry. I <laughs> just, okay. I remember my first playthrough, I got really confused about the fire monks. Like, were they protecting the flame? Were they preventing people from accessing it? Were they worshiping it? Yeah, no, it was both. It Fire beguiles those who gaze into it. If you protect the flame, if you keep people away from it, you also become beguiled by it. That's really intriguing. Very neat. Okay. Okay, bye. Thank you. So that's done. Uh, we'll see them in Lane Dell. Let's actually. Okay. Blackguard. Okay, he's good for now. I think we are officially done Altus in terms of quest lines. So let's go fight a couple bosses. Definitely need Godifroy. Let's go this way. This is fastest. How would Goldmask have brought the perfect order without us? What was his plan even? I don't think he really had a plan. He's just thinking a lot. I don't think he could have come to the conclusion without us. That's kind of the point. Every single figure, we help them achieve their rune. It's why we acquire it from them is because we are a key part of it. All of them. Excited to go into the sewer? Yes. Don't recognize it? This is the magma blade. I need to upgrade it. Wait, can't I actually? I should be able to. Wait, somber smithing. Hang on. I might be having an anti-gamer moment. Yeah, whatever. We're okay for now. Flame of Ruin linked to whatever Elder God the Giant's Belly Face connect to. Yeah, so they worship the Fell God of the Flame. Now, we don't really know what's up with the Fell God. We don't know if it's an Outer God. Because the thing is, Marika is a God and is worshipped and has power, but is not an Outer God. She gets her power from an Outer God, as far as we can tell, right? But she is not an Outer God. So... We don't want to assume that that's an outer god, but it really does have all the traits of a very powerful figure because the worshippers of the giant's flame and the fell god literally have the fell god's face upon their, their stomach. Their heart is taken over by its eye. You know what I mean? It's a very powerful image. They became stewards of the flame. Good start. Good start. Okay. Nice. Gaming. button. I 
meant to do this. It's not really that strong, though. God, I really dislike that hitbox. I'm reserving the right to pull the Bloodhound Fang as needed. It's needed, I swear. Oh my god. Stunlock and ass spammer. That makes sense besides being copy-pasted, boss. Godfroy is potentially where God... Uh, Rick? Is it Godric? Got the inspiration to graft. Godfroy started the grafting... Uh, Godric came later. He, they may have been around the same time, but the thing is that we know at some point in time, Godric was in Lane Dell, presumably allied with Morgoth. Don't think it was a real alliance. He was just kind of faking. But he snuck out of Lane Dell at some point and stole um, the Mimic Veil. Otherwise known as Mark is Mischief, a tr great treasure of Lane Dell. He did this by dressing as a woman. In other words, he did not look like this when he left Lane Dell. Because, yeah, no one is gonna be like, oh, I didn't notice this gigantic multi arm figure. They were wearing a dress. <laughs> so, what we can get from that. Godfrey also, he attacked Landell. It was the first defense of Landell ended when a Landell knight captured Godfrey, presumably to put him here. That's the lore. Is he literally a copy of Godric? Yes. Unfortunately. Too early. Oof. Okay. Trolls and Giants were different. The game makes a distinction between them, but there's also a little bit of... There's There were trolls and giants at the same time in the mountaintops of the giants, and the trolls were badly regarded and looked down upon by the giants. But then, the, the trolls were also described as being descendants of the giants, so it appears it was like a multifaceted thing. Oh, forgot about that. Oh no. Oh my god. He's the roll catching king, I tell you. Okay, I took two drinks. I was greedy, it's whatever. Ugh. No, fuck off. Ugh. One hit. Just die, you nerd. Those are like dwarf giants. Basically, if there was a giant who was short, they hated them. Whether that was a troll or a giant, whatever. Um, but yeah, so Godric escaped from Landell, started squatting in Stormvale Castle because no one else was there because the place was rotting from the inside. Basically, started living where no one else wanted to live. And then he started grafting. So that's basically the timeline. Both Godfrey and Godric are likely distant relations of Godfrey. This one drops Godfrey's totem. They look exactly the same. In practice, he's a reskin of Godric, yeah. But there is actual lore to him. It just isn't as interesting as it could be, basically. Oh. Oh my god, no. No! Oh my god! <laughs> Am 
Why does Godric have a gray rune? He's still a demigod. But that's the thing about Godric. I know he sounds like a pathetic loser. But the thing is, that pathetic loser is still stronger than most people in the lands between. And most folks are terrified of him and Tarnish especially because he goes around hunting Tarnish and stealing their body parts to attach them to his body. Like, he's a terrifying individual. It's just, unfortunately, he's the weakest. He's not meant to be weak in the sense of, oh, he's just a pathetic, pathetic loser. You kick him once and he falls over. He's supposed to be weak in the sense of, oh, you beat Godric? Oh, good job. Good job, little Tarnish. Too bad he's literally the baby back bitch of the entire lands between. You think he did something? Anyone could defeat him. Do you know what I mean? He's not meant to be weak. He's meant to be the weakest. <laughs> still stronger than most folks we're encountering he's still a demigod and apparently no other tarnish besides vike and bernal were able to even acquire a single great room okay so this is the talisman we get a legendary talisman depicting the elden lord godfrey weighs raises charge attack power of sorceries incantations and skills Godfrey was a ferocious warrior. When he vowed to become a lord, he took the beast regent Sirosh upon his back to suppress the ceaseless lust for battle that raged within. I can't believe this man literally took a spirit lion onto his shoulder instead of going to therapy, but okay. Top is really cool, isn't it? I love it. Icon is cool looking? It is. Also interesting that it's literally basically the inverse of Radigans. Facing opposite directions and shit. Godric's Great Rune is the only good Great Rune? The, the, the thing about the Great Runes is they also change the individual that they... that wields them. From a gameplay perspective, it might be one of the best, and it sure is. But it doesn't mean that, you know, it was for him. Of the strength and faith? Yeah, pretty much. That's why. I have to level up my stats a little bit more. Maybe we'll get some faith. A dual fight would have been cool. The thing is, I know we didn't get a dual fight, but we did. Phase 1. Godfrey the first Elven Lord using his axe and fighting as a mighty warrior is Sirosh. For all intents and purposes. Bro, stop bullying me on your horse, dog. Bye. To get grafted by Godfrey? They didn't do it on purpose. They got captured. Their goal was not to be grafted, Roderigo's squad. They just got captured, like most people who make in the lands between. That's the thing. We're the main character. It's easy to just block everything out. Everyone else... Have you, have you ever died to God to God Rick on your playthrough? Have you ever lost to him? Even just once? Congratulations, you just got, ga got grafted. Not everyone is the main character. Oh shit, almost overshot it. Carmelini's rune ever. I have never used a great rune before. The only I use, well, okay, once or twice I used Godric's so I could use Law of Regression. I needed the stats. So you need to use Godric's. If you, if you don't do an in playthrough, you need to wear like this hat and you need to use Godric's rune. You need to use Marika's sorcery, like all these things in order to get enough so you could progress uh, Gold Mask's quest line via Law of Regression. Um, that's the only time I've ever used one. I don't use them ever. <laughs> ever. I don't like great runes. I don't like rune arcs. I don't like that bullshit. Thought she wanted to join them though? She, she wants to join them in the sense of I'm the only one who lived because I'm so craven and cowardly so I'm gonna go join them. It's not I want to join them because I'm happy to die. It's oh I don't deserve to live because I'm a coward so I'm gonna go die. Survivor's guilt. Yeah, exactly. Elden is really overrated aside from the bosses. Overrated in terms of what though? Like compared to what? Because I feel like to overrate something, there needs to be something that is underrated, you know? 
So if you think Elden Ring is underrated or overrated, what what is the perfect game? They're still coming. I do want to try to take out these tree sentinels, actually. Dark Souls 3? I genuinely despise how that game plays. Something about it feels fundamentally wrong. And it's such a bummer. Whoops. Or Hollow Knight? Hollow Knight's great, but it's very different, isn't it? This and Ryu is so much since Dark Souls 1. So, wouldn't that imply that none of the Souls games are good at combat? Like, are you saying that they're all overrated? Holy shit, can you chill out? Look what you're doing to your poor horse. It's gonna break its gosh darn ankles. Do horses have ankles? I'm assuming so. Like, I like DS3, but every time I play it, I'm like, why does this game feel so freaking weird, you know? Like, I blame... L I blame it for its problems. Actually, I feel the same way about Elden Ring. It's gone rather stale? Honestly, everyone's entitled to their opinion. I really disagree, though. I don't feel this game. these games are stale at all. I think they really shine when they do brand new IPs with really different concepts, but all the games have such a distinct feel to them. You know, I, I find it hard, like, okay, yeah, so there's a reused animation here, you know, but like, if I were to play Dark Souls 1 right now, I'd be like, whoa, this feels so different, you know? It doesn't feel like the same thing. Also, Bloodborne and Sekiro? Oof, I wouldn't say they're stale. Didn't know you could fight them one at a time? Yeah, if you sneak up on them. They're still not easy, though. Jerks. Dang it. Only Abyss Watcher is meh? You know one thing I like about them is how variable it always feels. All recycled? You know, it's so funny to me that we think recycling is a good thing until it's in video games. Nah, just kidding. But no, FromSoft does good. Also, Armored Core. Armored Core has so many of the same themes, but see, it feels so distinct, you know? Oh, for freak's sake. Also, the first playthrough of Elden Ring is like nothing else. Seriously. It's a delight even to watch, like, when I'm editing it, I'm like, oh man, I remember that. Oh yeah, I, th I found this and blah, 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 you know? Like, it's just such a genuine delight. I don't think we're gonna get this done in one go. Jeez. Oh, for goodness sakes, for real? So I jump and you jump. Jerk. Because the thing about these two is I'm pretty sure you need to kill them both in one go. What the? What the? What happened? Oh, he moved down there? Huh. Neat. I didn't know he walks all the way down there. What a cutie. Oh, come on, dog. You have the sentry's torch, not a shield. You work together. That's so cool. Yeah, this isn't going to go so well. Going to be your DLC character? God, no, no, no. We're going to beat the game with this character. I want to bring a really fresh character into the DLC. Okay, so if you if you're so you're saying 
that Dark Souls, that all the FromSoft games are overrated in terms of combat. So, like, what is your grail? Like, if you were to say, what is the game that you're like, not overrated, perfect game, like, what would it be? If not those, because I'm just sitting there and I'm like, even if you don't like certain things about these games, they're objectively good. They are objectively amazing. Neo 2, ugh. Sorry, that was rude. I haven't even played it. But Neo 1 soured me so much, I don't even want to. Sorry to say that. Neo 1 just actually is a bully. I should try it again, though. Okay, so um, I've only defeated these guys one time, and it was with Nebula. I'm about to respec. Yeah, they both come back. Ah, fuck all that. Combat gets better the better you are. Funny that how that works. Mm, no, no, no. I don't think I'm good at Elden Ring and I still enjoy it mostly. Urchery avatars? Yeah, Urchery avatars are like fair for like reused assets, but then again, they're just supposed to be control C, control V, eh? Like. No one's like, oh my god, my favorite boss was Urchi Avatar. I love fighting Urchi Avatar. You know, it's just like... I was really bad at Bloodborne, and I loved it. I'm still pretty bad at DS3, and I really do like it. It's just, I hate that when I roll something, and then I roll again, I got hit by the same thing that, I, that missed me before. It's like, how did this occur, you know? Have more fun not getting my ass kicked all the time, doesn't everyone? No, no, I like getting my ass kicked. It's just I need my ass kicked in a very specific way. Elden Ring, I don't really feel like I enjoy the way it kicks my ass. Like, it, it just feels... Like, I'm just like, okay, when do I get to play the video game? Every other FromSoft game doesn't have that feel. They don't have 12 hit combos followed by a six hit combo and you have to strategically get a single R1 in. And if you do any more than that single R1, Fuck you. You get hit three times and then you die. Didn't get you on the stairs? It's already dead. I've already been here. Yeah, we're mostly done, Altus. I'm just like doing my mental one over. Mm, I think we're done, mostly. So we basically cleared Altus today. What'd you think of Wolong? Really good. Boss is really fun. Until the end, where I was like, okay, so we have the same three enemies throughout the game, eh? Also, it felt like you have to keep... Attack, like, a basic enemy, you have to R1 them like 80 times, because they're just guarding all the time, and they never attack, so you're just like... And it won't die, and you're just like... And it became really annoying, you know? So, Wolong did drive me a little crazy by the end, but it was good. You love hitless fights? Are you insane? Hitless. Pff. Me? Pff. You know? Sekiro is truly a treasure. I don't know how they did it. It's really good. So well designed. Similarly for a long time. I mean, yeah, but like, isn't that kind of their their whole thing? You know, they all, they do something unique that no one else does. Like, if you were to say, yeah, all the Assassin's Creed games are the same, I'd be like, yeah. If you were to say, yeah, all the Call of Duty games are, are the same, I'd be like, yeah, yeah. But these games, they really do a lot of really interesting creative things. Sekiro and the Lorathon? Me too, I want to see what I remember. All right, not really much here. Interesting banners. Yeah, like FIFA's the same game. I mean, that's that's kind of an extreme though, you know? I just really feel like they do a good job of, of making things feel fresh. Also, I enjoy seeing the similarities. I enjoy being like, oh my God, I remember this from this. This is interesting. Now that I'm looking at it, it doesn't quite look like a flower. We've seen the statue with gold flowers, but not, this one looks like a, like a straight up shoot of a tree. Otherwise, the same, though. I 
I did like doing BL4, but only for Bloodborne. Bloodborne's special. Also, I've heard from folks who do hit lists that Bloodborne's a miserable. What? That Bloodborne is miserable to do hit lists because it's really, really random and largely unpredictable. Part of the reason I love it, but for hit lists, it's not exactly foggers, apparently. Envoys who blow bubbles, golden bubbles, and who toot their horns to herald the, the rise or appearance of a new god. Now, why are they here? Honestly, probably because Marik is here. I can't think of any other figure unless it's one we don't know of. It doesn't necessarily need to be a new god, maybe, just a god in general. We see them at uh, the Halo Tree because of potentially Melania. Some people think Mikola, but we know Mikola isn't there anymore, and the Halo Tree is dying. Melania becomes the closest to hitting godhood in the game. So it's likely for her. But she is not a god yet. So it kind of makes you wonder, is it perhaps Morgoth? Nah, Morgoth isn't close, not an Empyrean. He's not- he's only trying to protect the Erd Tree. Could be something we don't know about, but generally I think these guys are just meant to be like, Marik is here, doot doot, you know? Super entertaining to watch her after I hit this run? I'm just not interested. Like, I wish I had the type of brain that could do hit list. Like, I really respect it, but it's just too much memorization. Not to mention, when I get close to doing something, I get nervous. So, like, if I have a good run, I'll just get nervous and throw. It always happens. I'm not really good at that sort of stuff. I get nervous. Too much memorization. Too much, like, constant focus. Not for me. Oh, we can do uh, Dung Eater's quest sign a little bit. Here to announce the coming of New Age, maybe they're announcing the player? Potentially, but they seem to point directly toward what they're what they're horning for. Weird sentence. But they do not uh, play toward us, they play toward the tree. Take a hit BL4 on Koss. A what? I, I did BL4 on, on Orphan of Koss. But that's different, that's just time. You don't have to fuck up. If you fuck up, you don't have to restart the whole run. And it was actually genuinely fun. Ran to powder. Mm -hmm. I hate Landell? Really? I love it here. We feed Dung Eater with Salivus Potion. No, we're completing his quest. We long ago got rid of that. Did you take a hit and survive? Yeah, for sure. You can take multiple hits. I think it's about three hits before you get killed by, uh, our boy, Orphan of Cost. Yeah. Okay, so we've talked a lot about Dung Eater here and there. This is one of his victims. Tied up, um, bleeding from the frontal region, um, where the seedbed curse is coming from. Presumably, uh, it's because of the seedbed curse emerging from them, leading to bleeding. Curse grown on a corpse killed and defiled by the Dung Eater, a tender pox afflicted with omen horns. The Dung Eater cultivates the seedbed curse on corpses. So, decay, rebirth, uh, dead things that are eaten eventually become good fertilizer, right? There's the cycle of life and death. Um, an animal dies in the woods, its body decomposes, bacteria, bugs, mushrooms, and eventually that becomes tender soil that can feed new life. Um, and that's effectively what a seedbed curse is. That's why he puts it in corpses as well. By doing so, he prevents dead souls returning to the earth tree, leaving them forever cursed. One of the most loathsome things found in all the lands between. Is it though? I mean, yeah. But that's real rich of you. Freaking nerds. Weird enemies with the tentacles. So those are omen horns that we see within it. They're just horns. Dung Eater believes equality can be brought if everyone is cursed instead of a few. It's more like spite. Think of spite. Um, he just wants to watch the whole world world burn. Um, he takes on the curse 
on himself and inflicts it upon others. But the thing is, he himself is not even cursed. That's what makes him so interesting, is he is not an omen, but he takes on the mistreatment of the omen as his own and embraces that curse and curses them too. Um, he literally cosplays as an omen with severed horns. Omen themselves are not evil, they're not unnatural, they're not cursed, they're not corruptive. They are simply born that way, but they are treated like a pox, like a disease, thrust into sewers, treated like they're disgusting and evil and unnatural and cursed, and then they take that hatred on themselves as a weapon and inflict it upon others. Um, so, Dung Eater effectively pretends to be these things and takes their curse as his own and then inflicts it on others. It's really interesting that he is able, despite not being an omen himself, is able to inflict the omen curse on others. But, I don't know, it's, it's not the most unusual thing considering the omen are natural in the world. It is not the omen that is a curse, by the way. It is how they are treated. Like a mockery? The thing is, he's sort of weird because he takes the suffering of others and inflicts it upon others spitefully. He doesn't inflict himself? He can't. We do, though. It's part of his quest. Hey! No. Wait. You have felt the curse. I can smell it on you. Box, yet tender. Apparently my seed bed is ripe and waiting. It was a brief respite, I must say. Go and unshackle my corporeal flesh, trapped in the sewer jail below the capital. I can kill you and defile your corpse. Then the pox will truly be your own. Go and unshackle my corporeal flesh, trapped in the sewer jail below the capital. I can kill you in the pox. Okay, thanks for the offer, I guess, weirdo. Make guy eat poop in the sewer? No, he's he's actually very interesting. And there's a lot of stuff. So just real brief, because we got some new folks here. Um, dung eater, it's not something that translates very well to English. Um, the same meaning, but okay. In Japanese myth, there is a, your soul exists inside your butt. And I know that sounds like a joke or a meme. I'm not joking. It's called a shirikodama. So the shirikodama, there's a couple figures in Japanese myth, like the kappa, uh, that are said to steal it and feed on it. Uh, in Sekiro, the headless have an animation where they grab you and tear it out. That's what it's supposed to be. Dung Eater is not eating shit literally. He is consuming your soul. But it just happens to come from that area. When he does, he takes it into himself. That's why he has uh, so many spirits. I don't know if Roderica will talk about it still. Hello. Greetings. Are you here for some something you should I can know? hear it from across the wing, past the round table. The howling and wailing of spirits in fear of the curse. I can even hear the repulsive twisted malice in itself. You should keep your distance. I know you're strong, but... He keeps the spirits that he consumes in him, and that's why Roderica can hear them. We can't, but she is a very talented and very sensitive spirit tuner, so she's aware of all those spirits that he's consumed. Then, he probably in the process, you know, his own waste becomes a seedbed curse that he then inflicts upon others. So it's one of those things that sort of, there's a lot more to him, but it's something that uh, as a Western audience, we might not be initially aware of. I didn't know what a Shiriko Dama is. Um, I think I learned about that from Zuli's video. Zuli did a video on, on this topic. I don't remember if it was specifically Dung Eater or not, but either way. Um, so yeah, <laughs> so he's locked in a jail. He was executed. He's basically imprisoned. He's the most reviled figure. But he doesn't really seem to care to free himself. It's really interesting. He actually possesses the key himself. And he is clearly able to access different areas as an invader because we see lots of seedbed curses. We don't exactly have a timeline. But he's a really messed up figure. Why is the key to his own dungeon? Yeah, it's just one of those things. Um, he wants to be freed in an opportune time. He presumably simply has the key and can free himself anytime, but he's too busy banging his head against the wall, literally. 
Dung Eater is really interesting. Like, super goofed up, but real interesting also. Finger Creepers? So, what's really interesting, now you mentioned the Finger Creepers, they seem to be located at places involved with Great Blasphemy. I don't think it's a coincidence that right outside us is Sal. Seedbed, Curse Shop, and Volcano Manor? That was one of his victims. Every single one of the bodies that we find is someone that he targeted and killed. And there's even one in the Halo Tree. Now, he is an invader. He appears as a red phantom. He attacks us as a red phantom. That's presumably how he gets around. He's able to access different areas. We don't know the exact criteria for how he selects anybody, how he's able to target them, but that's just something he's able to do. Really due to how good his voice acting is. He's very well voice acted. And what's really, really, really fun about Dung Eater is he also just straight up tells you what he's gonna do. Like he doesn't act, he doesn't go, you should free me. Don't worry about what I'm gonna do. He honestly seems to believe that others want his curse. He seems to operate entirely unaware that people do not want what he is doing to them. He literally says, oh, I can, uh... like he doesn't quite say like that. He's like, hey, by the way, um, if you're interested, uh, if you free me, go free me, I'll defile and kill your corpse, okay? And you're just like, why would I want that? You know what I mean? Like, there's no faking, there's no bullshit, there's no, like, hey, I won't hurt you. He straight up says, go free me. I will defile your corpse. I will give you the curse that you're looking for. He's one of the most interesting figures in the lore. All the others that do the whole, hey, free me, and then um, it'll be just fine, tend to pretend. Or they don't tell you what they're doing. They just say something ominous, like, okay, now I can continue my mission. And then they do something bad. This guy's straight up, like, five o'clock on the dot. I have you in my calendar for an appointment for a defile. And you're like, what? He's very, he's genuinely really interesting because he is super messed up morally. And he does really awful things to people. But he also has a lot of positive traits, such as honesty. Now, to be fair, he does definitely seem to take proximity to his, to him as a consent to defile people. So that's not what I would call a good trait. But you know what I mean? Like, he, he doesn't with you. He's like, yeah, go free me here. I'll give you the key. Please, go ahead. Before we get the seedbed curse, he completely ignores us. Yeah, so I wonder if the folks who... Oh, God. I, I love cute inputs. Thank you so much. I wonder if his previous victims... Okay, so a bogger, we don't know if he has a seedbed curse on him, but his friend, he witnessed what happened to his friend. We learned that from him, which is potentially what makes him a target. He's also quite dumb in general. He finds that you resisted the curse and then just think that means you are him. But it's because of that, him choosing to take the curse. What's really interesting actually about Dung Eater is when you defeat him, he has a revelation. And thanks to that, he gains the resolve. And he himself realizes that he must be defiled. And through that process, he births a mending room. Only two other figures in the entire lore are capable of doing that. It cannot be dismissed. And that it's, it's so weird because he's this super messed up character, but also deeply intriguing. <laughs> Why is he present in the round table hold? Why does he try to curse everyone there? The serenity of the round table hold prevents him. Yo, thanks for the sub. Welcome in. Because we took the time to collect the curse, so he assumes we do like it. The outward threatens you with cursing if you don't leave him alone. Funny how that works, though, huh? If you don't leave me alone. You're lucky I will curse you if you, you know, don't leave me alone. Get out of here. And then if you get a curse, he's like, oh, I can curse you now. And you're like, what? So, man has no ability to negotiate whatsoever. You know what I love about Lane Dell? The moment you walk in, the very first sight you get is literally basically the end of Lane Dell. From Soft, I tell you. They do it so well. 
actually are mending runes. They are new... The way I read them is like a casing. So the runes are shattered. They don't, they can't be put together. Even if you collect every single great rune, you still need a way to put them together into a new order. And they allow you, they, they're like a case that you can stick them in in a certain pattern that allows for a new order to be put together. Man, I really wish I could visit Lindal when it was at its peak. Probably more than any other, I'd love to visit Lindal. Like, I love Yarnum and stuff, but my god, a fully fleshed out Lindal with life at its peak? Oh, I don't think there would be anything like it. Only finish thinking if we kill all shard bearers. So the thing is, the Elden Ring was considered a hole when the Rune of Death was removed. So presumably you can you don't need every rune to repair the Elden Ring. That's what's so interesting. Ain Orlando, Ain Orlando's beautiful too. I'm not even trying to dismiss Ain Orlando here. I just really like Landell. Um, don't question. What does Vogue move in this location? That's a good question. I feel like you should have been here. Oh, that was a goof up. I feel like you should be here. Oh, thanks. Really don't drop anything, huh? Oh, damn, Vista and the Soulsborne series. I agree. Like, Aner Londo is really, really, really good, and I love it. I think I just love this open world structure, because in Aner Londo, we really, really only visit the castle, right? Um, understandably, it's a, you know, I say castle, sort of the cathedral, the, you know. It's the central point, but in this game, you know, you get to walk down Main Street, you get to see the entrance. It's really great. Where's some Lord of Chaos ending? You want to know what I think is canonically the most evil ending? The one that takes people's choice away from them the most. The one that I don't think people would expect. Oh, we don't want to lose uh, Melanie yet. Hang on, I don't want to rest. Have I not rested in Leandale at all? I guess I haven't. She's still with me. Uh, Gold Mask. Yeah, Gold Mask. Gold Mask repairs the rune, re fixing every weakness. And the weakness is free will. It can never, ever be changed. It can never, ever be broken. No Marika is coming to save you. The lands between, as we see them, stagnated, full of decay, death, people warped into unidentifiable forms, everyone having lost their mind, Boom, congratulations, you just made that eternal with absolutely zero way to ever break it again. Because the flaw in the Golden Order was Marika. She's the reason that it's able to be broken at all and she created the Tarnished and we just made that mistake. We just removed that mistake. Specifically, the free will is a weakness. Marika represents change, free will. She's the reason that we are able to exist as we do. The fly in the ointment, yeah, as it's worded in Gold Mask's rune. It's... Ugh. Like, all the mending rune endings are pretty bad, actually. In fact, I would argue there's no good ending. Like, people are like, but Ronnie! I really wonder if Rani isn't a spiritual successor to Marika in that she kind of doesn't quite realize if you're, if you're like, okay, some people think that her whole plan was to sort of take everything and move to the moon so that the, the outer god only has her. It's possible to read it that way, and she does indeed manage to remove the influence 
of that rune. And presumably, maybe someone could one day fix Godwin because we defeated Radon, right? So maybe something else could happen to help with what we left behind. But Ronnie's ending fixes one problem, which is a pretty major one, but there's still tons of problems in this land that go completely unaddressed and we can't address them. It's impossible to in the playthrough, so. Morality is directly proportional to how good the ending cinematic is. Yeah, I mean, there's a reason that Ronnie's and Frenzy are the most popular, with Frenzy probably being the most popular, and that one is... Oof. See, the thing about Frenzy is it's pretty messed up because it annihilates everybody, right? But at the same time, when all life is recombined, presumably there can be an event where life is split again. There is a weird sense of hope in the Frenzy Flame ending, but it comes not from us, it comes from, for example, Melina, it comes from the potential for that life to split yet again as it did before, and the whole cycle to repeat again. But there's still that little tidbit of hope. The those who live in death ending, pretty messed up, but at the same time, well, unless someone else can take out Godwin, that one's pretty bad too. The Dung Eater ending. Okay, so everyone's cursed with, like, omen being an omen. But an, an omen is natural. It's kind of weird. Um, the omen themselves are not cursed. There's nothing inherently evil about them. It's just that they are perceived that way. So if everyone's an omen, I don't think that's actually the worst thing in the whole world. Even though it does come from Dung Eater spite, and spite is not a good origin for anything. So I'm not saying it's a good ending, but there's still something in it that isn't as bad. Gold Mask? No hope. Zero hope. Not even a fraction, not even a tidbit, not even a smithereen. So that's why I think it's actually the worst, really. Hope you get a new ending rune or ending from DLC. It's possible. They haven't done that before, though. Um, the DLC tends to supplement something in the base game not an ending, but it creates its own ending in a way that you might not expect, but there isn't like, hey, we get a new choice for an ending, usually. Just fix ring and allow things to get better if people give enough effort. I really wonder about the no mending rune fix. I wonder if it isn't a band-aid. Ugh, honestly. So Ronnie, basically, in a way, I don't know if she's naive or if she's following Marcus' footsteps in the way that she's martyring herself, because she takes the order and presumably takes it somewhere else. So no one else can influence the lands between. The lands between is free, but at the cost of Ronnie leaving the lands between and being alone forever. Sorry, I almost dropped my controller. But we go with her in that ending. So the two of us alone in a void on the moon, presumably forever. That's the ending. Everyone else is saved, but not us. That's the ending that's chosen, and that's probably the most positive one, because it allows for something to come from the ashes, but there are still all the problems in the lands between. Frenzy Flame, frankly, fixes a lot of problems. Godwin, I don't think you could beat the Frenzy Flame. So that's done. Um, the Death Blight, largely gone. Dung Eater, all the corruption, all the, the Golden Order, done. All that. The differences that divide, done, gone, eliminated. We can kind of reset. Gonna emancipate ourselves? Yeah, but it still leaves behind everything that's happening in the lands between. Godwin is not fixed if you pick Ronnie's ending. In fact, Ronnie's ending. Ronnie is the reason that Godwin exists. I'm not saying she didn't have a reason for doing it. But it's very much like, okay, peace, I'm out, uh, I did what I could, fix it yourselves. And is anyone even left who can fix it? And when everyone's an omen, Raphael, no one will be. Raph, hmm. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. That's the thing about FromSoft endings that I love so much, is we can discuss and argue and debate which one is actually good. Because people generally go like, oh, I get to go with my waifu to the moon, or whatever. Forever, that's great, happy end. Uh, that one seems particularly scary. They all have good and bad points to them. That's what's so her so terrifying. Yeah, Caelid is still rotted. So, presumably the influence of the Outer Gods is gone. So the Greater Will is cut off. Um, but the Scarlet Rock God is still sealed under the Lake of Rot from what we know. 
Godwin is still growing, spreading over the lands between. Morgoth made the sentry torches for his siblings. No, no, no. He made sentry torches after the Night of the Black Knives to prevent that from happening again. So the, the sentry torches were a response to the assassination. Yeah. Although, I don't know that Morgoth made them. He might have. Hang on. Let me, let me double check here because I don't remember the timeline. One sec. I do have that uh, sentinel torch. It's really interesting. I never remember where it is. Oh my god. Where are my torches? <laughs> there it is. Yeah, no, definitely Morgoth straight up made this. This would have been way later. That's really interesting. Okay. Um... Furnished on behalf of the Erd Tree and the Grace Given Lord, such that a Knight of Black Knives will never come again. The Grace Given Lord is Morgoth. So let's let's talk about a timeline here. Morgoth and Moog were trapped in the sewers. Uh, we don't know at what point that occurred, but but this gives even further evidence that it happened later in their lives. Presumably when Radigan showed up. In other words, before Radigan showed up, or at some point, they were being, Morgoth and Moog were raised like royal children, even though they were omen. That wasn't a problem for Marika or Godfrey, apparently. Um, they were raised, they had, they speak very intelligently, especially Morgoth. Like, his lines go hard. He is not some idiot who was raised in a sewer from birth. He is clearly well-spoken, intelligent, a great planner, strategist, everything. He, no one can take Landell because he is there. So he was, he was put in the sewer, trapped with the, what is it? The shackles. Him and his brother were both trapped. Somehow they got themselves free. But I really wonder if this didn't happen because of Radigan. Because the thing is, he had to have been raised enough to know Godwin. Because that whole to make sure the Knight of Black Knives never happens again. It's possible he simply didn't want any other demigod to die, but that's something he planned on and created when he became the Grace Given Lord, which was way later. So I really, really wonder. He probably had a relationship with, with Godwin. That, to me, that line, the whole, um, you know, such that a, a Knight of Black Knives never comes again, it's not as blatant as um, Mikola's weapon asking for his brother to die a true death. It's not quite as blatant as Mikola and Godwin had a, had a bond. But this, to me, reads like Morgoth never wanted anyone of his relatives to die because he already lost his brother this way. Godfrey definitely did not have an issue, issue with his children being dead. Omen, definitely, that's for sure. But one thing about Morgoth specifically that I find really intriguing, or really both of them, the twins, when were they put into the sewer? If it was from birth and they were hidden away and locked away and secreted because they were, Marika was ashamed of them, then why are they so educated? Why do they have a bond with their, with Godwin? I mean, what we see with Grace is Godfrey. Uh, what do you mean? That's just his title. He's Morgoth the Grace Given. And also, on behalf of the Erd Tree and the Grace Given Lord, whose allies with, with the Erd Tree? It's, it's Morgoth. Might have been made before Shattering? It might have been. But if we're looking at the timeline, at this point, Morgoth and Moog were trapped in a sewer. So, Godwin's death is what partially what triggered the Shattering. Maybe Godwin would visit them. The one thing about Godwin, now I'm not saying he was a bad guy by any means. He's he, We don't know a lot about him. He was also rather mysterious generally. But the thing is that no... Okay. Golden Order fundamentalism seems to be very strict. But the Golden Order seemed to be okay with the dragon cultists. Of which Godwin was the head. 
so let's look at this timeline. Godwin, Morgoth, and Moog are children of Marika. Godfrey is four out of the lands between. Radigan comes in. Then, at some point, they're put in the sewer. Godwin would know about this, and he would be an adult at this point, probably, because... This, he, I think he already had the dragon cult at this time. Timeline, once again, is a little fuzzy, so some of this might be, you know, unknown or unconfirmable. And he seemed to ally with the Golden Order? Because the Golden Order and the dragon cultists work together. So I kind of feel like Radigan rolled up and was like, your, your siblings are ugly as sin. We have to hide them in the sewer because they're omen. And Ganon was like, okay. I'm not saying he doesn't doesn't visit them, but he didn't really seem to... If this happened under his watch, he didn't seem to be as upset as I think he should have been, I guess. Although it's possible that there is a little bit more complexity in the arrangement. I wonder if Godwin could have even done anything. Godfrey cuts and you can see Grace that guides him to you? Yeah, we know, but that's not... Morgoth, that's his title. That's just what he called. He's called the Grace-Given Lord, the Veiled Monarch, the Grace-Given Lord. That's just his title. So... I mean, it could be Godfrey. But generally, the Tree Sentinels... Like, we know that at some point they serve Godfrey. But that's the title that we see for Morgoth. But the thing is... Godwin was killed. And by this point, I'm pretty sure Godfrey was long gone. So I don't think it was Godfrey. Where is he called the Grace Given? I don't remember, but we saw it recently. It might have been during my first playthrough, though. Let's check something, because there's a couple places I think it could be. But no, I remember. I remember because I just edited it in my first playthrough, and I was like, oh, more got the Grace Given. Gideon who calls on that? It could be Gideon. Let's go talk to him. No, it doesn't make sense that in this context, Godfrey is the Grace Given, because, um... Like, you have to remember, too, Tarnish do not have grace, so he can see grace, but he doesn't have it at this time. That's the whole point about Tarnish, they don't have it. At some point, Godfrey did have grace, because he was divested of it later, but Godfrey doesn't fit the timeline, gamers. Godfrey was gone before the Shattering. Godfrey was gone when Godwin was killed. Fair, Gideon occasionally spits bullshit. I actually don't think so. Gideon does not tend to lie to us. He doesn't tell us everything, but he does not lie. Everything he tells us is pretty accurate. Yes, fire was considered blasphemous because of the burning of the Earth Tree. Um, it was associated with cardinal sin and snakes. During the Shattering, very late on the timeline. Oh, so you're seeing the Sentry Torch. Yeah, I think Morgoth. It's really interesting that Morgoth gave them those, those torches. Because he hates flame. So presumably for him, the risk of more assassins coming was worse. Also... It didn't do a very good job because there is, right outside of his arena, is a black knife. <laughs> really believe what he's saying, but he's just wrong? Like when? When does he ever lie distinctly? Because honestly, everything he says seems to be pretty accurate. Like 100%. Unless he's not telling us something and he wants to lie. Like, yeah. But the information he presents and the titles tend to be right. Right here, gamers. I can't believe I'm on the side of Gideon right now. Sealed by Morgoth the Grace Given, I told you. <laughs> it's his title. I may not remember everything, but I just edited this like less than a week ago. I freaking remember. He's got a lot of monikers, you know, he's always hiding things and stuff. Interesting, these ones got books. These ones got swords, these ones got books. 
Yeah, so there are two Morgoth barriers like this. And really interestingly, this is the Two Fingers incantation rune. Right there. Two Fingers Faithful. So he seals it with the Two Fingers incantation, interestingly enough. So this one, and then, yeah, like Empotamus is saying, there is another seal just like this, right in front of the Three Fingers. So if you try to go down there before Morgoth, you're going to see this exact seal. Seal there if you didn't beat Morgoth? It's neat, right? It was actually really cool, yeah. But what's really interesting that we noticed later, or I noticed later, I should say, is that this is a two-finger incantation. So it's sealed by Morgoth. But I really wonder, like, are we able to read this text? Is that how we know it's sealed? Is this a signature? But he uses the two-finger symbol. Checks out for such a fan of the greater will. What's, what's weird about Morgoth is he doesn't seem to really care for the Greater Will or the Golden Order. He cares about the tree specifically. And the tree definitely represents the Golden Order. It's a symbol of it. It represents faith. It's currently kind of potentially even a parasite that was controlled by the Elden Beast and the Greater Will. But he doesn't care about all that. He cares about the tree. He's kind of a strangely simple guy in a way. It's kind of touching. Matches the rune, the cipher bodas. Yeah, the, the literal rune though, not the text. I'm talking about the symbol is the two fingers incantation symbol. You can see it in the background there. It's to say it's written in the same language of light that the two fingers speak as well. I just wonder gameplay wise, can we read it? You know what I mean? Like when we say seal by Morgoth the Grace Given, is that just gameplay or are we as the player able to read it? I don't know. Enemy of my enemy? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Even Moog. So, based on the fact that Moog has a sort of phantom there that you can fight that prevents you from accessing the three fingers, it suggests that both twins, though they have many disagreements, presumably, and want different things, one thing they can agree upon is they do not want anyone to access the Frenzied Flame. Because for both of them, that would be bad. I forgot this was water, actually. So, of course, when the ash... So, there's already ash here, by the way. This is ash. Likely from the first burning of the tree. The burning that we do in the course of our playthrough, of course, transforms Landell into Ashen Landell. Ooh, a Mikola lily in a planter. Intriguing. Yeah, it's all water. Part of the moat. It gets entirely filled in by ash. Oh, a Leonine, hello. Two fingers language seems like how radiation looks like to me. It also looks a lot like literally like the Lord of the Rings runes and the ring, you know? The black speech or whatever it's called. There's a headless under there for sure. Well, my queen is an Empyrean. She sure was. Or is, potentially. Why doesn't Ronnie mention- You freaking joshing me. You were one. Just take the L, brother. He is real aggressive when he's red-eyed, that's for sure. Um, why doesn't Ronnie mention her? So, Ronnie, as far as we know, only mentions relevant Empyreans. In other, ones, in other words, ones that are still alive. It's presumable she doesn't know about the status of the Glomide Queen. Also, while Ronnie is very intelligent, it doesn't mean she knows everything. And the Glomide Queen would have been before her time, quite a bit. We're talking about figures that were referenced and were defeated b before the Rune of Death was even removed from the other ring, before the War of the Earth Tree. We're talking ancient stuff. Because the first thing that Marika did 
was remove was ask Malekith to defeat the Gwalmide Queen. Ah, right here. So we talked about this a little bit earlier. Um, we're chopping up bodies. Spiteful, vengeful, probably mistreated, misbegotten. I think we do have a beast blood, but body-wise, it looks just like a commoner. Oh. They could also be getting a snack, but they never stop. There's a very similar enemy in the fishing hamlet that does the same thing in Bloodborne, just constantly, constantly, constantly attacks like that. So that's why I feel like it's more reminiscent of that imagery. Yeah, basically the point is that the Glomide Queen would have been defeated before uh, Marika, before Rani was born, before her parents met. Like, I don't know, man, you ask a Zoomer about a movie that came out five years before they were born, and they'd be like, what? No, nothing ever existed. Hell, you ask me about a movie that came out five years before I was born, I'll be like, what? No, that didn't exist. You know, like, how can we expect her to know the entire history? Especially since her father, Radigan, is famous for keeping information away. Renala taught her and, and, and introduced her to various things, but her education seemed very focused on her becoming the next Queen of Caria, which wouldn't have required a full history of everything that happened in between. Go my queen was actually Mark herself before she became a god. The thing about that um, is she asked Malaketh to defeat the Glomite Queen. Malaketh cannot turn on Marika because she is her shadow. He is her shadow, sorry. It is, it is like impossible. Only if she betrays her fate, Marika betrays her fate. And even though Marika largely does, Malika is still loyal to her. So if, Glomide, if the Glomide Queen is Marika, I don't think Malekith could have defeated her. It could be an aspect of Marika, but once again, once we get into the Glomide Queen is Marika, who's also Radigan, who's also this, who's also that, it reduces the number of figures that we have in the lore, which I find to be personally uninteresting. I don't want it to turn out that actually Mikola is Ronnie and also Trina and also Melina, and they're all just wearing hats, so they look like different people. Like, that's boring to me, so of course I'm not going to engage in that type of dialogue. It's boring. How is Ronnie an Empyrean? We don't know what necessitates an Empyrean. We don't know what creates them. There's something special about them. They're better, they're stronger than demigods. There's something unique that they possess. We don't necessarily know what that is. We can theorize. Um, personally, it could be the ability to create in some way, shape, or form. Um, it could be like, for example, in this case, two of them that we know of are women, Melania and Ronnie. It could be the Marika as well, the Golomite Queen. It could be the capacity of carrying a child, right? Literally that concept of life, but... There is tons of evidence that Marika is an incredibly talented craftswoman. Same as Mikola. We know Mikola creates some really extraordinary creations. So presumably the concept of understanding life and creation is way more complicated than that. Because Mikola is involved too. And not only that, Mikola is cursed. Oh, also, just as a side note, the Empyreans tend to be chosen from birth. Ain't no baby creating no life. So there's something about them. It's some. It's like an inherent thing that they possess within them. That the two fingers can suss out. Now, what I'll say about the two fingers, because the two fingers choose and, and relate to an Empyrean. We also have the finger readers. There's a lot about the fingers and the finger readers that relates to, like, fate. Right? Like, um... They ask... The finger readers ask to read your fingers. They literally say... Please let me read. They're desperate for it. It's like palm reading. In other words, a form of divination. They ask to see your hands and they can tell you about your fate from what they see. Like, you know, oh, this lion means you're going to live a long life and have 20 children. Oh, dang it. I forgot. That's okay. I think we've gone all our dialogue. My utmost thanks. No problem, girl. For bringing me to the base of the Erd tree. Here, 
I can govern my own movement, and thus, the accord is fulfilled. I shall depart to ascertain the purpose I was given. Farewell. I shall leave Torrent, and the power to turn runes into strength, here, with you. I wish you luck in realizing your ambition. You have fought long and hard. I have no doubt you will become Elden Lord. May you take the throne. You know how my dagger is clipping through my, th my thigh right now? Ow. Okay, bye, Melina. It was a very sweet, very positive vibes. But yeah, so that's basically the, the concept of an Empyrean. Something about them is special. They are chosen at birth. We know that from Gowrie, who talks about Melania. Rani also was given Blythe as a child and was raised with them, and they played together like siblings. Played together like siblings means kids, right? So literally, when they are so young, they are they are chosen. There's something about it's like their fate portends that they have the potential in a very real magical sense. Even though Melania and Mikola were both cursed, they were still Empyreans. But yeah, then we get into the whole, yeah, Radigan is Marika, so they're still, you know, he's, uh, Ronnie is still a child of Marika. Even if at the time they were divided, I personally believe that at the time, though Marika and Radigan were one, they were divided, and thus Marika was not Radigan. But still, Marika was Radigan. Do you know what I mean? When they recombined upon Radigan's um, becoming the second Elden Lord, then that was like the moment where they could be sort of open about it because they were complete again. They were a complete, purified Rebus. Mm, let's go to the Avenue Balcony, actually. Many opponents are red-eyed and thus more aggressive at night. Wonder why? Uh, Demi-humans. That mainly happens with demi-humans. The night makes them crazy. That's what it says. So, we don't know. Reminiscent of the three fates from Greek myth? Mm-hmm. The three sisters. Also, the fates and the three sisters, it's also an interesting way of referring to uh, the phases of the moon with the maiden, which correspond to the matron, the mother, and the crone. The three phases, the three life cycles of a woman's life woman because the moon is often associated with femininity not always there are several mythos that involve the moon being masculine and the sun feminine but generally uh, in greek myth um selene is the goddess of the moon the moon is feminine the concept of it changing but always remaining whole is is sort of i think wait who is associated with the moon is hecate associated with the moon i know she's the goddess of witchcraft but i don't know her exact association with the moon windy flask you picked up a good question. I didn't even read it. I'm gonna be real, I don't read too many of these flasks because I never do anything interesting. Increases the effectiveness of dodge rolls for a certain duration, but damage taken is also increased. So, oh, it's uh, Karthus, one of the Karthus rings. Where's my lip gloss? Melania and Mikola shadows? Yeah, we don't know. We really don't know. We might find out. <laughs> mm. I don't know. Ronnie is Radigan and Rala's child instead of Marika? Um, no, no, no. Renala is Ronnie's mother. But if Radigan and Marika were one being who then split... Besides that being like an alchemical concept, which otherwise makes no sense, that means that Radigan is Marika, even if they're separate. So Radigan's child is also Marika's child, even though Renala is the birth mother. Do you know what I mean? We're not talking about reality, we're talking about weird alchemy magic. So she is Marika's daughter, but is Renala's child. You know what I mean? Directly associated with the moon, but the idea of triple gods is very prevalent in Greek myth. Yeah, Hecate is interesting because the, the triple gods with the with the goddesses of fate, which also exists in Norse myth, but Hecate, part of her association is, I believe she's supposed to embody all three, the maiden, the mother, and the crone. Like, that's part of her. That's why she's associated with witchcraft. 
In alchemy, moon is related to femininity and creation. Masculinity is basically potential, but potential which cannot ever amount to anything without the creative force of the femininity, which is ratting into a T, isn't it? That and the crossroads. Ah, yeah. Shattering, repairing, ring thing, though. I mean, it's not even... It's also your interpretation, right? Collecting all items in this run? Gonna do my best, but things are gonna fall by the wayside. This game has so many items, and we do want to get it done eventually. Either way, there are gamers. I am gonna call it tonight. Um, I'll be back on Saturday. I want to continue the lore -thon, but like I mentioned before, we got a lot of stuff planned for next week. Um, I would like to finish Dragon's Dogma 1, which I was very close to, to beating. I want to play it and finish it before I play Dragon's Dogma 2, which I would like to play concurrently while continuing the Lorathon because I'm very excited about it and it's very neat. So, Lorathon going to continue. This weekend, I think we're just doing Lorathon. But at least once next week, I will be doing a bonus stream so we can try to get Dragon's Dogma 1 done. And we have a sponsored stream for Rainbow Six Siege, which I have never played on stream before, but I have played. And that game is going to be content rich, let me tell you. So I'm personally very excited for that. I was I was like, I'm not going to take any sponsors. It's it's I'm too busy, too many. And then they were like, hey, you want to play Rainbow Six? I'm like, that'd be so funny. So yeah, that's going to be happening on Monday. <laughs> in other words big week i'm very excited lots of stuff going on i genuinely can't wait we got oh i still am gonna keep i'm also uploading the first playthrough of elden ring on youtube new episode every day i'm hoping to continue that I, i'm ahead on my editing but inevitably with extra streams i basically stream uh on days i don't stream i edit my cheeks off so if i'm streaming i might uh, we might miss an episode, is what I'm trying to say. So please understand if you're enjoying that. I'm going to do my best because I don't want to fall behind. But, you know. <laughs> Stock up on coffee? Yeah, for sure. Um, A lot of folks playing Dragon's Dama. It's really nice to see, actually. unsurprisingly. Um, I am going to send you over to Dashing, who's doing some Elden Ring PvP. Playing with the team is the way to go? Oh, most definitely. But uh, you do what you can. Please don't edit your cheeks off. They're one of your best features. I know! Cute. Never really noticed my cheeks, though. They just kind of exist. Hero's Grave back under... Hero's Grave? Under the thing? Ah, whatever. Don't worry about it. We'll do it next time. Back on Saturday. Spare Dragon's Dogma 2 from being overshadowed by Elden Ring DLC. I know! I really want to play it. I just... I don't want it, I don't want it to fall behind, so... Either way, thank you so much, everyone, for hanging out today. I really appreciate it. I hope you're as excited for what we have going on as I am, because I am so pumped. Hey, glad you enjoyed! Good night, everybody. Good night, YouTube. No raid on YouTube, but you know, just enjoy yourselves. Peace out. Go off into the into the universe, and I'll see you on Saturday, hopefully, my YouTube gamers. Contentathon. It do be the contentathon. That's so true. That's so real. Good night, Orlando. Justin. YouTube Lyco. Quaither. Twitch Lyco. Volpine. Arcade Stabbers. Concept Master MPS. Papa Beatus. Vitamin IQ. Unfunf. Good night. Utana. <laughs> you too, Volpine. <laughs> Bye.